The Carnivore by G. A. Morris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Miss Avarice. The Carnivore by G. A. Morris. The beings stood around my bed in air suits like ski suits, with globes over their heads like upside down fishbowls. It was all like a masquerade, with odd costumes and funny masks. I know that the masks are their faces, but I argue with them and find I think as if I am arguing with humans behind the masks. There are people. I recognize people and whether I am going to like this person or that person by something in the way they move and how they get excited when they talk. And I know that I like these people in a motherly sort of way. You have to feel motherly toward them, I guess. They all remind me of Ronnie, a medical student I knew once. He was small and round and eager. You had to like him, but you couldn't take him very seriously. He was a pacifist. He wrote poetry and pulled it out to read aloud at ill-time moments. And he stuttered when he talked too fast. They are all like that, all fright and gentleness. I am not the only survivor. They have explained that. But I am the first they found and the least damaged, the one they have chosen to represent the human race to them. They stand around my bed and answer questions, and are nice to me when I argue with them. All in a group, they look halfway between delegation of nations and an ark. One of each, big and small, thick and thin, four arms and wings, all shapes and colors and fur and skin and feathers. I can picture them in their UN of the universe, making speeches in their different languages, listening patiently without understanding each other's different problems, boring each other and being too polite to yawn. They are polite. So polite I almost feel they are afraid of me, and I want to reassure them. But I talk as if I were angry. I can't help it, because if things had only been a little different. Why couldn't you have come sooner? Why couldn't you have tried to stop it before it happened? Or at least come sooner afterward? If they had come sooner to where the workers of the Nevada power pile starved slowly behind their protecting walls of lead, if they had looked sooner for the survivors of the dust with which the nations of the world had slain each other, George Craig would be alive. He died before they came. He was my co-worker, and I loved him. We had gone down together, passing door by door the automatic safeguards of the plant, which were supposed to protect the people on the outside from the radioactive danger on the inside, but the danger of failure of politics was far more real than the danger of failure in the science of the power pile, and that had not been calculated by the builders. We were far underground when the first radioactivity in the air outside had shut all the heavy, lead-shielded automatic doors between us and the outside. We were safe, and we starved there. Why didn't you come sooner? I wonder if they know or guess how I feel. My questions are not questions, but I have to ask them. He is dead. I don't mean to reproach them. They look well-meaning and kindly, but I feel as if somehow, knowing why it happened could make it stop, could let me turn the clock back and make it happen differently. If I could have signaled them so they would have come just a little sooner. They look at one another turning their funny face heads uneasily, moving back and forth, but no one will answer. The world is dead. George is dead. That thin, pathetic creature with the bones showing through his skin that he was, when we sat still at the last with our hands touching, thinking there were people outside who had forgotten us, hoping they would remember. We didn't guess that the world was dead, blanketed in the radiating dust outside. Politics had killed it. These beings around me, they had been watching, seeing what was going to happen to our world, listening to our radios from their small settlements on the other planets of the solar system. They had seen the doom of war coming. They represented stellar civilizations of great power and technology, and with populations that would have made ours seem a small village. They were stronger than we were, and yet they had done nothing. Why didn't you stop us? You could have stopped us. A rabbity one who is closer than the others backs away, gesturing politely that he is giving room for someone else to speak. But he looks guilty and will not look at me with his big round eyes. I still feel weak and dizzy. It is hard to think, but I feel as if they are hiding a secret. 
A doe-like one hesitates and comes closer to my bed. We discussed it. We wrote it. It talks through a microphone in its helmet with a soft, lisping accent that I think comes from the shape of its mouth. It has a muzzle and very soft, dainty, long nibbling lips like a deer that nibbles on twigs and buds. We were afraid, adds one who looks like a bear. To us, the future was very terrible, says one who looks as if it might have descended from some sort of large bird like a penguin. So much... Your weapons were very terrible. Now they all tuck at once, crowding about my bed, apologizing. So much killing, it hurt to know about. But your people didn't seem to mind. We were afraid. And in your fiction, the doe-like one lisped, I saw plays from your amusement machines which said that the discovery of beings in space would save you from war. Not because you would let us bring friendship and teach peace, but because the human race would unite in hatred of the outsiders. They would forget their hatred of each other only in a new and more terrible war with us. Its voice breaks in a squeak and it turns its face away from me. You were about to come out into space. We were wondering how to hide. That is the quick-talking one, as small as a child. He looks as if he might have descended from a bat. Gray silken fur on his pointed face, big, night-seeing eyes, and big, sensitive ears, with a hump shape on the back of his air suit which might be folded wings. We were trying to conceal where we had built, so that humans would not guess we were near and look for us. They are ashamed of their fear, for because of it they broke all the kindly laws of their civilizations, restrained all the pity and gentleness I see in them, and let us destroy ourselves. I am beginning to feel more awake and to see more clearly. And I am beginning to feel sorry for them, for I can see why they are afraid. There are herbivores. I remember the meaning of shapes. In the paths of evolution, there are grass eaters and berry eaters and root diggers. Each has its functional shape of face and neck, and its wide, startled-looking eyes to see and run away from the hunters. In all their racial history, they have never killed to eat. They have been killed and eaten, or run away, and they evolved to intelligence by selection. Those lived who succeeded in running away from carnivores like lions, hawks, and men. I look up, and they turn their eyes and heads in quick embarrassed motion, not meeting my eye. The rabbity one is nearest, and I reach out to touch him, pleased because I am growing strong enough now to move my arms. He looks at me, and I ask the question, Are there any carnivores, flesh eaters, among you? He hesitates moving his lips as if searching for tactful words. We have never found any that were civilized. We have frequently found them in caves and tents fighting each other. Sometimes we find them fighting each other with the ruins of cities around them. But they are always savages. The bear leg one said heavily, It might be that carnivores evolve more rapidly and tend toward intelligence more often. For we find radioactive planets without life in places like the place you call your asteroid belt, where a planet should be. But there are only scattered fragments of planet, pieces that look as if a planet had been blown apart. We think that usually... He looked at me uncertainly, beginning to fumble with his words. We think... Yours is the only carnivorous race we have found that was civilized that had a science and was going to come out in his space, the doe-like one interrupted softly. We were afraid. They seemed to be apologizing. The rabbity one, who seems to be the chosen as the leader in speaking to me, says, We will give you anything you want, anything we are able to give you. They mean it. We survivors will be privileged people, with a key to all the cities, everything free. Their sincerity is wonderful, but puzzling. Are they trying to atone for the thing they feel was a crime? That they allowed humanity to murder itself and lost to the galaxy the richness of a race? Is this why they are so generous? Perhaps then they will help the race to get started again. The records are not lost. The few survivors can eventually repopulate Earth. Under the tutelage of these peaceable races, without the stress of division into nations, 
We will flower as a race. No children of mine to the furthest descendant will ever make war again. This much of a lesson we have learned. These timid beings do not realize how much humanity has wanted peace. They do not know how reluctantly we were forced and trapped by old institutions and warped tangles of politics to which we could see no answer. We are not naturally savage. We are not savage when approached as individuals. Perhaps they know this, but are afraid anyhow. Instinctive fear rising up from the blood of their hunted, frightened forebears. The human race will be a good partner to these races. Even recovering from starvation as I am, I can feel in myself an energy they do not have. The savage in me and my race is a creative thing. For in those who have been educated as I was, it is a controlled savagery which attacks and destroys only problems and obstacles, never people. Any human raised outside of the political traditions that the race inherited from its blood-stained childhood would be as friendly and ready for friendship as I am towards these beings. I could never hurt these pleasant, overgrown bunnies and squirrels. We will do everything we can to make up for. We will try to help, says the bunny, stumbling over the English, but civilized and cordial and kind. I sit up suddenly, reaching out impulsively to shake his hand. Suddenly frightened, he leaps back. All of them step back, glancing behind them as though making sure of the avenue of escape. Their big, luminous eyes widen and glance rapidly from me to the doors, frightened. They must think I am about to leap out of bed and pounce on them and eat them. I am about to laugh and reassure them, about to say that all I want from them is friendship, when I feel a twinge in my abdomen from the sudden motion. I touch it with one hand under the bedclothes. There is a scar of an incision here, almost healed. An operation. The weakness I am recovering from is more than the weakness of starvation. For only half a second I do not understand. Then I see why they looked ashamed. They voted the murder of a race. All the human survivors found have been made sterile. There will be no more humans after we die. I am frozen, one hand still extended to grasp the hand of the rabbity one, my eyes still searching for his expression, reassuring words still half-formed. There will be time for anger or grief later, for now, in this instant, I can understand. They are probably quite right. We were carnivores. I know, because... At this moment of hatred, I could kill them all. End of The Carnivore by G. A. Morris Recording by Miss Avaris Planet Four by Jack Williamson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite The Doom from Planet Four by Jack Williamson S.O.S. 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 Three short, three long, three short. The flashes winked from the dark headland. Dan McNally, master and owner of the small and ancient trading schooner Virginia, caught the feeble, flickering light from the island as he strode across the foredeck. He stopped, stared at the looming black line of land beneath the tropical stars. Again light flashed from a point of rock far above the dim white line of phosphorescent surf spelling out the signal of distress. Somebody been calling with a flashlight, I think, the big Swede Larson rumbled from the wheel. Dan thought suddenly of a reply. He rushed into the chart house to return in a moment with a lighted lantern and a copy of the nautical almanac, which would serve to hide the flame between flashes. He flashed an answer. Again the pale light flickered from the dark mass of land, spelling words out rather slowly as if the sender were uncertain in his knowledge of Morse. Surprised as Dan had been by the signal from an island marked on the charts as uninhabited, he was astonished at the message that now came to him. You are in 
terrible danger, he read in the flashes. Dreadful thing here. Hurry away. Radio for warships. I am... The winking light suddenly went out. Dan strained his eyes to watch the point where it had been, and a few seconds later he saw a curious thing. A darting, stabbing lance of green fire flashed out across the barren rocky cliff, lighting it fleetingly with pale green radiance. It leapt out and was gone in an instant, leaving the shoulder of the island dark as before. Dan watched for long minutes, but he saw nothing more brilliant than the pale gleam of phosphorescence where the waves dashed against the sheer granite wall of the island. What do you think? Larson broke in upon him. Dan started, then answered slowly. I don't know. First I thought there must be a lunatic at large, but that green light, I, I didn't like it. He stared again at the looming mass of the island. Davis Island is one of the innumerable tiny islets that dot the South Pacific, merely the summit of a dead volcano projecting above the sea. Nominally claimed by Great Britain, it is marked on the charts as uninhabited. Radio for warships, eh? he muttered. A wireless transmitter was one of many modern innovations that the Virginia did not boast. She had been gathering copra and shell among the islands long before such things came into common use, though Dan had invested his modest savings in her only a year before. What would anyone want with warships on Davis Island? The name roused a vague memory. Davis Island, he repeated, staring in concentration at the Black Sea. Of course! It came to him suddenly. A newspaper article that he had read five years before, at about the time he had abandoned college in the middle of his junior year to follow the call of adventure. The account had dealt with an eclipse of the sun, visible only from certain points on the Pacific. One Dr. Hunter, under the auspices of a Western University, had sailed with his instruments and assistants to Davis Island to study the solar corona during the few precious moments when the shadow covered the sun, and to observe the displacement of certain stars as a test of Einstein's theory of relativity. The reporter had interviewed the party at San Francisco, on the eve of sailing. There had been photographs of the chartered vessel, of Dr. Hunter and his instruments, and of his daughter, Helen, who acted as his secretary. She looked not at all like a scientist. Dan recalled. In fact, her face had seemed rather pretty, even in the blurred newspaper halftone. But the memory cast no light upon the present puzzle. In the rambling years that had led him to this spot upon the old Virginia, he had lost touch with the science that had interested him during his college days. He had heard nothing of the results of the Hunter expedition, but this island had been its destination. He turned decisively to the man at the wheel. Larson, we'll stand well offshore till daylight, he said. Then, unless we see something unusual, we can sail in and land a boat to— The sentence was never finished. Through the corner of his eye, Dan saw a ray of green light darting toward them from the island. A line of green fire seemed to reach out and strike him a physical blow. Green flame flared around him, and somehow he was hurtled from the bridge, clear of the rail, and into the sea. His impression of the incident was very confused. He seemed to have struck the water with such force that his breath was knocked out. He struggled back to the surface, strangling and coughing the bitter brine from his lungs. It was several minutes before he was comfortably treading water and able to see what had happened. The old schooner was then a hundred yards away, careening crazily and drifting aimlessly before the light breeze. The strange green fire had vanished. A parts of the ship apparently had been carried away or disintegrated by the ray of force of which it was a visible effect. The mainmast was down and was hanging over the side in a tangle of rigging. Bright yellow flames were dancing at a dozen points about the wreckage on the listing deck. A grotesque, broken thing, queerly illuminated by the growing fires, was hanging over the wheel. The body of Larson. 
No living thing was visible, and Dan, after a second look at the wreck of the bow, knew that he must be the sole survivor of the catastrophe. Too bad about the boys, he muttered through teeth that chattered, for the cold water had already chilled him. And poor old Larson. He thought again of the warning flashed from the shore. Guess there must be something hellish afoot after all, he muttered again. The flicker of green that stopped the signals and the green fire that got us. What can they mean? He looked toward the looming black shadow of the island and began divesting himself of his clinging, sodden garments. I don't wonder somebody wanted battleships, but even a battleship if that green ray hit it. He drew a deep breath and ducked his head while he unlaced his shoes and kicked out of them. Then, with a final look at the burning wreck of the Virginia, he tore off the last bit of his underclothing and swam for the shore in an easy crawl. The rocky ramparts of Davis Island were three or four miles away. But there was no wind. The Black Sea was calm save for a long, hardly perceptible swell. A strong swimmer and in superb condition, Dan felt no anxiety about being able to make the distance. There was danger, however, that a shark would run across him, or that he could not find a landing place upon the rocky shore. Four bells had rung when he had seen the first flash. It had been just ten o'clock, and it was some four hours later that Dan touched bottom and waded wearily up a bit of smooth, hard beach through palely glittering phosphorescent foam. He rubbed the brine from his tired limbs and sat down for a time, in a spot where a fallen boulder sheltered his naked body from the cool morning wind. In a few moments he rose, flexed his muscles, and peered through the starlit darkness for a way up the cliff behind the beach. He found it impossible to distinguish anything. Got to keep moving, or find some clothes, he muttered, and I may stumble onto what made the green light. Darn lucky I've been so far, anyhow. Larson and the others. But I shan't think of them. Wonder who was flashing the signals from the island, and did the green fire get him? He turned to look out over the black plain of the sea. Far out, the Virginia lay low in the water, a pillar of yellow flame rising from her hull. As he watched, the flame flickered and vanished. The old schooner, he supposed, had sunk. Then he noticed a pale glow come into being among the stars on the eastern horizon. Hello, he muttered again. So, we're going to have a moon, in the last quarter, but still it ought to light me up from this beach. A moment later the horns of the crescent had come above the black rim of the sea. Dan waited, swinging his arms and tramping up and down on the sand, until the silvery moon had cleared the horizon and illuminated the rugged face of the cliff with pale white radiance. He chose a path to the top of the cliff and clambered up, emerging in a jungle-like thicket of brush. Picking his way with the greatest caution, yet scratching his naked skin most painfully, he made his way for a few yards through the brush to a point of vantage from which he could look about. He was, he perceived, in a narrow valley or ravine, with rugged black walls rising sheer on either side. The silvery light of the crescent moon fell upon the rank jungle that covered the narrow floor of the canyon, which rose and dwindled as it penetrated inland. Gazing up the canyon, Dan gasped in amazement at what he saw. Mars, the red planet, hung bright and motionless low in the western sky gleaming with deep, bloody radiance. Directly beneath it, bathed in the white light of the moon, was a bare, rocky peak that seemed the highest point of the island. And upon that highest pinnacle, that chanced to be just below the ruddy star, was an astounding machine. Three slender towers of a white metal that gleamed in the moonlight with the silvery luster of aluminum rose from the rocky peak. They supported, in a horizontal position, an enormous metal ring. It must be, Dan reckoned swiftly, at least a hundred feet in diameter, and held a hundred feet above the summit of the mountain. The huge ring gleamed with a strange purple radiance. A shimmering mist of red-violet light surrounded it. An unknown force seemed to throb within the mighty ring, drawing the mantle of purple haze about it. 
and suspended inside the ring and below it was a long, slender needle of dazzling white light. To Dan, from where he stood in the canyon, it seemed a fine, sharp line, though he knew it must be some kind of pointer, luminous with the strange force pulsing through it. The strange needle wavered a little, with quick, uncertain motions. The brilliance of its light varied oddly. It seemed to throb with a queer, irregular rhythm. And the gleaming needle pointed straight at the planet Mars. Dan stood a long time watching the purple ring upon the silver towers, with the shining white needle hanging below it. He stared at Mars, glowing like a red and sinister eye above the incredible mechanism. His mind was in a wild storm of wonder shot with fear. What was the meaning of the gleaming ring and needle? What connection did this great device have with the signal of distress from the cliff and the green fire that had destroyed the Virginia? And why did the glowing needle point at Mars? He did not know when he first began to hear the sound. For a time it was merely part of the strange mystery of the island, only another element in the atmosphere of fear and wonder that surrounded him. Then it rose a little and he became suddenly sharply conscious of it as an additional menace. The sound was not loud, but deep and vibrant, a whir or hum, like that of a powerful muffled motor, but deeper than the sound of any motor man has ever made. It came down the gorge from the direction of the machine on the mountain. That deep throbbing noise frightened Dan as none of his previous experiences had done. Shivering from fear as much as from cold, he crouched down beside a huge boulder in the edge of the tangle of brush that covered the bottom of the ravine. His heart pounded wildly. He was in the clutches of an unreasoning fear that some terrible thing had seen him and was about to seek him out. For a moment he had to use all his will to keep himself from panic flight through the brush. The unknown is always terrible, and he had invaded the domain of a force he could not understand. In a moment, however, he recovered himself. He would be as safe there in the jungle, he thought, as anywhere on the island. He thought of starting a fire, then realized that he had no matches and that he would not dare to make a light if he were able. He pulled a few handfuls of dry grass to make a sort of bed upon which he huddled up, thanking his lucky stars that the island was in a semi-tropical latitude. His mind returned again to the riddles that confronted him, the green flash and the strange mechanism on the peak. He recalled fantastic stories he had read of hermit scientists conducting amazing experiments in isolated parts of the world. Presently he decided that something of the kind must be on foot here. The green flash is a sort of death ray, he summed up aloud, and they shoot it from that bright needle. No wonder they don't want to be bothered. Somebody may be fixing to upset civilization. But it's queer that the needle points at Mars. Of this last fact, which might have been a clue to the most reasonable solution to the mystery, if a rather astounding one, he was able to make nothing. In fact, huddled up on his pile of grass in some degree of comfort, he presently went to sleep, still pondering in vain upon this last clue. He was awakened by a soft, insistent purring sound, rather like that of a small electric motor run without load at very high speed. Recollection of the night's events came abruptly to him, and he sprang to his feet in alarm, finding his muscles sore and stiff from his cramped position. From one side Dan heard the rumble of thunder, and glancing up saw that the sky above the sea was overcast with a rolling mass of dark menacing clouds. There was a strange portentous blackness about these storm clouds that filled him with a nameless fear. Suddenly he was struck with the thought that it was not thunder that had wakened him. The noise he had heard had not the rumbling or booming quality of thunder. As he stood there he again became conscious of the low, whirring sound behind him. He whirled around to face it. The shock of what he saw left him momentarily dizzy and trembling, though undoubtedly his surroundings had much to do with its effect upon him. The sound came from a glistening metal machine which stood half hidden in the brush a dozen yards away, looking at him. 
The thing was made of a lustrous silvery metal, which Dan afterwards supposed to be aluminum or some alloy of that metal. Its gleaming case was shaped more like a coffin or an Egyptian mummy case than any other object with which he was familiar, though rather larger than either. That is, it was an oblong metal box tapering toward the ends with the greatest width forward of the middle. Twin tubes projected from the end of it, lenses in them glistening like eyes. Just below them sprang out steely glistening tentacles several feet long, writhing and twitching as if they were alive. The tangle of green brush hid the thing's legs so that Dan could not see them. Suddenly it sprang toward him, rising ten feet high and covering half the distance between them. It alighted easily upon the two long jointed metal limbs upon which it had leapt, and continued to keep the lens tubes turned toward Dan, so he knew that the grotesque metal thing was watching him. The limbs, he observed, were similar to the hind legs of a grasshopper, both in shape and position, and evidently the thing leapt upon them in about the same way. Then he noticed another curious thing about it. Three little bars of metal projected above the thickest part of its case, on the upper side. Their ends were joined by a little ring, three inches across. The tiny metal ring glowed with purple luminosity. A purple haze seemed to cling about it, as to the huge ring Dan had seen on the towers above the peak. And suspended inside this ring was a tiny metal needle, shimmering with pulsating white fire. On the back of this metal monster was a miniature replica of the strange mechanism upon the pinnacle. The little needle pointed up the canyon. A glance that way showed Dan that it pointed at the great device upon the mountain which looked even more brilliant on this gloomy morning than in the uncertain radiance of the moon. The colossal ring was shrouded in a splendid mantle of purple flame and the long, slender needle, which seemed to have swung on down to follow Mars below the horizon, still throbbed with scintillating white fire. For several minutes the two stood there, studying each other. A naked man, tense and bewildered in the presence of a mysterious force, and a grotesque machine cased in gleaming white metal, whose parts seemed to duplicate most of the functions of a living creature. Then one of the writhing tentacles that shot from the head of the machine reached back under the metal case and reappeared grasping what appeared to be a flat disk of emerald, two inches across and half an inch thick. This green disk it held up with a flat side toward Dan. There was no sound, but a flash of green light came from it, cutting a wide swath into the jungle and littering its path with smoking and flaming debris. But Dan, expecting something of the kind, had flung himself sideways into the shelter of the boulder beside which he had slept. Behind it he gathered his feet under him, picked up a rock of convenient size for throwing, and waited, ready and alert. He heard the soft humming sound on the other side of the boulder. A glittering object flashed above him. Crashing through the brush, the metal monster came to earth on the same side of the boulder with him. But the metal thing had not turned in its flight. Consequently, its rear end was toward Dan. As it began cumbersomely to turn about, he hurled his rock with an accuracy that came of a boyhood on the farm. Instinct had made him try for the little ring and needle on the back of the monster, apparently its most vulnerable part. Whether by luck or skill, the rock struck the gleaming ring, crushing it against the needle, and instant paralysis overtook the metal thing. Its tentacles and limbs became fixed and rigid, and it toppled over in the brush. Dan walked over to it and examined it briefly. The green disc had fallen on the ground, and he picked it up. It was made of emerald crystal. It had a little knob of glistening metal set in one side. Rather afraid of it, Dan forbore to twist the knob, but he still clutched it in his hand a few moments later, when, partly for fear that others of his kind would come to succor the fallen monster and partly to secure shelter from the threatening rain, he retired into the shadows of the tangled jungle. He spent perhaps half an hour in creeping back to what he supposed a place of comparative safety. For some time he lay there in the cool gloom, brushing occasional insects off his bare skin, wishing by turns that he had a cup of coffee and a good beefsteak, 
and that he could puzzle out a logical solution of all the astounding things he had met in the island. After the encounter with the metal monster, he felt his theory of the hermit scientists a bit inadequate. Presently his attention was attracted by the unmistakable mew of a kitten. Then he heard the padding sound of cautious human footsteps, and a clear feminine voice calling, Kitty, Kitty, in low tones. The steps and the voice seemed coming toward him. Since there was no sound of crackling brush, he supposed there was a trail which he had not found. Hello? he ventured, when the voice seemed only a few yards away through the green tangle. At the same instant a gray kitten appeared out of the underbrush and frisked trustfully across to him. He put out a hand, caressed it, picked it up. In a moment the feminine voice replied, Hello yourself. Who are you? A crackling sound came from the brush, as if the speaker were starting toward him. Dan, abruptly conscious of his lack of attire, said quickly, Wait a minute. I, I haven't anything on. You see, um, Dan McNally, I owned the schooner that something happened to off the island last night. A delicious, trilling laugh greeted the panic of his first words. Then the clear, sweet voice, serious again, replied, So, you swam ashore from the boat I signaled? Yes. Gee, but I'm glad to find you. And you say you haven't any clothes? I wonder what— The voice paused reflectively, then resumed. Here's a sheet that I got to signal with in the daytime if I had a chance. You might wrap it around you until we find something better. The low, liquid laugh rang out again. Again there was a rustling in the brush, and presently an arm appeared, holding a rolled-up sheet. All right, he called. Throw it this way. In a moment, with the sheet draped around him like a Roman toga, and the kitten on his arm, he advanced to meet the owner of the beautiful voice. At the trail he met a trim, active-looking young woman, clad in out-of-door attire, with a canvas knapsack on her back. Bareheaded, she wore her brown hair closely shingled. Her face, Dan recognized from the photograph he had seen five years before, though it was more lovely than the splotched newspaper picture had hinted. Her brown eyes were filled with laughter at his predicament, and his present unusual garb. He bowed with mock gravity and said, How do you do, Miss Helen Hunter? Brown eyes widened in surprise. You know me? she asked. Not half so well as I hope to, he grinned. Then, handing her the kitten, he spoke seriously. What about this island, the green flashes, the big machine on the mountain, the metal thing that jumps about like a grasshopper? What's it all about? You know anything about it? Yes. I know a good deal about it," she told him soberly. It's rather a terrible story, and one you may not believe. No, you've seen them. But the kitten is hungry, and you must be too, if you swam ashore. Well, yes, I am, Dan admitted. The storm clouds were drifting out to sea. The sun was beginning to assert itself, and it now lighted up the scene with a cheerful brightness. She slung off her pack and sat down cross-legged at the side of the trail. Dan sat down opposite her as she opened the knapsack and produced a can of condensed milk, one of sardines, a can opener, and half a loaf of bread. I had to select my supplies rather at random, she said, and you'll have to make the best of them. She started to open the sardines. You'd better give it to me, Dan advised. You might cut your hand. You think so? she asked, deftly lifting the lid, fishing out a fish for the kitten and presenting the can to Dan. Then with capable hands she broke off a large chunk of bread which she handed him. Go ahead and finish this up, she said. I've already had breakfast. She punched two holes in the end of the milk can and poured some of the thick yellow fluid into the palm of her left hand, from which she let the kitten lap it. And now for the mystery of this island. Dan demanded, forgetting bread and sardines in his eagerness. The girl turned to face him. I'm Helen Hunter, as you seem to know, she began. I came here with my father five years ago to observe an eclipse of the sun. When it was all over and the ship called to take us off, he decided to send the results of our observations by one of the other men. He wanted to stay here to carry on another experiment. 
the one that led to that machine on the hill. Part of the other men were willing to stay. The yacht left us here and has been back from San Francisco every six months since with mail and supplies. And what was the experiment? Dan demanded eagerly. Have you ever looked at Mars through a good telescope? she countered. Then you must have seen the canals. Straight dark lines running from the white polar caps to the equatorial zone. All scientists did not agree as to what they were, but nobody could suggest a natural origin for them. My father was one of those who thought that the canals were fertile, cultivated strips, irrigated with water brought down from the melting ice caps. Irrigation systems meant intelligent life upon the planet, and his experiment was an attempt to communicate with that intelligence. And he succeeded? Dan was astounded. Yes, the means was simple enough. Other men had suggested it years before, in fact. Any fairly bright light on Mars, such as the beam of a searchlight directed toward Earth, would be visible in a good telescope when the planet is favorably situated. It follows that such a light on Earth should be visible to an observer with a similar instrument on Mars. It was possible, of course, but unlikely that Mars would have intelligent inhabitants still ignorant of the telescope. It was also possible that their senses would be different from Mars that if they saw at all, it would be with a different part of the spectrum. Father took the chance, and he succeeded. The call was simple, merely three flashes of light repeated again and again. We used a portable searchlight mounted on a motor truck such as is used in the Army. The three flashes meant that we were on the third planet of the solar system. The answering call from the fourth planet should be four flashes, of course. For three nights we kept signaling. One of the men watched the motor generator, and I operated the searchlight, swinging it on Mars and off again to make the flashes. Dad kept his eye screwed to the telescope. Nothing happened, and he got discouraged. I persuaded him to keep on for another night in case they hadn't seen us at first, or needed more time to get their searchlight ready. And on the fourth night, Poor Dad came out of the observatory shouting that he had seen four flashes. Dan gasped, speechless with astonishment. Then that machine with the needle pointing at Mars and the green flashes and the thing that jumped at me? Helen waved a white hand for silence. Just keep cool a minute. I'm coming to them. The four flashes just began it. In a few days Dad and the Martians were communicating by a sort of television process. He would mark off a sheet of paper into squares, blacken some of the squares to make a picture or design, then have me send a flash for each black square and miss an interval for each white one, taking them in regular order. The Martians seemed to catch on pretty soon. In a few days Dad was receiving pictures of the same sort. Rather a slow way of communication, perhaps, but it worked better than one might think at first. In a month, Dad had received instructions for building a small machine like the big one on the hill. It is something like a radio. At least, it operates with vibrations in the ether. But it's as much ahead of our radio as an airplane is in advance of a fire balloon. I understand a good bit about it, but I won't try to explain it now. And in the next three years, Dad learned no end of things from the people on Mars. One queer thing about it was that they never let us see them on the television apparatus, no matter how many of their scientific secrets they gave us. Dad and I exhibited ourselves, but I don't know yet what the Martians look like, though I have made a guess. By the end of the third year they had showed Dad how to make one of those metal things. Like that one that jumped at me? Dan broke in with a shudder. Yes. They seem almost alive, but they are machines, like our robots and controlled by the radio apparatus. The eyes use photoelectric cells and relay what is before them to the master intelligence. The girl spoke these last words in a low tone, shrinking involuntarily. She paused a moment, then shrugged and continued. The first machine did not obey my father. It was controlled by signals that came from Mars, over the big station on the hill, and it went to work, making more apparatus, building more machines, enlarging the receiving station. 
It worked in obedience to the Master Intelligence on Mars. That was a year ago. The last time the yachts called, my father and the other men still hoped to control the machines. They let her go back without us. The machines tolerated us a while, paid no attention to us. They were busy working mines and building huge, strange things that must be flying machines. The plateau on the other side of the peak is crowded with them. For the machines are preparing to leave the island. They are going to conquer the world for the Master Intelligence on Mars. Months ago my father discovered this and realized that he had loosed doom upon the Earth. He and the three other men planned to destroy that big station on the peak. All the signals to the machines are relayed through that from Mars. The machines seemed to pay no heed as they made their preparations. Then one night, about three weeks ago, they tried to dynamite the station. The girl's shoulder trembled. She paused to brush a tear from her eye, then went on hastily in a voice grown husky with emotion. Dan felt an odd desire to take her slight form in his arms and comfort her in her grief. The machines had seemed heedless, but they were ready. They had those disks that throw the green fire. We had not seen them before, and, well, all four of them were killed. Dan handed her the disk of green crystal he had taken from the thing that had attacked him. She examined it silently, then went on. Dad had left me in bed, but I heard an explosion. I think the bombs went off when the green fire struck them. I knew what had happened, and got out of the house just before the machines arrived. They wrecked the place with their green flashes. And for the last three weeks I've been hiding in the jungle or watching for ships. Three times I've raided the ruins of the house for something to eat. Fortunately it didn't burn, like your ship. And that's all, I suppose, except I'm awfully glad that you got ashore. Thanks, Dan said earnestly. And what are we going to do now? I don't know, Helen answered in a troubled tone. I'm afraid, afraid for all humanity. On the television I, I've seen enough of Mars to be sure that it is a world of machines controlled by one master intelligence, and even that may be a machine. We make machines that compute the tides and carry out other computations that are almost beyond the power of the human mind. Why couldn't a machine think? The Master Intelligence of Mars plans to add the Earth to his domain. Unless we can do something to stop it, in a few years the world will be overrun with gigantic robot machines, controlled by force from across the gulf of space. Humanity cannot resist them. Imagine a battleship pitted against that green annihilating ray and all the other science of an elder planet. Life is to be blotted out. The Master Intelligence of Mars will rule two worlds of mechanical monsters." Dan sat in a dazed vision horror to come, until Helen straightened up, as if shaking off a mantle of fear, and smiled heroically, if a bit wanly. "'Now you must eat your bread and sardines to give you strength to fight for humanity,' she cried with a laugh that she strived, not too successfully, to make cheerful and gay. Obediently he began to eat, finding an excellent appetite. It was several minutes later that he fancied he heard a whirring and crackling in the brush behind them. He sprang to his feet in alarm. "'It can't be far back to where I left the machine,' he cried. "'Do you suppose there's danger that—' The mechanical ears of the metal things may have picked up the sound of his voice, but in any event green flame flashed about them on the instant. Feeling a sudden protective impulse, Dan started toward Helen. That was his last recollection, before what seemed a terrific concussion swept him into the abyss of unconsciousness. His first thought when he awakened was of the girl, but he was alone in the silence of the canyon. He sat up, realizing that many hours had passed, for the air was growing cool again and the sun was low behind the peak at the head of the ravine. The huge, mysterious machine of the purple ring and the vibrating white needle were blazing splendidly. He took more detailed stock of his immediate surroundings. The tangle of brush that had sheltered them had been cut away by the green annihilating ray. Charred stumps remained to show where it had fired bushes beyond the trail. His own shoulder was blistered, a hole was burned into the sheet wound about him, and the hair was singed from the back of his head. Suddenly, trembling with horror, he looked about for anything to show that Helen had perished by the ray. 
Discovering nothing, he breathed a sigh of relief. She must still be alive, anyhow, he muttered. And I've had another lucky break. The ray was too high to get me. They must have left me for dead. Presently he became conscious of torturing thirst. He retired through the brush along the rocky wall of the canyon. By sunset he came upon a little natural basin in the rock half full of rainwater. It was none too clean, but he drank his fill of it and felt relief. Looking up the canyon he could see the great mechanism on the peak gleaming in the dusk. Intensely glowing purple mist clung about the great metal ring and the slender delicate needle swung below it, still vibrating, still throbbing with brilliant white radiance. It pointed at the red eye of Mars, which had just winked into view. Dan stared at it a long time. It all sounds crazy, he muttered, but it isn't. The master intelligence of Mars, she said, is controlling the mechanical things through that. The doom of the Earth is coming through that white needle. If only I could smash it somehow. He looked down at the white folds of the sheet that draped him and clenched his hands impotently. No gun, not even a pocket knife, nothing but my bare hands. He bit his lip. Still, he stared challengingly at the gleaming mechanism on the peak. An idea slowly took form in his mind. An exclamation abruptly escaped him. Narrowly, he eyed the trussed girders of the silver towers which supported the great ring, muttering to himself. Yes, I can do it if I don't get caught. I can climb it well enough. The needle looks a bit frail. I should be able to smash it. I'd like to see Helen again, though. He gathered the sheet around him and began picking a cautious way up the canyon, staying always in the cover of boulders or brush. A few times he disturbed a rock or snapped a twig beneath his foot. Then he waited out of sight for long minutes, though he had no reason to believe that the metal monsters were on the alert for him. I've got to do it. The world depends on it, he kept saying again and again in his mind. The quick darkness of the tropics had fallen almost before he started, but he welcomed the night, for it made his own silent progress more difficult, it reduced the hazard that he would be discovered. Gauging the time by the slow wheeling of the diamond-like stars across the velvet sky, he thought that two hours had passed when he reached the head of the canyon. He stood up cautiously to survey the little plateau at the summit of the hill. It was several acres in extent quite level and almost clear of vegetation. At the farther side was a pile of wreckage which he supposed had been the quarters of Dr. Hunter's party before they had been destroyed. Many huge machines stood about the plateau, vast, dark masses looming in the starlight. Mostly they were either not running or very silent in operation, but a very deep, vibrant humming sound came from one near him. Smaller shapes were moving about them with long, easy leaps. These, he knew, were the mechanical monsters, though it was too dark to distinguish them. But by far the most prominent object upon the plateau was the enormous gleaming thing that Helen had said was the station over which came the signals from the Master Intelligence on Mars. One of its three towers sprang up not far from where he stood. The huge refulgent ring swathed in its mist of purple fire was a full hundred feet above him, and the slender needle pulsing with white flame swinging within and below the colossal ring was itself a hundred feet in length. The white needle, for all its length, seemed hardly thicker than a man's finger. It was mounted at the top of a curiously complex and delicate-looking device that spread broadly out between the three towers below the center of the huge purple ring. Dan looked at it and decided that his plan had at least a chance of success, though he had no hope that it would not be fatal to him. Quickly and silently he ran to the base of the mighty silver towers nearest him and began to climb the side toward the ravine, where the maze of girders would hide him, at least partially from any watchers back on the plateau. The starlight and the faint, weird radiance of the purple ring above sufficed to guide him. The cross-braces on the girder he had chosen were spaced closely enough to serve as the rungs of a ladder. Dan climbed easily, pausing twice for breath and to look down at the dark plateau. The vast humming machines loomed up strangely in the pale purple light that fell from the gleaming ring. 
Once he looked across toward the other side of the island. The surface there was more level. He glimpsed tiny moving lights and huge stationary masses apparently as large as ocean liners. He had an impression of a vast amount of mechanical activity proceeding in the darkness very rapidly and in a silent and orderly fashion. The expeditionary force of the master intelligence of Mars, he thought, preparing to set out against humanity. And what I can do is the only chance to stop it. He climbed again with renewed energy. A few yards more brought him to the colossal metal ring. Resting upon the three towers, it was a circular band of shining metal a foot thick and as wide as a road. The intense purple glow extended several feet from its surface. Dan touched it tentatively. He felt a tingling electric shock, and he thought he could feel a radiation coming from it, giving him a curious sensation of cold. As he reached his hands up and grasped the upper edge of the great ring, he felt what seemed a physical current of cold. Controlling his tendency to shiver, he climbed upon the last brace, and lifting his weight with his hands, threw himself face down upon the flat upper surface of the vast ring. He lay bathed in cold purple fire. He tingled with the chill of it. A frozen current seemed to penetrate his body. Involuntarily he trembled, lost his grip, and dangled precariously from the rim. Only a frantic scrambling restored his hold. Then, fighting the sensation of freezing cold that came from the mist of purple flame, he drew himself forward and got to his feet upon the broad surface of the metal ring. On both sides it curved away like a circular track. Red-violet fire shimmered about it, bathing him to the waist in a chilling torrent. Through coruscating frozen flame he waded to the inner rim of the colossal ring. Below him hung the needle, a mere straight line of white fire a hundred feet in length. Eye-dazzling radiance scintillated along it, waxing and waning with a curious throbbing rhythm. The needle vibrated a little, but it pointed directly at the red point of Mars, now almost directly overhead. Repressing a shudder, Dan looked down at the complex and delicate apparatus upon which the slender needle was mounted. It was a light frame of white metal bars, with spidery coils and huge glowing tubes and flimsy spinning disks mounted in it. The gleaming needle was mounted much like a telescope at the top of the device, full fifty feet below him. "'Looks flimsy enough,' Dan muttered. "'I'll go through it like a sixteen-inch shell. Who would have thought I'd end this way?" He stepped back for a moment, and stood on the polished metal, hidden to the waist in cold purple flame. Lest it impede his movements, he tore the sheet from him and threw it aside. He let his eyes sweep for a last time over the familiar constellations blazing so splendidly in the black sky above. He had a pang of heartache, as if the stars were old friends. His glance roved fondly over the dark, indistinct masses of the island and across the black plain of the sea. "'Well, no good in waiting,' he muttered again. "'Sorry I can't see Helen. Hope she gets off all right.' He backed to the outer rim and drew a deep breath like one about to dive. Then, with set face, he sprinted forward. As he did so, a blinding flash of green light flickered up before him. He ducked his head and leapt from the inner edge of the vast glowing ring. For long seconds it seemed he was plunging down through space, feet first. Air rushed screaming about his ears, but his mind was quite calm and registered an astonishingly large series of impressions. He saw the delicate gleaming machines rushing up to meet him. The shimmering white needle swung on its top. He took in the silent, dark plateau with the masses of the great machines rising like ominous shadows here and there, and the mechanical monsters leaping busily about it, almost invisible in the dim ghostly radiance that fell from the purple ring. He saw a vivid flame of green reach up past him from somewhere below. He knew without emotion or alarm that he had been discovered and that it was too late for his discoverers to stop him. He found time even for a fleeting thought of death. His mind framed the question, What will I be in a moment from now? Then he had struck the great white needle, and was crashing into the delicate apparatus below it.
Waves of pain beat upon his mind like flashes of blinding light. But his last mental image, as he passed into oblivion, was a picture of Helen's face. Oddly, it was not her face, as he had last seen it, but a reproduction of the old newspaper halftone, curiously retouched with life and color. There is little more to tell. It was some weeks later when Dan came back out of a world of delirium and dreams to find himself lying on his back in a tent, very much bandaged. He was alone at the moment, and at first could not recall that tremendous last day of his conscious life. Then he heard a thrillingly familiar feminine voice calling, Kitty, Kitty, Kitty. He tried to move. A dull pain throbbed in his breast, and a groan escaped him. In a moment Helen appeared. The gray kitten was forgotten. She looked very anxious and solicitous, and also, Dan thought, very beautiful. No, no, she cried. You are going to be all right. Dad made me learn a little elementary medicine before we came here, and I know. But you mustn't speak. Not for days yet. I'll have to guess what you want, and you can wink when I guess the right thing. Gee, but I'm glad you've come, too. You'll be as well as ever pretty soon. The kitten was lots of comfort, still. Dan attempted to move. She leaned over him, shifted his weight, and smoothed the sheet with strong, capable hands. You want to know about what happened to the machine monsters? He winked. Well, you remember when they found us and shot the green ray at us? They left you there. I thought you were dead, and carried me up here on the hill. Perhaps they wanted me for a laboratory subject to test the green ray on, or something of the kind. Anyhow, they carried me into a big shed filled with strange machines. They kept me there until that night. Then, all of a sudden, they all stopped. They froze. They were dead. The tentacles of one that was holding me were set about me, but I worked free and got out of the shed. It took all night. And when I came out, just at sunrise, I saw that the purple fire was gone from the great ring. The needle was knocked down and the apparatus smashed. I found you there in the wreckage. You made a human bullet of yourself to smash it. The greatest thing a man ever did." Though normally rather modest, Dan felt a glow of pride at the honest admiration ringing in her clear voice and shining from her warm brown eyes. So I gathered up what was left of you, she went on, and tried to put you back together again. A good many bones were broken, and you had more cuts and bruises than I could mention. But the apparatus had broken the force of the fall, and you were still alive. You are remarkably well put together, I should say, and unusually lucky as well. And, well, the machines and apparatus are scattered about all over the island. Every one of them stopped the instant you smashed the connection with the directing intelligence on Mars. There'll be quite a stir in the scientific world, I imagine, in about three weeks when the yacht comes and carries us back with a lot of plans and specimens. We must send about a thousand engineers back here to study what we leave behind us. And do you want anything else? She bent over and watched his bandaged face. Looking up into her bright eyes, thrilling to the cool, comforting pressure of her hand on his forehead, Dan reflected. Then he winked. Something you want me to do? He winked. When? Right now? No response. After the yacht comes? He winked. What is it? She looked him in the eye, blushed a little, and laughed. You mean? Dan winked. End of The Doom from Planet Four by Jack Williamson by H.P. Fife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Flame Down by H.P. Fife. It was, of course, one hell of an ending for a trip to Mars. Charlie Holmes lost touch with reality amid rending and shattering sounds that lingered dimly. 
blackness engulfed him in a wave of agony. He was not sure exactly when the possibility of opening his eyes occurred to him. Vaguely, he could sense, remember was too definite, much tugging and hauling upon his supine body. It doubtless seemed justifiable, but he flinched from recalling more clearly that which must have been so extremely unpleasant. Gently, now, he tried rolling his head a few inches right, then left. When it hurt only one-tenth as much as he feared, he let his eyes open. Hello! rasped the bulbous creature squatting beside his pallet. Charlie shut his eyes quickly, and very tightly. Something with a dampish, spongy tip, probably one of the grape-red tentacles he had glimpsed, prodded his shoulder. Hello! insisted the scratchy voice. Charlie peeped warily, was trapped at it, and opened his eyes resignedly. Where now am I? he inquired. It sounded very trite, even in his confused condition, sections of the dark red skin before him, especially on the barrel-shaped belly, quivered as he spoke. Surely, grated the remarkable voice, you remember something. The crash, gasped Charlie, sitting up abruptly. He held his breath, awaiting the knifing pain it seemed natural to expect. When he felt none, he cautiously fingered his ribs, and then a horrid thought prompted him to wiggle his bare toes. Everything seemed to be in place. He lay in a small room, on a thin pallet of furs, floor and walls of slick ochre clay, reflected the bright outside light pouring through a wide doorway. "'What's all the sand?' he demanded, squinting at the heat waves outside. "'You do not recognize it? Look again, Earthman!' Earthman, thought Charlie, it must be real. I can still see him. What a whack on the head I must have got. "'You are in pain?' asked the creature solicitously. "'Oh, no. Just, I can't remember. The crash, and then... "'Ah, yes, you have not been conscious for some time.' His reddish host rippled upward to stand more or less erect upon three thick tentacles. "'Even with us, memory is slow after shock, and you may be uneasy in the lighter gravity.' "'Light gravity,' reflected Charlie. "'This can only mean Mars.' Sure, that must be it. I was piloting a rocket and cracked up somewhere on Mars. It felt right to him. He decided that the rest of his memory would return. Are you able to rise? asked the other, extending a helpful tentacle. The Earthman managed to haul himself stiffly to his feet. Say, my name is Holmes, he introduced himself dizzily. I am Co. Dicky, in your language, learn it years since, from other spacemen, I might say fiery canal men. Has to be Mars, muttered Charlie under his breath. What a bump! When can you show me what's left of the ship? There will be no time, answered the Martian. Bunches of small muscles twitched here and there across the front of his round, pudgy head. Charlie was getting used to the single eye, half the size of an orange and not much duller. With imagination, the various lumps and organs surrounding it might be considered a face. The priestesses will lead the crowd here, predicted Ko. They know I took an earthman, and I fear they have finished with the others. Finished with what? demanded the earthman, shaking his head in hopes of clearing it enough to figure out what was wrong. It has been an extremely dry season, Ko rippled his tentacles and moved lissomely to the doorway, assuming a grotesquely furtive posture as he peered out. The people are maddened by the drought. They will be aroused to sacrifice you to the canal gods, like the others who survived. Canal gods, croaked Charlie. This can't be right. Aren't you civilized here? I can't be the only Earthman they've seen. It is true that Earthmen are perfectly safe at most times. 
But the laws! The Earth Consul! Co snapped the tip of a tentacle at him. The canals are low. You can feel the heat and dryness for yourself. The crowds are inflamed by temple prophecies. And then your ship flaming down from the skies. He snapped all his tentacle tips at once. From somewhere outside, a threatening murmur became audible. It was an unholy blend of rasping shouts and shriller chanting, punctuated by notes of a brassy gong. As Charlie listened, the volume rose noticeably. Co reached out with one tentacle and wrapped six inches about the earthman's wrist. When he plunged through the doorway, Charlie, perforce, went right with him. Whipping around a corner of the hut, he had time for a quick skint at the chanters. Co alone had looked weirdly alien. Two hundred, like him, led by a dozen bulgy figures in streaming robes, masked and decorated in brass. The natives were swarming over the sand toward the fugitives. They had evidently been busy. Above a distant cluster of low buildings, a column of smoke spiraled upward suggestively. Co led the way at a flowing gallop over a sandstone ridge and down a long slope toward what looked like the junction of two gullies. The canal, he wheezed. With luck, we may find a boat. A frenzied screech went up as the mob topped the ridge and regained sight of them. Charlie, having all he could do to breathe in the thin air, tried to shake his wrist loose. Now that they were descending the slope, he saw where the water was. They slid down a four-foot drop in a cloud of fine, choking dust, and were faced by several punt-like craft, stranded on the mud-flat below. The water was fifty feet further. We should have gone downstream, said Co, but we can wade. Their momentum carried them several steps into the mud before Charlie realized how wrong that was. Then, as they floundered about to regain the solid bank, it became apparent that they would never reach it in time. They are catching us, rasped Co. The howling crowd was scarcely a hundred yards away. The heat waves shimmered above the reddish desert sand until the Martians were blurred before Charlie's burning eyes. His feet churned the clinging mud, and he felt as if he were running in a dream. I'm sorry you're in it, too, he panted. It does not matter. I act as I must. The Earthman rubbed sweat from his eyes with the back of a muddy hand. Everything is wrong, he mumbled. I still can't remember cracking up the ship. Why did I always want to be a rocket pilot? Well, I made my bed. The oncoming figures wavered and blurred in the heat. Co emitted a grating sound reminiscent of an earthly chuckle. <laughs> as to all you mortals who finally have to lie in them, he rasped. I will tell you now, since I can carry this episode little farther. You have never piloted a spaceship. Charlie gaped at him incredulously. You, you, what about the wreck? It was a truck that hit you, Charlie Holmes. You have no more sense than to be crossing the street with your nose in a magazine just purchased on the corner. With some dulled, creeping, semi-detached facet of his mind, Charlie noted that the running figure still floated above the sand without actually drawing nearer. Are you... Do you mean I'm... D d d of course you are, grated Co amiably, and in view of certain actions during your life, there will be quite a period of, shall we say, probation. When I was assigned to you, your reading habits suggested an amusing series of variations. You cannot know how dull it is to keep frustrating the same old dreams. Amusing? repeated Charlie, beyond caring about the whimper in his tone. The mob was dissolving into thin smoke, and the horizon was shrinking. Co himself was altering into something redder of skin, but equipped with a normal number of limbs, discounting the barbed tail. The constant heat of the desert began at last to seem explicable. For me, a great amusement. 
grin co displaying hideous tusks next time i'll be a venusian you will lose again then we can visit other planets and stars oh we shall see a lot of each other he cheerfully polished one horn with a clawed finger you won't enjoy it he promised end of flame down by horace brown fife The Indulgence of Negu Ma by Robert Arthur This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Anderson The Indulgence of Negu Ma by Robert Arthur In his garden, Negu Ma, the Callisto uranium merchant, sat sipping a platinum mug of Molkai with his guest, Sliss the Venusian. Nanlo, his wife, pushing before her the small serving cart with its platinum Molkai decanter, paused for an instant as she entered the shell of pure vitrite which covered the garden, giving it the illusion of out-of-doorness. Negu Ma sat at his ease his broad, merry, half-oriental face good-humored, his features given a ruddy tinge by the light of rising Jupiter, the edge of whose sphere was beginning to dominate the horizon. Sliss, the intelligent amphibian, squatted across from him in the portable tub of water which he carried with him whenever absent from the swamps of his native Venus. The amphibian's popping eyes turned toward her. The wide, frog face split in a smile of appreciation as Nanlo approached. She refilled their mugs deftly and withdrew, but before she re-entered the house she could not resist hesitating to glance toward rising Jupiter and the slim shaft of the rocket ship silhouetted now against its surface. The ship was the cargo rocket Vulcan, newest and swiftest of Neguma's freighter fleet. Fully fueled and provisioned, storage space jammed with refrigerated foods that in space the cold of the encompassing void would keep perfectly for generations were it necessary. She would take off in the morning from the close-by landing port for Jupiter's other satellites, then go on to the Saturnian system, returning finally with full holds of uranium for Neguma's refineries on Callisto. She was a beautiful craft, the Vulcan, and one man could manage her, though her normal crew was seven. She had cost a great sum, but Neguma was wealthy. Nanlo's face Sylph-like in its beauty, hardened. Neguma was wealthy indeed. Had he not bought her? And had she not cost him more, much more than the Vulcan? But no, it was not quite accurate to say that Neguma had bought her. However, since time immemorial, beautiful daughters had been, if not sold, yet urged into marriages to wealthy men for the benefit of their impoverished families. And though science had made great strides, conquering the realms of the telescope and invading those below the level of the microscope, finding cures for almost every disease the flesh of man was heir to, there was one ailment it had not yet conquered. Poverty. Nanlo's father had been a rocket port attendant. Once he had been a pilot, but a crash crippled him for life. Thereafter, his wages had been quite insufficient to sustain him, his brood of a half-dozen children, and their hard-working mother. But Nanlo, growing up, had developed into a mature beauty that rivaled the exotic loveliness of the wild orchids of Eo, and in debarking at the rocket port on a business trip to Earth because hurricanes had forced him to land far south of New York, Neguma had seen her. Thereafter, but that is a story as ancient as history, too. It was a truth Nanlo conveniently overlooked, now that she had not been unwilling to be Neguma's bride. It was true she had driven a sharp bargain with him, her father's debts paid, and sufficient more to ease her parents' life and educate her brothers and sisters, plus a marriage settlement for herself, and a sum in escrow in the Earth Union Bank should she ever divorce him for cruelty or mistreatment. But that had been only innate shrewdness. She would still have married him had he refused her demands for her family. 
for his wealth fascinated her, and the prospect of being a virtual queen, even of a distinct outpost colony such as that on Callisto, appealed to her. And she had thought that she was taking little risk, for if she were dissatisfied, the law these days was very lenient toward unhappy marital relationships. It required only definite proof of misconduct, mistreatment, or oppression of any kind to win freedom from an unwanted partner. Nanlo had been confident that after a year or two she would be able to shake free of the bonds uniting her to Neguma, and take flight for herself into a world made vastly more pleasant by the marriage settlement remaining to her. But now she had been married, and had lived on Callisto for a full five years, and her tolerance of Neguma had long since turned to bitter hate. Not because he was a bad husband, but because he was too good a one. There was an ironic humor in the situation, but Nanlo was not disposed to recognize it. Lenient as the law was, yet it required some grounds before it could free her, and she had no grounds whatsoever. Neguma was at all times the model of courtesy and consideration toward her. He granted every reasonable wish and some that were unreasonable, although when he refused one of the latter, it was with a firmness as unshakable as a rock. Their home was as fine as any on earth. She had more than adequate help in taking care of it. She had ample time for any pursuits that interested her, but she only used it to become more and more bitter against Neguma because she could find no excuse to divorce him. So great had her bitterness become that if she could have gotten off Callisto in any way, she would have deserted him. This would have meant forfeiting her marriage settlement and the sum that was in escrow. It would also have left her father in debt to Neguma for all that Neguma had given him. But Nanlo's passionate rebellion had reached such a state of ferment in her breast that she would have accepted all this to strike a blow at the plump, smiling man who now sat drinking Molkai in their garden with their guest from Venus. The answer to that was, Neguma would not let her leave Callisto. The journey to Earth, he logically argued, was still one containing a large element of danger. There was no reason for her to visit any other planet, and law and custom required that she look after their home while he himself was away on business. In this, he was unshakable. There was a stern and unyielding side to him, inherited perhaps from his eastern ancestors, that left Nanlo shaken and frightened when it appeared. She had seen it the one time she had seriously gone into a tantrum in an effort to make him let her take a trip to Earth. It had so startled and terrified her that she never used those tactics again. But now, as she wheeled away the Molkai decanter and left Neguma and Sliss to themselves, joy and exultation was singing in her. Doubly. For she was going to run away from Neguma run away with the man she loved, and in their flight they were going to steal the Vulcan. Thus Neguma would be doubly punished. He would be hurt in his pride and in his pocketbook. And all through the Jupiter and Saturn systems, where his wealth, his position, and his beautiful wife were openly envied, he would be laughed at and derided. Humming lightly under her breath, Nanlo put the Molkai decanter away in a little pantry and hurried on to her own apartment. Molkai was a powerful, though non-habit-forming drink. Under its influence, one became talkative, but disinclined to movement. Sliss and her husband would remain as they were for hours, leaving her free to do as she would. The servants were asleep in another part of the building, and there was no one to note as she changed her clothes swiftly for a light, warm traveling suit, caught up two small bags, one holding her personal things, the other her jewels, and let herself out through her own private entrance into the darkness of the rear gardens, where in the shadows, the tall, blonde, young engineer Hugh Niels was waiting for her. Negu Ma, when his beautiful wife had left the garden, sighed and put to one side his mug of Molkai. Sliss, my friend, he said to the Venusian, 
who was regarding him with large, unblinking pop eyes. I am troubled in my mind. Tonight I must dispense justice. Justice to myself and justice to another. To be just is often to be terribly cruel. Sliss blinked once, a film moving horizontally across his large eyes and retracting, to show that he understood. Due to the difficulty of using his artificial speech mechanism, he refrained from speaking until speech was necessary. My wife, Nanlo, Neguma said heavily, is unhappy. I have done all that is in my power to make her happy, but I have failed. She has made some requests that I have denied, namely to be permitted freedom to visit Earth. That I denied because I knew the path she intended to tread would have not led her to happiness either. And I hope that in the end here she would find contentment. I have hoped in vain. Tonight she intends to take matters into her own hands. Sliss blinked again, politely to indicate that he was interested if Negu Ma cared to tell him more. Negu Ma rose. My friend, he said, if you will come with me, I will show you what I mean. Sliss grasped the edge of his tub with webbed hands and swung his webbed, yellow-skinned feet free from the water which kept the sensitive membranes from drying, and at the same time supplied his body tissues with liquid. Falling upon all fours like a great, misshapen pet, he waddled awkwardly after his host. Neguma led him to an elevator within the house. This took them to a higher floor, and there they followed a corridor to the rear of the building. Here Neguma, without showing a light, opened a door, and in silence they moved out upon a small balcony overlooking the rear gardens, which were shrouded in darkness because rising Jupiter was on the opposite side of the building. They had stood there only a moment when below them a door opened, and a small figure slipped through. Another figure appeared from beneath the shadows of a cluster of slender, purple necklo trees and moved forward to greet the first. They met in the center of a tiny open space, where a fountain spurting through holes in a crystal made a sweet murmuring music. And to the two watchers rose whispered words, Nanlo, Nanlo, my darling, you. Oh, Hugh, my love, hold me close and tell me that everything is ready for us to leave. Hugh Neal's arms held her close, and his lips were hot on hers. That he was here as they had planned meant that he had succeeded in the other plans they had agreed upon. Exultation soared higher in Nanlo's breast. Then can we go? Go now? She asked eagerly as Hugh Neal's released her. The crew's asleep? You are able to arrange it? The young engineer looked down at her, his thin face a pale blur in the darkness. In five minutes, just five minutes, Nanlo, my own, I left the guard half an hour ago, drinking molkai into which I put a sleeping powder. Give him five more minutes to fall asleep, then we can go to the ship unseen, unchecked. Until then, we can wait here in the garden. He led her toward the trilling fountain, and they sat down upon a bench before it, of rare Callisto crystal. They were still in darkness, but the flame-like Jupiter light touched the tops of the Neclo trees above them with a ruddy light, which brought faint glimmerings from the radioactive leaves. Hugh Niels was a recent college graduate, whom Negu Ma had hired as an assistant supervisor in the refining mills on Callisto, where the precious uranium-235 was separated from the ordinary metal. It was not a desirable job, but the best Hugh Neils could get. His college record of reckless scrapes and entanglements with women had been against him. Indeed, this position had only come to him because his home was in the same section as Nanlo's, and Neguma had thought that perhaps his company on occasion would help alleviate Nanlo's restlessness. It had, but to an extent Neguma had not foreseen. In less than a quarter of an hour, Nanlo, my darling, Hugh Neils whispered now, we'll be gone from here, and you'll belong only to me. We'll leave this infernal barren satellite to spin itself dizzy out here in no place. We'll leave that Humpty Dumpty husband of yours and his hypocritical good nature to whistle for his wife and his ship. We won't care. 
we'll be together, always together from now on, and he'll never see us again. Nanlo leaned against his shoulder. The prospect that he had painted seemed very sweet to her. You're sure you can manage the ship alone? She asked. But of course I can help. A little anyway. You can teach me. Of course, Hugh Niels answered confidently and bent to kiss her again. I've been studying her for a week, asking questions, making friends with the crew. I can handle her one-handed. We'll take off and circle Jupiter first. They may think we landed on the other side in the outlaw crevice. Or they may figure that we went on to Saturn and we'll hide somewhere in the system there. But we won't do either, and they won't know where to look for us. Instead of turning back on the other side of Jupiter, we'll make a tangential angle out in space. We'll hold it for a month for safety's sake. We could hold for fifty years or a hundred if we needed to. There's fuel and provisions meant for the mines. Enough to last that long. At the end of the month, we'll swing back, cut into the path of the sun, and pick up Mars as she comes in from behind Sol. On Mars, we can sell the Vulcan. There's an outfit in the equator zone in the mountains west of the Great Canal that'll buy her, and no questions asked. I learned about them from a fraternity brother while I was in college. He'd run into some hard luck. They gave him a job, and he was making money hand over fist. They're asteroid miners. The work they do is illegal, but justified morally. What right have men with more money than they know what to do with to own everything in the solar system? How can a young fellow get a start anymore when corporations and rich old fogies own everything? Maybe I'll join up with this outfit. After we sold the ship, I'll see. How does that sound to you? Wonderful, Hugh. But I don't care about all that. All I want is for us to be together. Always. You and me and our love together for eternity. That's all I want. That's all I want too, darling Nanlo. Hugh Niels told her passionately and kissed her. Together forever. Just you and me. Nanlo sighed with luxuriant happiness and peered at his radomite wristwatch. The five minutes are up, she murmured. Can't we go now? Hugh Niels nodded. We've waited plenty long enough, he decided. The guard will be asleep by now. The crew were that way when I left them in the dormitory. I saw that they had plenty of spiked molkai at dinner. Pretended it was my birthday celebration. And the ship's all ready and waiting for the takeoff. All we have to do is lock the port and close the rising switch. The two on the bench by the fountain rose, and for a long minute were locked in an embrace. Then they turned toward the dark shadowed trees and disappeared beneath them in the direction of the nearby spaceport. Neguma silently turned back into the house. Sliss shuffled after him. The uranium merchant led the way back to the vitrite-covered garden and there, a little wearily, resumed his seat and picked up his mug again. Sliss climbed back into his tub of water sighed gratefully at the comfort it gave him, and then turned his pop eyes toward his host. He blinked once, inquiringly, and Neguma understood that the intelligent amphibian was asking if he intended to do nothing to stop the pair who were running away. Neguma sipped pensively at his drink. If she had only told me, he murmured, if she had only come to me and said she desired her freedom, if they had both come together and faced me, saying that though it meant giving up all they had, they wanted only each other, I would have been generous. I would have been indulgent. But they did not. They had not the courage. They were afraid of me. And they hated me. Neguma was silent for a moment. Both he and his guest stared toward the graceful shaft of the Vulcan, now fully silhouetted against the whole tremendous bulk of Jupiter, sitting like a titanic scarlet egg upon the horizon of Callisto. The Jupiter light flooded the vitrite garden, gave the plants there chosen with an eye to this strange, exotic glowing colors, flushed Neguma and Slish with a ruby radiance.
Towards that dark, waiting craft, the two they had watched were even now stealing, tense with the weight of their daring and their crime. In a moment they would reach her, enter her, actuate machinery that was miraculous in its complex simplicity, and then be gone on the wings it gave them into the concealing embrace of universal space. You see, my friend Sliss, Neguma said finally, Nunlo is beautiful, but there is nothing within. Her beauty deceived me. I thought that where such loveliness existed, there must be a soul to animate it. I was wrong. She is like an imitation gem, beautiful on the surface, paste within. Yet the mistake was mine, and I did not blame her. I indulged her, and still hoped that something real would bloom within her. He drained the Molkai in his mug, one great gulp and slumped back. The young man too, Hugh Neils. I thought that he would be a companion for her, but he too is weak. Yet they say they love each other. They swear, we heard them, that they only want each other and their love for all time. Sliss blinked, twice and Neguma nodded. Yes, he said. If they carry out their plans as we heard them, that feeling will soon go. The sale of the Vulcan, even his stolen property, would give them many credits. After that, luxury, self-indulgence, and their natures are too weak to withstand the ravages of such things so I have been troubled to know what to do. You see, my friend from Venus, though I would have let Nanlo go had she asked me, my own honor is at stake when she seeks to deal me an injury by slipping away in the night and stealing from me the Vulcan. She is doing evil and must be punished. The young man, too. Indulgent as I am, I cannot let him dishonor me thus without paying any penalty. Sliss's eye membranes shut, questioningly. Yet, the uranium merchant went on, I have a fondness for Nanlo. I will not prevent her from doing as she has chosen to do, for the intent would still be there. And knowing it as I do, all between us is over. I cannot aid her to fulfill her plans either, for that is to injure her and myself too. But there is another course. I have chosen that. He gestured with one plump hand toward the silhouetted ship. I believe they have entered the Vulcan, he announced. I saw light as the entrance port opened then. The amphibian's great, frog-head nodded agreement. So, Neguma continued, I have decided to exercise what indulgence I can in the face of the injury they would do me. They shall have their chance. He fell silent again. Sliss leaned forward in his tub. Both of them watched intently. A flare of greenish light had sprung up beneath the black pillar that was the Vulcan. For just an instant, the freighter stood there, green radiance expanding around her. Then she leaped into the sky. With her leap, she seemed to suck the radiance along. It became a great cone of glowing light that, arrow-like, raced away upward. For a long instant, the black length of the ship and the greenish fan of flame were outlined against the scarlet background of Jupiter. Then the freighter rocket, flinging herself upward at three gravities or better, passed the edge of the planet and vanished. Neguma sat very quiet for some moments, but at last he stirred again. Sliss's eyes turned toward him, immobile. Sometimes, love transforms the weak, the uranium merchant said slowly like fire giving temper to soft metal. 
Sometimes a mutual love will endure for all eternity, and the two who share it will gain from it a soul they did not have before. Nanlo and Hugh Niels have this chance. Both said they wanted only the other, and their love, for all eternity. To gain this, both were willing to cheat, to steal, to dishonor me and themselves. So Sliss, my understanding friend, they have paid the price. They shall have what they ask for. As the man, Hugh Neal, said, there is fuel and food in the holds of the Vulcan to run the motors and last the lifetime of a man, or a man and woman. Indeed, two lifetimes, or three, for I was aware of their plans. And secretly I placed aboard the craft many additional supplies, fuel and food and books and tools. And one additional thing the two who flee now in their space have not counted upon. Into the controls of the Vulcan, one of my engineers has placed a small device. After 200 hours, or when they are well beyond Jupiter, this device will swing the Vulcan straight toward Proxima Centauri, the nearest star. In that position, the controls will lock, and for 20 years, a generation, it will be impossible either to alter the course of the Vulcan or to shut her blast motors off. At the end of that time, the last tank of reserve fuel will be exhausted, and they will cease automatically. Then once more the Vulcan may be controlled by those aboard. They may switch the motors onto the tanks of fuel in the cargo holds and continue onwards. If they were celestial navigators, they might try to turn and seek Earth again. But they are not navigators. And the sun will be but a tiny spark in the limitless darkness, one with a million others not to be told apart. They will know that only Proxima Centauri in all space may the Vulcan hope to reach in their lifetime, or perhaps even that of their descendants, for a message to that effect they will find presently. So it may be that they will continue onward of their own choice. If they make no choice, momentum will carry them onward, perhaps forever. But in any case, Nanlo and Hugh Niels will have exactly what they asked for, each other for all eternity. They or their descendants can be the first humans to bridge the gap of nothingness that has thus far daunted the stoutest hearts. As they watched, the green dart of light dwindled and was gone, and quite invisible at last in the arms of outer darkness, the Vulcan sped its two passengers onward toward the stars. End of The Indulgence of Neguma by Robert Arthur Recording by Stephen Anderson, Jacksonville, Florida By Walt Sheldon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite Jimsy and the Monsters by Walt Sheldon Hollywood could handle just about anything, until Mildoom's machine brought in two real aliens. Mr. Maximilian Unce regarded the monsters with a critical eye. Script girls, cameramen, sometimes even stars quailed under Mr. Unce's critical eye. But not these monsters. The first had a globe-like head and several spidery legs. The second was willowy and long-clawed. The third was covered with hair. The prop department had outdone itself. Get Jimsy, said Mr. Unce, snapping his fingers. A young, earnest assistant producer with a crew cut turned and relayed the summons. Jimsy! Jimsy LaRoche! Down the line of cables and cameras it went. Jimsy! Jimsy! 
A few moments later, from behind the wall flat where he had been playing canasta with the electricians, emerged Jimsy La Roche, the eleven-year-old sensation. He took his time. He wore powder-blue slacks and a sports shirt, and his golden hair was carefully ringleted. He was frowning. He had been interrupted with a meld of a hundred and twenty. "'Okay, so what is it now?' he said, coming up to Mr. Unce. Mr. Unce turned and glared down at the youth. Jimsy returned the glare. There was a sort of cold war between Mr. Unce and Master Jimsy LaRoche, the sort you could almost hear hotting up. Mr. Unce pointed to the monsters. Look, Jimsy, look at them. What do you think? He watched the boy's expression carefully. Jimsy said, To use one of your own expressions, Max, <laughs> they wouldn't scare a mouse. And then Jimsy shrugged and walked away. Mr. Unce turned to his assistant. Harold, he said in an injured tone, you saw it, you heard it, you see what I've got to put up with. Sure, said Harold Potter sympathetically. He had mixed feelings towards Mr. Unce. He admired the producer's occasional flashes of genius. He deplored his more frequent flashes of stupidity. On the whole, however, he regarded himself as being on Mr. Unce's side in the war between Mr. Unce and the world and Hollywood. He knew Mr. Unce's main trouble. Some years ago, Maximilian Unce had been brought to Hollywood heralded as Vienna's greatest producer of musicals. So far he had been assigned to westerns, detectives, documentaries, a fantasy of the future, but no musicals. And now it was a psychological thriller. Jimsy played the killer as a boy, and there was to be a dream sequence, a nightmare full of monsters. Mr. Unce was determined it should be the most terrifying dream sequence ever filmed. Only, up to now, he wasn't doing so good. I would give, said Mr. Unce to Harold Potter, my right eye for some really horrible monsters. He gestured at the world in general. Think of it, Harold. We got atom bombs and B-29s, both vitamins and airplanes, and stuff to cure you of everything from broken legs to dropsy. A whole world of modern science. But nobody can make a fake monster. It looks anything but fake and wouldn't scare an eleven-year-old boy. It's a thought, agreed Harold Potter. He had a feeling for things scientific. He had taken a B.S. in college, but had drifted into photography and thence into movie production. He had a wife and a spaniel and a collection of pipes and a house in Santa Monica with a workshop basement. I gotta do some thinking. Mr. Unce said. I believe I will change my clothes and take a shower. Come along to the cottage, Harold. Okay, said Harold. He never liked to say yes for fear of being tagged a yes-man. Anyway, he enjoyed relaxing in the office cottage while Mr. Unce showered and changed, which Mr. Unce did some three or four times a day. When he got there, Mr. Unce disappeared into the dressing room and Harold picked up a magazine. There was a knock on the door. Harold got up and crossed the soft cream-colored carpet and opened the door and saw a goat-like person. Yes, said Harold. Mildoom, said the goat-like person. Dr. John Mildoom. Don't ask a lot of questions about how I got in. Had a hard enough time as it was. Fortunately, I have several relatives connected with the studio. That's how I heard of your problem, as a matter of fact. My problem? said Harold. Dr. Mildoom pushed right in. He was no more than five feet five, but had a normal-sized head. It was dome-like. Wisps of tarnished white hair curled about his ears and crown. He had an outthrust underjaw with a small white beard on its prow. He was dressed in moderately shabby tweeds. He moved across the room in an energetic hopping walk and took the place on the sofa Harold had vacated. Now then, Mr. Runtz, he said, the first thing we must do is come to terms. Just a minute, said Harold. I'm Mr. Unce's assistant, Harold Potter. Mr. Unce is in the shower. Was he expecting you? Dr. Mildoom blinked. No, not exactly, but he can't afford not to see me. I know all about it. All about what? asked Harold. The beasts, the doctor said. The witch? Beasts, Potter, snapped the goat-like man. The nightmare monsters. Get with it, lad. And what is a dream sequence without them? Ha! Huh. 
Uh, yes, said Harold, a little uncertainly. Mildoom's finger shot out. You fellows understand that I'm no dreamy-eyed, impractical scientist. Let's face it, it takes money to carry on experiments like mine. Good, old-fashioned money. I'll need at least ten thousand dollars." Harold raised his eyebrows. "'Just what, Dr. Mildoom, do you propose to give us for ten thousand dollars?' "'Beasts,' said Mildoom. "'Real monsters.' "'I beg your pardon,' said Harold. He began to work out strategies in his mind. Maybe he could casually walk over to the phone and pick it up quickly and call the studio police. Maybe he could get the jump on this madman before he pulled a knife. The thing to do was to humor him. Meanwhile, Dr. Mildoom said, I will not deal with underlings. I demand to see Mr. Unce himself. Well, said Harold, you understand that Mr. Unce is a busy man. It's my job to check propositions people have for him. Suppose you tell me about these beasts of yours. Mildoom shrugged. Doubt if you'll understand it any better than Unts will. But it's no more complicated than television when you boil it right down. You're familiar, I take it, with the basic principle of television? Oh, sure, said Harold, brightening. Keep things moving, have a master of ceremonies who keeps jumping in and out of the act, give something away to the audience, if possible, to make them feel ashamed not to tune in. No, 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 said Mildoom. I mean the technical principles. A photoelectric beam scans the subject, translates light and dark into electrical impulses which eventually alter a cathode ray played upon a fluorescent screen. Hence, the image. You grasp that roughly, I take it. Roughly, said Harold. Well, continued Mildoom, just as spots of light and dark are the building blocks of an image, so subatomic particles are the building blocks of matter. Once we recognize this, the teleportation theory becomes relatively simple. There are engineering difficulties, of course. We must go back to Faraday's Three Laws of Electrolysis and Chadwick's establishment in 1931 of the fact that radiation is merely the movement of particles of proton mass without proton charge. Neutrons, you see? Also, that atomic weights are close integers when hydrogen is 1.008. Thus, I use hydrogen as a basis. Simple, isn't it? Harold frowned. Wait a minute. What's this you're talking about? Teleportation? You mean a way of moving matter through space just as television moves an image through space? Well, not precisely, said Mildoom. It's more of a duplication of matter. My Mildoom beam, really another expression of the quanta or light energy absorbed by atoms, scans and analyzes matter. The wave variations are retranslated into form or formulae at a distant point, the receiving point. Harold lowered one eyebrow. And this really works? Of course, said Mildoom. Oh, it's still crude. It doesn't work all the time. It works only along vast distances. I, I won't announce it until I perfect it further. Meanwhile, I need more money to carry on, and when, through certain relatives, I heard of Mr. Unce's problem, well, it was simply too much to resist. You see, I've managed to teleport a couple of frightful monsters from somewhere out of space. I was wondering what on earth to do with them. Where? Where are they? asked Harold. In my backyard, said Dr. Mildoom. At that point, Mr. Maximilian Unce abruptly reappeared. He smelled of lotion, and he was now dressed in a relatively conservative gabardine of forest green with a lavender shirt and a black knitted tie. Hello, he said. He looked at Mildoom. So who's this? He says he has monsters for the dream sequence in his backyard, explained Harold. Real ones. Look, said Mr. Unce, kindly ask the gentleman to get lost, will you, Harold? No, wait, Harold said. He may have something. He explained some of it to me. It sounds almost possible. We can't lose much by taking a look. Only a few thousand dollars a minute, said Mr. Unce. Bah, money, said Dr. Mildoom. Which reminds me, these monsters of mine are going to cost you. Let's have that understood right now. Mr. Unce's eyebrows went up. This kind of talk he understood. He reached into the side pocket of the gabardine for his cigarette case. He kept a separate gold case in each suit. Yow! 
said Mr. Unce. His hand came out of the pocket with a small green snake in it. Drop it. Stand back, said Harold, being cool. Don't worry about it, said Dr. Mildoom in a calmer voice. He was blinking mildly at the snake. It's merely an ordinary species of garden snake, sometimes erroneously called garter snake. Curious it should be there. Harold looked at Dr. Mildoom sharply. This teleportation of yours wouldn't have anything to do with it by any chance. Of course not, snapped Mildoom. I know how it got there, said Mr. Unce, his jowls trembling. He had already dropped the snake. A certain child star whose initials are Jimsy LaRoche. Last week he gives me a hot foot, Monday a wet seat, soaked newspapers in my chair under one thin dry one, yesterday a big frog in my shower. I should take that brat over my knee and spank him to his face. Mm, uh, of course, said Dr. Mildoom, without much interest in the topic. Shall we go to inspect the monsters now? Mr. Unce thought it over, only long enough to keep himself within the time limits of a man of decision. Then he said, Okay, so we'll go now. They passed Jimsy LaRoche on the way out. He was drinking pineapple juice and sitting with his tutor, studying his lines. He smirked as Mr. Unce passed. Mr. Unce scowled back but didn't say anything. In Jovian silence he led the way to his car. It turned out to be a longer ride than they had expected. Dr. Mildoom lived in Twenty-Nine Palms, and as Mr. Unce explained it, this was too short for an airplane and too long for an automobile. Mr. Unce was not in his best humor when they stopped before Dr. Mildoom's stucco and tile-roof house. Mildoom directed them immediately to a walled-in patio in the rear of the place. A shed roof covered one side of the patio, and under it were racks of equipment. Harold recognized banks of relays, power amplifiers, oscillographs, and some other familiar devices. There were also some strange ones. Mildoom waved his long fingers at it all. My teleportation setup is entirely too bulky so far for practical use, as you can see. Oof, said Mr. Unce, eyeing it. During the drive, Dr. Mildoom and Harold had explained more to him about teleportation and the monsters, and he was more doubtful than ever about the whole thing. So let's see the monsters, he said now. Time is fleeting. Mildoom went in his hopping step across the patio to a huge tarpaulin that covered something square and bulky. He worried the tarpaulin away. Two steel cages stood there. Sacred carp! said Mr. Unce. Two somethings were in the steel cages. They were both iridescent, greenish-gray in color. They had globular bodies, no discernible heads, and eyes on stalks growing from their bodies. Three eyes apiece, if they were eyes. Anyway, they looked like eyes. Sweeping fibrillae came down to the ground and seemed to serve as feet. Great saw-toothed red gashes in the middle of each body might have been mouths. They're... they're real? They're alive? said Harold Potter hoarsely. That was the thing about them. They had the elusive quality of life about them, and of course they were thus infinitely more terrifying than the prop department's fake monsters. They're alive, all right, said Dr. Muldoon chattily. Took me quite a bit of experimenting to discover what to feed them. They like glass, broken glass. They're evidently a silicon rather than a carbon form of life. This I'll buy, said Mr. Unce, still staring. Of course, said Mildoom. I, I knew you would. They will cost you exactly ten thousand dollars per day, per twenty-four hour period. Profiteer! Burglar! said Mr. Unce, glaring at Mildoom. Mildoom shrugged. There was an abrupt, high-pitched squeak. Harold stared at the monsters. The smaller one was quivering. They do that when they're angry, Dr. Mildoom said. Some sort of skin vibration. This smaller one here seems to take the initiative in things. Must be a male. Unless there's a female dominance, as in birds of prey, whichever these things come from. I've uh, been unable to ascertain which is which, if any. Mr. Unce frowned suddenly. Look, just how dangerous are these things? 
don't know exactly, said Dr. Mildoom. A pigeon got too near the cage the other day. They seem to enjoy it. Although, as I say, their staple appears to be silicon forms. I carelessly set a Weston analyzer too near them the other day, and they had it for lunch. If they're too dangerous, began Mr. Unz. What if they are? said Mildoom. You make pictures with wild lions and tigers and alligators, don't you? Seems to me you can find a way. I don't recommend letting them out of the cage, however. Mr. Unce nodded and said, Well, maybe we can get Etienne Flaubert to do something with them. He's the animal trainer we call on. Anyway, Unce always figures something out. Only that's why I like musicals better. There isn't so much to figure out, and you can play Victor Herbert backwards and get new tunes out of him. So, anyway, we'll get a truck and get these monsters to the studio right away. It was arranged. It was arranged with utmost secrecy, too. There were other studios, after all, and in spite of their wealth of creative talent, it was easier to steal an idea than cook up a new one. Adam Baum's secrecy descended upon the Crusader Pictures lot, and most especially upon Soundstage 6, where the dream sequence for the psychological thriller Jolt was being filmed. Even Jimsy LaRoche, the star of the picture, was excluded from the big barn-like stage. Mr. Unce prepared to get his first stock shots of the beasts. There were gasps and much popping of eyebrows when Dr. Mildoom, who had come along as technical adviser, removed the tarpaulins from the cages. The cameramen, the grips, the electricians, the sound men, all stared unbelievingly. The script girl grabbed Mr. Unce's hand and dug her fingernails into it. The makeup stylist clutched the lapels of his mauve jacket and fainted. Nothing to be afraid of, Mr. Unce said to everybody. He was sort of convincing himself, too. Dr. Mildoom here knows all about the monsters. He's got everything under control. So tell everybody about them, doctor. Mildoom nodded, bobbing his short white beard. He thrust his hands into his tweed jacket, looked all around for a moment, then said, I don't know exactly where the monsters are from. I had my Q-beam pointed into space, and I was focusing it, intending to put it on Mars at the time of proper conjunction. All is very complicated. However, the beam must have worked prematurely. These monsters began to form in the hydrogen chamber. Several of the listeners looked at other listeners with unmistakable doubt. Unruffled, Dr. Mildoom went on. Now, we can make certain rough assumptions from the form and structure of these monsters. You will notice that, except for their appendages, they are globularly formed. Any engineer can tell you that the arch and hemisphere sustain the greatest weight for their mass. We may concede that they come from a planet of very strong gravity. Their skin, for instance, is tough and rigid compared with ours. They have difficulty staying rooted to Earth. Often a simple multipot movement will send them bouncing to the top of the cage. There's one other factor. The smaller of these creatures seems the more dominant, suggesting that on their home planet smaller beings are more agile and therefore better able to take care of themselves. There, you see, interrupted Mr. Unce, slipping into a pause. That's all there is to it. So now let us please get down to business. So they got down to business, and it was not easy business photographing these monsters. Keeping the cage wires out of focus required a critical distance for each lens, but whenever a camera came too near, the fibrilla would shoot forward, at the glass, no doubt, and scare the wits out of the cameraman. The shorter lenses got too much of the surrounding area into the picture. The crew tried and tried. One technician muttered darkly that the organization contract didn't cover this sort of thing. Mr. Unce pleaded and cajoled and heckled and moved about and tried to keep things going, somehow, anyhow. Eddie Tomato, the chief cameraman, finally came up to him and said, It's no use, Max. These cages simply don't allow us to do anything. Why don't we put them in the cages they use for jungle pictures? They're big and camouflaged, and the mesh size is right. So maybe we'll have to do that, said Mr. Unce. Dr. Mildoom dipped his head. I don't know. I'd like to see these other cages first. Look, said Mr. Unce, don't worry about it. If they hold lions, they will hold your 
whatever you call them. I'll get the animal trainer, Flaubert, to stand by. He practically talks to animals, except horses, which is his hard luck. The jungle cages were duly summoned, and so was Etienne Flaubert of the Golden West Animal Education Studios on Sunset Boulevard. While they waited, Mr. Unce stood aside with Harold Potter. He mopped his brow. He gestured at the whole group. This, he said, is the story of my life. It is? asked Harold. Mr. Unce nodded. Me? I am an expert on musicals. Musicals I can do with my left hand. But ever since I am in Hollywood, I do everything but a musical. And always something gets fouled up. Always there is trouble. You will not believe this, Harold, but I am an unhappy man. I believe it, said Harold. Mr. Unce looked at him sharply and said, You don't have to believe it so quickly. You could give me a chance to explain. Look said Harold, now being truly interested and forgetting some of the first principles of buttering up one's boss. Take the scientific attitude. Everything is relative. Yes, said Mr. Unce. In Hollywood, everything is relatives. Believe me. No, no, I, I wasn't referring to nepotism, said Harold. I was thinking that you and many others, of course, prefer musicals. But there are vast other groups who prefer westerns, detectives, comedies, or what have you. One man's meat is another man's poison. But nourishment stays the same principle. The artistic demands still hold, and a good picture is a good picture, whatever its field. Now, if you, as a producer, can shift to the other fellow's viewpoint, find out why the thing that terrifies you amuses him, or vice versa. Harold said Mr. Unce, not without suspicion. Are you an assistant producer or a philosopher? Sometimes to be the one, sighed Harold, you have to be the other. The big jungle cage arrived presently. While it was being set up, another assistant came to Mr. Unce and said, Jimsy LaRoche is outside yelling to get in, Mr. Unce. Mr. Unce whirled on the assistant and said, Tell that overpaid brat, who I personally didn't want in my picture in the first place, tell him in the second place, the President of the United States could not get in here this afternoon. No, wait a minute, that wouldn't mean anything to him. He makes more money than the President. Just tell him no. Yes, sir, said the assistant. He left. About then the animal trainer, Etienne Flaubert, was admitted. He walked right up to Mr. Unce. Flaubert was nearly seven feet tall. He had tremendous shoulders, and none of it was coat-padding. He had a chest one might have gone over Niagara Falls in. He had a huge golden beard. When he spoke, it sounded like the bass viola section of the Los Angeles Symphony tuning up. He said to Mr. Unce, Where are these monsters I hear about? I'd like to see the monster that isn't just a big kitty like all the rest. Big kitties, that's all they are. You gotta know how to handle them. Mr. Unce led Flaubert to the cage and said, There. Flaubert gasped. Then he steadied himself. The monsters had been maneuvered into the bigger cage by now. Dr. Mildoom had enticed them with broken electric light bulbs and slammed the drop doors behind them by a remote control rope. They had finished their meal of glass. They were curled in a corner of the cage now, tentacles wrapped about each other, squeaking contentedly. Flaubert recovered a bit. Kitties, just big kitties, he growled. Eddie Tomato called, Hey, Max, we'd like to get him in the center of the cage for a shot. He was gesturing from the camera boom seat, only moving around, you know, looking fierce. Can you do it, Flaubert? said Mr. Unce, turning to the big trainer. Just big kitties, said Flaubert. He had brought his own whip and blank cartridge pistol. His assistant stood by with a thirty thirty rifle. Dr. Mildoom opened the door quickly, and Flaubert slipped into the cage. "'Okay. Get set, everybody!' yelled Mr. Runce. People scurried. An attendant switched on the warning light and rocker arm that warned people outside of the stage not to barge in. "'Quiet!' yelled Mr. Runce. "'Quiet! Quiet!' yelled several assistants. The order went down the line, through channels. 
and there stood Etienne Flaubert, huge and more or less unafraid, in the middle of the cage. The monsters in the corner began slowly to uncoil their tentacles from about each other. Their eye-stalks rose and began to wave slowly. Their red saw-toothed mouths worked into pouts, gapes, and grins. The smaller of the two suddenly shuddered all over. Its angry chirping noise shrilled through the sound stage. Its tough skin vibrated, blurred. It sprang suddenly to its multipods and charged Flaubert. Flaubert screamed an unholy scream. He threw the chair and the whip and the gun at the monster and drove from the exit. Dr. Mildoom opened the cage door with his rope and Flaubert went through it, himself a blur. The monster in his wake slammed into the door and stayed there, trembling, still chirping its rage. "'Holy gee, what kiddies!' said Flaubert, pale and sweating. Mr. Unz groaned. "'I got some of it!' yelled Eddie Tomato from his camera. "'It was terrific, but we need more!' Then, simultaneously, there were several loud screams of alarm. Mr. Unz looked at the cage again. The smaller monster had found a crack and was moving the cage door and squeezing through. Harold! shouted Mr. Runts. Do something! Harold stepped forward. Back, everybody, he said in his best calm voice. Walk, do not run, to the nearest exit. The second monster was already vibrating across the cage, and the smaller one was holding the door open for it. Dr. Mildoom had tried to maneuver the control ropes to close the door again, but hadn't been able to work them. And now he had left his post. Harold pointed to the man with the rifle and said, Fire! The rifleman fired. Nothing. Nothing at all happened. He fired several times more. The monsters didn't even jerk when the bullets hit them. They're, they're impervious yet, cried Mr. Unz. After that, it was every man for himself. Moments later, Harold found himself outside of the soundstage and on the studio street, bunched with the others and staring at the thick, closed door. Nobody spoke. Everybody just thrummed silently with the knowledge that two alien monsters were in there, wreaking heaven knew what damage. And then, as they stared, the thick door began to open again. It isn't locked breathed Mr. Unz. Nobody remembered to lock it again. A tentacle peeked out of the crack of the door. Everybody scattered a second time. Harold never remembered the order in which things happened amidst the confusion that followed. It seemed he and Mr. Unz ran blindly, side by side, down the studio street for a while. It seemed all kinds of people were also running in all kinds of directions. Bells were ringing. Sirens blew. A blue studio police car took a corner on two wheels and barely missed them. Harold had a glimpse of uniformed men with drawn pistols. They ended up somehow at Mr. Unce's office cottage. They went inside, and Mr. Unce locked the door and slammed his back to it. He leaned there, panting. He said, Trouble, trouble, trouble! I should have stayed in Vienna. And in Vienna I should have stayed in bed. The door of the shower and dressing room opened, and Jimsy LaRoche came out. He had a number of snails in his outstretched hand, and he coolly kept them there, making no attempt to conceal his obvious purpose in the shower. He looked directly at Mr. Unz, with his dark, disconcerting eleven-year-old eyes, and said, Well, Max, what goof-off did you pull this time? You! roared Mr. Unz, whirling and shooting a finger at the child star, a focusing point for all his troubles at last. His jowls shook. You, Jimsy LaRoche, he said, are going to get your first old-fashioned spanking on the bottom, from me, personally. He advanced toward the boy, who backed away hastily. Jimsy began to look a little frightened. Now, wait a minute, Max, said Harold, stepping forward. We've got enough big monsters to think about without worrying about this little monster, too." Mr. Unce stared at Harold queerly. Suddenly he said, "'Why didn't I think of it before?' "'Think of what?' asked Harold. But Mr. Unce had already grabbed Jimsy LaRoche's hand and dragged him through the door. 
there were several reasons why Harold Potter did not immediately pursue. For one thing, he stood there for several moments, stupefied with surprise. Then, when he did recover, he plunged forward and promptly tripped on the cream-colored carpet and fell flat on his face. He tripped again, going over the step to the cottage door. He bumped into a studio policeman rounding the next corner. He snagged his coat on a fence picket going around the corner after that but he kept Mr. Unts and the dragged youngster in sight. Eventually he came to the door of Soundstage 6. Speaking from a police standpoint, all laymen had disappeared. A ring of studio police and firemen, along with some policemen and detectives from the outside, had been drawn around the monsters, and everybody and his brother was shooting off pistols and rifles at them, with no result, of course. Nor did anyone dare get too close. Harold caught up with Mr. Runce about the time a man he recognized as a reporter did. The reporter was stout, freckled, and bespectacled. Unce, barked the reporter, with all the power of the press in his voice. Do you realize this is a national danger? If those monsters can't be stopped by bullets, what will stop them? Where will it all end? Where did it come from? Look in tomorrow's paper, growled Mr. Unce, brushing the reporter aside. He kept Jimsy's arm in a firm grip. Jimsy was bawling at the top of his lungs now. Mr. Unce breasted the police cordon, broke through. Max, stop! shouted Harold. Max, have you gone mad? Max evidently had. He moved so swiftly that everyone was too surprised to stop him. He burst into the small human-walled area where the two bewildered monsters squatted, and he thrust little Jimsy LaRoche out before him right at the monsters. An extraordinary thing happened. The monsters suddenly began to quiver and squeak again, but this time it was clear to the ear somehow, not with rage, but with fear. Pure and terrible fear. They trained their eye-stalks on Jimsy LaRoche. They paled to a lighter shade of brown and green. Then slowly they began to back away. "'Hold your fire, men,' called a police captain probably just to get into the act. Dr. Mildoom appeared again from somewhere. So did Etienne Flaubert. So did Eddie Tomato and some of the other technicians. They gaped and stared. Slowly, inexorably, using Jimsy LaRoche as his threat, Mr. Unce backed the two monsters into the studio and gradually to the cage. Dr. Mildoom leaped forward to shut them in once more. And through it all, Jimsy LaRoche continued to bawl at the top of his lungs. Later, in Mr. Unce's office cottage, Harold read the newspaper accounts. He read every word while Mr. Unce was in the other room taking a shower. He had to admit that Max had even thrown a little credit his way. My assistant, Mr. Potter, Unce was quoted as saying, indirectly gave me the idea when he said that one man's meat was another man's poison. Dr. Mildoom had already explained that the monsters came from a high-gravity planet, that the smaller of the species evidently seemed the more capable and therefore the dominant one. Harold was now sure that the statement had been polished up a bit by the publicity department. The only logical assumption, then, the statement continued, was that small stature would dominate these life-forms rather than large stature, as in the environment we know. They were, in other words, terrified by tiny Jimsy LaRoche, whose latest picture, The Atomic Fissionist and the Waif, is now at your local theater, by the way, as an earth being might have been terrified by a giant. Mr. Unce came out of the shower at that point. He was radiant in a canary-colored rayon sharkskin. He was rubbing his hands. He was beaming. Harold, he said, they're putting me on a musical next. I got them twined around my little finger. Life is good. I think that screwy Dr. Mildoom was smart to send those things back out into space before they could get to him. Otherwise, we might have had to put them in pictures, and with contracts yet. Max, said Harold, staring at him quietly. Yes, Harold? Just answer me one thing truthfully. I swear I'll never repeat it or even blame you, but for my own curiosity, I've got to know. Why, certainly, Harold. What is it? Harold Potter swallowed hard. Did you, he asked, really figure out that Jimsy would scare the beasts? Or were you about to throw the little brat to them?
End of Jimsy and the Monsters by Walt Sheldon Jackpot by Dick Purcell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Rachel Craig of Colorado Springs, USA. www.ttb.org. Mr. Chipfellow's Jackpot by Dick Purcell. I'm getting old. Sam Chipfellow said, and old men die. His words were an indirect answer to a question from Carter Hagen, his attorney. The two men were standing in an open glade some distance from Sam Chipfellow's mansion at Chipfellow's Folly, this being the name Sam himself had attached to his huge estate. Sam lived there quite alone except for visits from relatives and those who claimed to be relatives. He needed no servants nor help of any kind because the mansion was completely automatic. Sam did not live alone from choice, but he was highly perceptive, and it made him uncomfortable to have relatives around with but one thought in their minds. When are you going to die and leave me some money? Of course, the relatives could hardly be blamed for entertaining this thought. It came as naturally as breathing, because Sam Chipfellow was one of those rare individuals, a scientist who had made money, all kinds of money, more money than almost anybody. And, after all, his relatives were no different than those of any other rich man. They felt they had rights. Sam was known as the genius of the space age, an apt title because there might not have been any space age without him. He had been extremely versatile during his long career, having been responsible for the so-called eternal metals, metal against which no temperature, corrosive, or combinations of corrosives would prevail. He was also the pioneer of telepower, the science of control over things mechanical through the electronic emanations of thought waves. Because of his investigations into this power, men were able to direct great ships by merely thinking them on their proper courses. These were only two of his contributions to progress, there being many others. And now Sam was facing the mystery neither he nor any other scientist had ever been able to solve. Mortality. There was a great deal of activity near the point at which the men stood. Drills and rock cutters had formed three sides of an enclosure in a ridge of solid rock, and now a giant crane was lowering thick slabs of metal to form the walls. Nearby, waiting to be placed, lay the slab which would obviously become the door to whatever Sam was building. Its surface was entirely smooth, but it bore great hinges, and some sort of a locking device was built in along one edge. Carter Hagen watched the activity and considered Sam's reply to his question. This is to be a mausoleum? Sam chuckled. Only in a sense. Not a place to house my dead bones, if that's what you mean. Carter Hagen, understanding this lonely old man as he did, knew further questions would be useless. Sam was like that. If he wanted you to know something, he told you. So Carter held his peace and they returned to the mansion, where Sam gave him a drink after they concluded the business he had come on. Sam also gave Carter something else, an envelope. Put that in your safe, Carter. You're comparatively young, and I'm taking it for granted you will survive me. And this is my will. All old men should leave wills, and I'm no exception to the rule. When I'm dead, open it and read what's inside. Carter Hagen regarded the envelope with speculation. Sam smiled. If you're wondering how much I left you, Carter, I'll say this. You might get it all. Hagen strove to appear nonchalant, but his eyes widened regardless. Sam enjoyed this. He said, Yes, you'll have as much chance as anyone else. You mean as much chance as any of your relatives? I mean what I said, as much as anyone. I've given them no more consideration than anyone else. Carter Hagen stared, puzzled. I'm afraid I don't understand you. I didn't expect you to, but that will come later. I'll tell you this much, though. No one will be barred. The winner will take it all, and the winner may be anyone on this planet. My one regret is that I won't be around to see who gets the jackpot. Carter Hagen dutifully pocketed the will and left. He returned on other business a week later. Sam Chipfellow's first question was, 
Well, what did you think of it? Think of what? My will. Carter Hagen straighted to an indignant five foot six. Mr. Chipfellow, I don't like having my integrity questioned. Your will is in a sealed envelope. You instructed me to read it after your death. If you think I'm the sort of man who would violate a trust, Sam put a drink into his attorney's hand. Here, take this, calm down. Carter Hagen gulped the drink and allowed his feathers to smooth down. As he set down his glass, Sam leaned back and said, Now, now that that's over, let's get on with it. Tell me, what did you think of my will? The attorney flushed. It was no use trying to fool Chipfellow. He was a master at that damned thought business. I, I did look at it. I couldn't resist the temptation. The envelope was so easily opened. Sam was regarding him keenly, but without anger. I know you're a crook, Hagen, but no more so than most people. So don't sit there cringing. This will is, well, amazing, and getting an advanced look at it didn't help me a bit. Unless, Hagen looked up hopefully, unless you're willing to give me a slight clue. I'll give you nothing. You take your chances along with the rest. Hagen sighed. As to the will itself, all I can say is that it's bound to cause a sensation. I think so, too, Sam said, his eyes turning a trifle sad. It's too bad a man has to die just at the most interesting point of his life. You'll live for years, Mr. Chipfellow. You're in fine condition. Cut it out. You're itching for me to shuffle off so you can get a crack at what I'm leaving behind. Why, Mr. Shut up and have another drink. Carter Hagen did not have long to wait as far as lifetimes go. Eighteen months later, Sam Chipfellow dropped dead while walking in his garden. The news was broadcast immediately, but the stir it caused was nothing to the worldwide reaction that came a few days later. This was after all the relatives, all those who thought they had a faint chance of proving themselves relatives, and representatives of the press, radio, and video, gathered in the late Sam Chipfellow's mansion to hear the reading of the will. Carter Hagen, seeking to control his excitement, stood before a microphone installed for the benefit of those who couldn't get in. He said, This is the last will and testament of Samuel Chipfellow, deceased. As his lawyer, it becomes my duty to... An angry murmur went up from those assembled, exclamations of impatience. Come on, get on with it. Quit making a speech and read the will. We can't wait all day. Quiet, please, and give me your closest attention. I will read slowly so all may hear. This is Mr. Chipfellow's last testament. I, Samuel B. Chipfellow, have made a great deal of money during my active years. The time now comes when I must decide what will become of it after my death. I have made my decision, but I remain in the peculiar position of still not knowing what will become of it. Frankly, I am of the opinion that no one will ever benefit from it, that it will remain in the place I have secreted it until the end of time. A murmur went up from the crowd. A treasure hunt, someone cried. I wonder if they'll distribute maps. Carter Hagen raised his hand. Please, let's have a little more order or the reading will not continue. The room quieted and Hagen's droning voice was again raised. This place consists of a vault I have erected upon my grounds. This vault, I assure you, is burglar-proof, weather-proof, cyclone-proof, tornado-proof, bomb-proof. Time will have no effect upon its walls. It could conceivably be thrown free in some great volcanic upheaval, but even then the contents would remain inaccessible. There is only one way the vault can be opened. Its lock is sensitized to respond to a thought. That's what I said, a thought. I have selected a single, definite, clear-cut thought to which the combination will respond. There is a stone bench in front of the vault door, and I decree that any person who wishes may sit down on this bench and direct his or her thought at the door. If it is the correct one, the door will open, and the person causing this to happen shall then be the possessor of all my worldly wealth which lies inside. Because of the number of persons who will no doubt wish to try their luck, I decree further that each shall be given thirty seconds in which to project their thought. A force of six men shall be hired to supervise the operation and handle the crowds in the neighborhood of the vault. A trust fund has been already set up to pay this group. The balance of my wealth lies awaiting the lucky thinker in the vault. 
all save this estate itself, an item of trifling value in comparison to the rest, which I bequeath to the state, with the stipulation that the other terms of the will are rigidly carried out. And so, good luck to everyone in the world. May one of you succeed in opening my vault, although I doubt it. Samuel B. Chipfellow P.S. The thought-throwing shall begin one week after the reading of the will. I add this as a precaution to keep everyone from rushing to the vault after this will is read. You might kill each other in the stampede. S.B.C. There was a rush regardless. Reporters knocked each other down getting to the battery of phones set up to carry the news around the world, and Sam Chipfellow's will pushed all else off the video screens and the front pages. During the following weeks, millions were made through the sale of Chipfellow's thought to the gullible. Great commercial activity began in the area surrounding the estate as arrangements were made to accommodate the hundreds of thousands who were heading in that direction. A line began forming immediately at the gate to Chipfellow's Folly, and a brisk market got under way in positions therein. The going figure of the first hundred positions was in the neighborhood of $10,000. A man three thousand thoughts away was offered a thousand dollars two days before the week was up, and on the last day the woman at the head of the line sold her position for eighteen thousand dollars. There were many learned round tables and discussions as to the nature of Chipfellow's thought. The majority leaned to the belief that it would be scientific in nature because Chipfellow was the world's greatest scientist. This appeared to give scientifically turned brains the edge and those fortunate in this respect spent long hours learning what they could of Sam Chipfellow's life, trying to divine his performance in the realm of thought. So intense was the interest created that scarcely anyone paid attention to the activities of Chipfellow's closer relatives. They sued to break the will, but met with defeat. The verdict was rendered speedily, after which the judge who made the ruling declared a recess and bought the eleven-thousandth position in line for five hundred dollars. On the morning of the appointed day, the gates were opened and the line moved toward the vault. The first man took his seat on the bench. A stopwatch clicked. A great silence settled over the watchers. This lasted for thirty seconds, after which the watch clicked again. The man got up from the bench eighteen thousand dollars poorer. The vault had not opened. Nor did it open the next day, the next, nor the next. A week passed, a month, six months and at the end of that time it was estimated that more than 25,000 people had tried their luck and failed. Each failure was greeted with a public sigh of relief, relief from both those who were waiting for a turn and those who were getting rich from the commercial enterprises abutting from Chipfellow's estate. There was a motel, a hotel, a few nightclubs, a lot of restaurants, a hastily constructed bus terminal, an airport, and several turned into parking lots at a dollar a head. The line was a permanent thing, and it was soon necessary to build a cement walk because the ever-present hopeful were standing in a ditch a foot deep. There also continued to be an active business in positions, a group of professional standers having sprung up, each with an assistant to bring food and coffee and keep track of the ever-fluctuating market in positions. And still, no one opened Mr. Chipfellow's vault. It was conceded that the big endowment funds had the inside track because they had the money to hire the best brains in the world, men who were almost as able scientifically as had been Chipfellow himself, but unfortunately hadn't made as much money. The moneyed interests also had access to the robot calculators that turned out far more plausible thoughts than there were positions in the line. A year passed. The vault remained locked. By that time the number of those who had tried and failed, and were naturally disgruntled, was large enough to be heard, so a rumor got about that the whole thing was a vast hoax, a mean joke perpetrated upon the helpless public by a lousy old crook who hadn't any money in the first place. Vituperative editorials were written by editors who had stood in line and thrown futile thoughts at the great door. These editorials were vigorously rebutted by editors and columnists who as yet had not had a chance to try for the jackpot. One senator, who had tried and missed, introduced a law making it illegal to sit on a stone bench and hurl a thought at a door. There were enough congressional failures to pass the law. It went to the Supreme Court, but was tossed out because they said you couldn't pass a law prohibiting a man from thinking. And still the vault remained closed. Until Mr. and Mrs. Wilson, farm people impoverished by reverses, 
spent their last ten dollars for two thoughts, and waited out the hours and the days in line. Their daughter Susan, aged nine, waited with them, passing the time by telling her doll fairy tales and wondering what the world looked like to a bird flying high up above the treetops. Susan was glad when her mother and father reached the bench, because they all could go home and see how her pet rabbit was doing. Mr. Wilson hurled his thought and moved on with drooping shoulders. Mrs. Wilson threw hers and was told to leave the bench. The guard looked at Susan. "'Your turn,' he said. "'But I haven't got any thought,' Susan said. "'I just want to go home.' This made no sense to the guard. The line was being held up. People were grumbling. The guard said, "'All right, but that was silly. You could have sold your position for good money. Run along with your mother and father.' Susan started away. Then she looked at the vault, which certainly resembled a mausoleum, and said, Wait, I have too got a little thought. And she popped onto the bench. The guard frowned and snapped his stopwatch. Susan screwed her eyes tight shut. She tried to see an angel with big white wings like she sometimes saw in her dreams, and she also tried to visualize a white-haired, jolly-faced little man as she considered Mr. Chipfellow to be. Her lips moved soundlessly as she said, Dear God and all the angels, please have pity on poor Mr. Chipfellow for dying, and please make him happy in heaven. Then Susan got off the bench to run after her mother and father, who had not waited. There was the sound of metal grinding upon metal, and the great door was swinging open. The End of Mr. Chipfellow's Jackpot by Dick Purcell As read by Rachel Craig, www.ttb.org. Old Crompton Secret by Harl Vincent. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Number. Old Crompton's Secret by Harl Vincent Two miles west of the village of Laketon there lived an aged recluse who was known only as Old Crompton. As far back as the villagers could remember, he had visited the town regularly twice a month, each time tottering his lonely way homeward with a load of provisions. He appeared to be well supplied with funds, but purchased sparingly, as became a miserly hermit. And so vicious was his tongue that few cared to converse with him, even the young hoodlums of the town hesitating to harass him with the banter usually accorded the other bizarre characters of the streets. The oldest inhabitants knew nothing of his past history, and they had long since lost their curiosity in the matter. He was a fixture, as was the old town hall with its surrounding park. His lonely cabin was shunned by all who chanced to pass along the old dirt road that led through the woods to nowhere and was rarely used. His only extravagance was in the matter of books, and the village bookstore profited considerably by his purchases. But, at the instigation of Cass Harmon, the bookseller, it was whispered about that old Crompton was a believer in the black art, that he had made a pact with the devil himself and was leagued with him and his imps. For the books he bought were strange ones, ancient volumes that Cass must needs order from New York or Chicago, and that cost as much as ten and even fifteen dollars a copy translations of the writings of the alchemists and astrologers and philosophers of the dark ages it was no wonder old crompton was looked at askance by the simple living and deeply religious natives of the small pennsylvania town but there came a day when the hermit was to have a neighbor and the town buzzed with excited speculation as to what would happen the property across the road from Old Crompton's hut belonged to Alton Forsyth, Laketon's wealthiest resident, hundreds of acres of scrubby woodland that he considered well-nigh worthless. But Tom Forsyth, the only son, had returned from college, and his ambitions were of a nature strange to his townspeople, and utterly incomprehensible to his father. Something vague about biology and chemical experiments and the like is what he spoke of, and, when his parents objected on the grounds of possible explosions and other weird accidents, he prevailed upon his father to have a secluded laboratory built for him in the woods. When the workmen started the small frame structure not a quarter of a mile from his own hut, old Crompton was furious. He raged and stormed, but to no avail. Tom Forsyth had his heart set on the project, and he was somewhat of a successful debater himself. The fire that flashed from his cold gray eyes matched that from the pale blue ones of the elderly anchorite, and the law was on his side. So the building was completed and Tom Forsyth moved in, bag and baggage. 
For more than a year the hermit studiously avoided his neighbor, though, truth to tell, this required very little effort. For Tom Forsythe became almost as much of a recluse as his predecessor, remaining indoors for days at a time and visiting the home of his people scarcely oftener than old Crompton visited the village. He too became the target of village gossip, and his name was ere long linked with that of the old man in similar animate version. But he cared not for the opinions of his townspeople, nor for the dark looks of suspicion that greeted him on his rare appearances in the public places. His chosen work engrossed him so deeply that all else counted for nothing. His parents remonstrated with him in vain. Tom laughed away their recriminations and fears, continuing with his labors more strenuously than ever. He never troubled his mind over the nearness of old Crompton's hut, the existence of which he hardly noticed or considered. It so happened one day that the old man's curiosity got the better of him, and Tom caught him prowling about on his property, peering wonderingly at the many rabbit hutches, chicken coops, dove coats, and the like, which cluttered the space to the rear of the laboratory. Seeing that he was discovered, the old man wrinkled his face into a toothless grin of conciliation. "'Just looking over your place, Forsyth,' he said. "'Sorry about the fuss I made when you built the house, but I'm an old man, you know, and changes are unwelcome. Now I have forgotten my objections and would like to be friends. Can we?' Tom peered searchingly into the flinty eyes that were set so deeply in the wrinkled, leathery countenance. He suspected an ulterior motive, but could not find it within him to turn the old fellow down. "'Why, I guess so, Crompton,' he hesitated. "'I have nothing against you, but I came here for seclusion, and I'll not have anyone bothering me in my work.' "'I'll not bother you, young man, but I'm fond of pets, and I see you have many of them here. Guinea pigs, chickens, pigeons, and rabbits. Would you mind if I make friends with some of them?' "'They're not pets,' answered Tom dryly. "'They are material for use in my experiments, but you may amuse yourself with them if you wish.' "'You mean that you cut them up? Kill them, perhaps?' Not that, but I sometimes change them in physical form, sometimes cause them to become of huge size, sometimes produce pygmy offspring of normal animals. Don't they suffer? Very seldom, though occasionally a subject dies, but the benefit that will accrue to mankind is well worth the slight inconvenience to the dumb creatures and the infrequent loss of their lives. Old Crompton regarded him dubiously. You are trying to find, he interrogated, the secret of life. Tom Forsythe's eyes took on the stare of fanaticism. Before I have finished, I shall know the nature of the vital force, how to produce it. I shall prolong human life indefinitely, create artificial life, and the solution is more closely approached with each passing day. The hermit blinked in pretended mystification, but he understood perfectly, and he bitterly envied the younger man's knowledge and ability that enabled him to delve into the mysteries of nature, which had always been so attractive to his own mind and somehow he acquired a sudden deep hatred of the coolly confident young man who spoke so positively of accomplishing the impossible. During the winter months that followed, the strange acquaintance progressed but little. Tom did not invite his neighbor to visit him, nor did old Crompton go out of his way to impose his presence on the younger man, though each spoke pleasantly enough to the other on the few occasions when they happened to meet. With the coming of spring they encountered one another more frequently, and Tom found considerable of interest in the quaint, borrowed philosophy of the gloomy old man. Old Crompton, of course, was desperately interested in the things that were hidden in Tom's laboratory, but he never requested permission to see them. He hid his real feelings extremely well, and was apparently content to spend as much time as possible with the feathered and furred subjects for experiment, being very careful not to incur Tom's displeasure by displaying too great interest in the laboratory itself. Then there came a day in early summer when an accident served to draw the two men closer together, and old Crompton's long-sought opportunity followed. He was starting for the village when, from down the road, there came a series of tremendous squawkings, then a bellow of dismay in the voice of his young neighbor. He turned quickly and was astonished at the sight of a monstrous rooster which had escaped and was headed straight for him, with head down and wings fluttering wildly. Tom followed close behind, but was unable to catch the darting monster. And monster it was, for this rooster stood no less than three feet in height and appeared more ferocious than a large turkey. Old Crompton had his shopping bag, a large one of burlap which he always carried to town, and he summoned enough courage to throw it over the head of the screeching, oversized fowl. So tangled did the panic-stricken bird become that it was a comparatively simple matter to effect his capture, and the old man rose to his feet triumphant with the bag securely closed over the struggling captive. Thanks, panted Tom when he drew alongside. I should never have caught him, and his appearance at large might have caused me a great deal of trouble. Now of all times. 
"'It's all right, Forsyth,' smirked the old man. "'Glad I was able to do it.' Secretly he gloated, for he knew this occurrence would be an open sesame to that laboratory of Tom's, and it proved to be just that. A few nights later he was awakened by a vigorous thumping at his door, something that had never before occurred during his nearly sixty years' occupancy of the tumble-down hut. The moon was high and he cautiously peeped from the window and saw that his late visitor was none other than young Forsyth. "'With you in a minute,' he shouted, hastily thrusting his rheumatic old limbs into his shabby trousers. "'Now to see the inside of that laboratory,' he chuckled to himself. It required but a moment to attire himself in the scanty raiment he wore during the warm months, but he could hear Tom muttering and impatiently pacing the flagstones before his door. "'What is it?' he asked as he drew the bolt and emerged into the brilliant light of the moon. "'Success!' breathed Tom excitedly. "'I have produced growing, living matter synthetically. More than this, I have learned the secret of the vital force, the spark of life. Immortality is within easy reach. Come and see for yourself.' They quickly traversed the short distance to the two-story building which comprised Tom's workshop and living quarters. The entire ground floor was taken up by the laboratory, and old Crompton stared aghast at the wealth of equipment it contained. Furnaces there were, and retorts that reminded him of those pictured in the woodcuts in some of his musty books. Then there were complicated machines with many levers and dials mounted on their faces, and with huge glass bulbs of peculiar shape with coils of wire connecting to knob-like protuberances of their transparent walls. In the exact center of the great single room there was what appeared to be a dissecting table, with a brilliant light overhead and with two of the odd glass bulbs at either end. It was to this table that Tom led the excited old man. "'This is my perfected apparatus,' said Tom proudly, "'and by its use I intend to create a new race of supermen, men and women who will always retain the vigor and strength of their youth, and who cannot die excepting by actual destruction of their bodies.' Under the influence of the rays, all bodily ailments vanish as if by magic, and organic defects are quickly corrected. Watch this now. He stepped to one of the many cages at the side of the room and returned with a wriggling cotton tail in his hands. Old Crompton watched anxiously as he picked a nickeled instrument from a tray of surgical appliances and requested his visitor to hold the protesting animal while he covered its head with a handkerchief. Ethyl chloride, explained Tom, noting with amusement the look of distaste on the old man's face. We'll just put him to sleep for a minute while I amputate a leg. The struggles of the rabbit quickly ceased when the spray soaked the handkerchief and the anesthetic took effect. With a shining scalpel and a surgical saw, Tom speedily removed one of the forelegs of the animal and then he placed the limp body in the center of the table, removing the handkerchief from its head as he did so. At the end of the table there was a panel with its glittering array of switches and electrical instruments, and old Crompton observed very closely the manipulations of the controls as Tom started the mechanism. With the ensuing hum of a motor generator from a corner of the room, the four bulbs adjacent to the table sprang into life, each glowing with a different color and each emitting a different vibratory note as it responded to the energy within. "'Keep an eye on Mr. Rabbit now,' admonished Tom. From the body of the small animal there emanated an intangible though hazily visible aura as the combined effects of the rays grew in intensity. Old Crompton bent over the table and peered amazedly at the stump of the foreleg from which blood no longer dripped. The stump was healing over. Yes, it seemed to elongate as one watched. A new limb was growing on to replace the old. Then the animal struggled once more, this time to regain consciousness. In a moment it was fully awake, and, with a frightened hop, was off the table and hobbling about in search of a hiding place. Tom Forsyth laughed. Never knew what happened, he exulted. And accepting for the temporary limp is not inconvenienced at all. Even that will be gone in a couple of hours, for the new limb will be completely grown by that time. But, but Tom, stammered the old man, this is wonderful. How do you accomplish it? Ha, ah, don't think I'll reveal my secret, but this much I will tell you. The life force generated by my apparatus stimulates a certain gland that's normally inactive in warm-blooded animals. This gland, when active, possesses the function of growing new members to the body to replace lost ones in much the same manner as this is done in the case of the lobster and certain other crustaceans. Of course, the process is extremely rapid when the gland is stimulated by the vital rays from my tubes, but this is only one of the many wonders of the process. Here is something far more remarkable. He took from a large glass jar the body of a guinea pig, a body that was rigid in death. This guinea pig, he explained, was suffocated twenty-four hours ago and is stone dead. Suffocated? Yes, but quite painlessly, I assure you. I merely removed the air from the jar with a vacuum pump and the little creature passed out of the picture very quickly. Now we'll revive it. 
Old Crompton stretched forth a skinny hand to touch the dead animal, but withdrew it hastily when he felt the clammy rigidity of the body. There was no doubt as to the lifelessness of this specimen. Tom placed the dead guinea pig on the spot where the rabbit had been subjected to the action of the rays. Again his visitor watched carefully as he manipulated the controls of the apparatus. With the glow of the tubes and the ensuing haze of eerie light that surrounded the little body, a marked change was apparent. The inanimate form relaxed suddenly, and it seemed that the muscles pulsated with an accession of energy. Then one leg was stretched forth spasmodically. There was a convulsive heave as the lungs drew in a first long breath, and, with that, an astonished and very much alive rodent scrambled to its feet, blinking wondering eyes in the dazzling light. "'See? See?' shouted Tom, grasping old Crompton by the arm in a vice-like grip. "'It is the secret of life and death. Aristocrats, plutocrats, and beggars will beat a path to my door. But, never fear, I shall choose my subjects well. The name of Thomas Forsyth will yet be emblazoned in the Hall of Fame. I shall be master of the world!' Old Crompton began to fear the glitter in the eyes of the gaunt young man who seemed suddenly to have become demented and his envy and hatred of his talented host blazed anew as Forsyth gloried in the success of his efforts. Then he was struck with an idea, and he affected his most ingratiating manner. "'It is a marvelous thing, Tom,' he said, "'and is entirely beyond my poor comprehension, but I can see that it is all you say and more. Tell me, can you restore the youth of an aged person by these means?' "'Positively!' Tom did not catch the eager note in the old man's voice. Rather, he took the question as an inquiry into the further marvels of his process. Here, he continued enthusiastically, I'll prove that to you also. My dog Spot is around the place somewhere, and he's a decrepit old hound, blind, lame, and toothless. You've probably seen him with me. He rushed to the stairs and whistled. There was an answering yelp from above and the pad of uncertain paws on the bare wooden steps. A dejected old beagle blundered into the room, dragging a crippled hind leg as he fawned upon his master, who stretched forth a hand to pat the unsteady head. "'Guess Spot is old enough for the test,' laughed Tom, "'and I've been meaning to restore him to his youthful vigor anyway. No time like the present.' He led his trembling pet to the table of the remarkable tubes and lifted him to its surface. The poor old beast lay trustingly where he was placed, quiet save for his husky, asthmatic breathing." "'Hold him, Crompton,' directed Tom as he pulled the starting lever of his apparatus. And old Crompton watched in fascinated anticipation as the ethereal luminosity bathed the dog's body in response to the action of the four rays. Somewhat vaguely it came to him that the baggy flesh of his own wrinkled hands took on a new firmness and color where they reposed on the animal's back. Young Forsyth grinned triumphantly as Spot's breathing became more regular and the rasp gradually left it. Then the dog whined in pleasure and wagged his tail with increasing vigor. Suddenly he raised his head, perked his ears in astonishment, and looked his master straight in the face with eyes that saw once more. The low throat cry rose to a full and joyous bark. He sprang to his feet from under the restraining hands and jumped to the floor in a lithe-muscled leap that carried him halfway across the room. He capered about with the abandon of a puppy, making extremely active use of four sound limbs. "'Why, why, Forsyth,' stammered the hermit, "'it's absolutely incredible. "'Tell me, tell me, what is this remarkable force?' "'His host laughed gleefully. "'You probably wouldn't understand it anyway, but I'll tell you. "'It is as simple as the nose on your face. "'The spark of life, the vital force, "'is merely an extremely complicated electrical manifestation "'which I have been able to duplicate artificially. "'This spark, or force, is all that distinguishes living from inanimate matter, and in living beings the force gradually decreases in power as the years pass, causing loss of health and strength. The chemical composition of bones and tissue alters, joints become stiff, muscles atrophied, and bones brittle. By recharging, as it were, with the vital force, the gland action is intensified, youth and strength is renewed. By repeating the process every ten or fifteen years, the same degree of vigor can be maintained indefinitely. Mankind will become immortal. That is why I say I am to be master of the world. For the moment, old Crompton forgot his jealous hatred in the enthusiasm with which he was imbued. Tom, Tom, he pleaded in his excitement. Use me as a subject. Renew my youth. My life has been a sad one and a lonely one, but I would that I might live it over. I should make of it a far different one, something worth while. See, I'm ready. He sat on the edge of the gleaming table and made as if to lie down on its gleaming surface, but his young host only stared at him in open amusement. What, you? he sneered unfeelingly. 
Why, you old fossil, I told you I would choose my subjects carefully. They are to be people of standing and wealth who can contribute to the fame and fortune of one Thomas Forsythe. But Tom, I have money, old Crompton begged. But when he saw the hard mirth in the younger man's eyes, his old animosity flamed anew, and he sprang from his position and shook a skinny forefinger in Tom's face. Don't do that to me, you old fool, shouted Tom. And get out of here. Think I'd waste current on an old cadger like you? I guess not. Now get out. Get out, I say. Then the old anchorite saw red. Something seemed to snap in his soured old brain. He found himself kicking and biting and punching at his host, who backed away from the furious onslaught in surprise. Then Tom tripped over a wire and fell to the floor with a force that rattled the windows, his ferocious little adversary on top. The younger man lay still where he had fallen, a trickle of blood showing at his temple. "'My God, I've killed him!' gasped the old man. With trembling fingers he opened Tom's shirt and listened for his heartbeats. Panic-stricken, he rubbed the young man's wrists, slapped his cheeks, and ran for water to dash in his face. But all efforts to revive him proved futile. And then, in awful fear, old Crompton dashed into the night, the dog Spot snapping at his heels as he ran. Hours later, the stooped figure of a shabby old man might have been seen stealthily re-entering the lonely workshop where the light still burned brightly. Tom Forsythe lay rigid in the position in which old Crompton had left him, and the dog growled menacingly. Averting his gaze and circling wide of the body, old Crompton made for the table of the marvelous rays. In minute detail he recalled every move made by Tom in starting and adjusting the apparatus to produce the incredible results he had witnessed. Not a moment was to be wasted now. Already he had hesitated too long, for soon would come the dawn and possible discovery of his crime. But the invention of his victim would save him from the long arm of the law, for, with youth restored, old Crompton would cease to exist, and a new life would open its doors to the starved soul of the hermit. Hermit, indeed. He would begin life anew, an active man with youthful vigor and ambition. Under an assumed name he would travel abroad, would enjoy life, and would later become a successful man of affairs. He had enough money, he told himself, and the police would never find old Crompton, the murderer of Tom Forsythe. He deposited his small traveling bag on the floor and fingered the controls of Tom's apparatus. He threw the starting switch confidently and grinned in satisfaction as the answering whine of the motor generator came to his ears. One by one he carefully made the adjustments in exactly the manner followed by the now silenced discoverer of the process. Everything operated precisely as it had during the preceding experiments. Odd that he should have anticipated some such necessity, but something had told him to observe Tom's movements carefully, and now he rejoiced in the fact that his intuition had led him aright. Painfully he climbed to the tabletop and stretched his aching body in the warm light of the four huge tubes. His exertions during the struggle with Tom were beginning to tell on him, but the soreness and stiffness of feeble muscles and stubborn joints would soon be but a memory. His pulses quickened at the thought, and he breathed deep in a sudden feeling of unaccustomed well-being. The dog growled continuously from his position at the head of his master, but did not move to interfere with the intruder, and old Crompton in the excitement of the momentous experience paid him not the slightest attention. His body tingled from head to foot with a not unpleasant sensation that conveyed the assurance of radical changes taking place under the influence of the vital rays. The tingling sensation increased in intensity until it seemed that every corpuscle in his veins danced to the tune of a vibration from those glowing tubes that bathed him in an ever-spreading radiance. Aches and pains vanished from his body, but he soon experienced a sharp stab of new pain in his lower jaw. With an experimental forefinger he rubbed the gum. He laughed aloud as the realization came to him that in those gums where there had been no teeth for more than twenty years there was now growing a complete new set, and the rapidity of the process amazed him beyond measure. The aching area spread quickly and was becoming really uncomfortable. But then, and he consoled himself with the thought, nothing is brought into being without a certain amount of pain. Besides, he was confident that his discomfort would soon be over. He examined his hand and found that the joints of two fingers long crippled with rheumatism now moved freely and painlessly. The misty brilliance surrounding his body was paling, and he saw that the flesh was taking on a faint green fluorescence instead. The rays had completed their work, and soon the transformation would be fully effected. He turned on his side and slipped to the floor with the agility of a youngster. The dog snarled anew, but kept steadfastly to his position. 
There was a small mirror over the washstand at the far end of the room, and old Crompton made haste to obtain the first view of his reflected image. His step was firm and springy, his bearing confident, and he found that his long stooped shoulders straightened naturally and easily. He felt that he had taken on at least two inches in stature, which was indeed the case. When he reached the mirror he peered anxiously into its dingy surface, and what he saw there so startled him that he stepped backward in amazement. This was not Larry Crompton, but an entirely new man. The straggly white hair had given way to soft, healthy waves of chestnut hue. Gone were the seams from the leathery countenance, and the eyes looked out clearly and steadily from under brows as thick and dark as they had been in his youth. The reflected features were those of an entire stranger. They were not even reminiscent of the Larry Crompton of fifty years ago, but were the features of a far more vigorous and prepossessing individual than he had ever seemed, even in the best years of his life. The jaw was firm, the once sunken cheeks so well filled out that his high cheekbones were no longer in evidence. It was the face of a man of not more than thirty-eight years of age, reflecting exceptional intelligence and strength of character. "'What a disguise!' he exclaimed in delight and his voice, echoing in the stillness that followed the switching off of the apparatus, was deep-throated and mellow, the voice of a new man. Now, serenely confident that discovery was impossible, he picked up his small but heavy bag and started for the door. Dawn was breaking, and he wished to put as many miles between himself and Tom's laboratory as could be covered in the next few hours. But at the door he hesitated. Then, despite the furious yapping of Spot, he returned to the table of the rays and, with deliberate thoroughness, smashed the costly tubes which had brought about his rehabilitation. With a pinch bar from a nearby tool rack, he wrecked the controls and generating mechanisms beyond recognition. Now he was absolutely secure. No meddling experts could possibly discover the secret of Tom's invention. All evidence would show that the young experimenter had met his death at the hands of old Crompton, the despised hermit of West Laketon. But none would dream that the handsome man of means who was henceforth to be known as George Voigt was that same despised hermit. He recovered his satchel and left the scene. With long, rapid strides he proceeded down the old dirt road toward the main highway where, instead of turning east into the village, he would turn west and walk to Kernsburg, the neighboring town. There, in not more than two hours' time, his new life would really begin. Had you, a visitor, departed from Laketon when old Crompton did and returned twelve years later, you would have noticed very little difference in the appearance of the village. The old town hall and the little park were the same, the dingy brick building among the trees being just a little dingier, and its wooden steps more worn and sagged. The main street showed evidence of recent repaving, and, in consequence of the resulting increase in through automobile traffic, there were two new gasoline filling stations in the heart of the town. Down the road about a half mile there was a new building, which, upon inquiring from one of the natives, would be proudly designated as the new high school building. Otherwise there were no changes to be observed. In his dilapidated chair in the untidy office he had occupied for nearly thirty years sat Asa Culkin, popularly known as Judge Culkin. Justice of the Peace, Sheriff, Attorney at Law, and three times Mayor of Laketon, he was still a controlling factor in local politics and government and many a knotty legal problem was settled in that gloomy little office. Many a dispute in the town council was dependent for arbitration upon the keen mind and understanding wit of the old judge. The four o'clock train had just puffed its labored way from the station when a stranger entered his office, a stranger of uncommonly prosperous air. The keen blue eyes of the old attorney appraised him instantly and classified him as a successful man of business, not yet forty years of age and with a weighty problem on his mind. "'What can I do for you, sir?' he asked, removing his feet from the battered desktop. "'You may be able to help me a great deal, Judge,' was the unexpected reply. "'I came to Laketon to give myself up.' "'Give yourself up?' Culkin rose to his feet in surprise and unconsciously straightened his shoulders in the effort to seem less dwarfed before the tall stranger. "'Why, what do you mean?' he inquired. "'I wish to give myself up for murder,' answered the amazing visitor, slowly and with decision. For a murder committed twelve years ago. I should like you to listen to my story first, though. It has been kept too long. But I still do not understand. There was puzzlement in the honest old face of the attorney. He shook his gray locks in uncertainty. Why should you come here? Why come to me? What possible interest can I have in the matter? Just this, Judge. You do not recognize me now, and you will probably consider my story incredible when you hear it. But, when I have given you all the evidence, you will know who I am and will be compelled to believe. The murder was committed in Laketon. That is why I came to you. A murder in Laketon? Twelve years ago? 
Again the aged attorney shook his head. But proceed. Yes, I killed Thomas Forsyth. The stranger looked for an expression of horror in the features of his listener, but there was none. Instead the benign countenance took on a look of deepening amazement, but the smile wrinkles had somehow vanished and the old face was grave in its surprised interest. You seem astonished, continued the stranger. Undoubtedly you were convinced that the murderer was Larry Crompton, old Crompton, the hermit. He disappeared the night of the crime and has never been heard from since, am I correct? Yes, he disappeared all right, but continue. Not by a lift of his eyebrow did Culkin betray his disbelief, but the stranger sensed that his story was somehow not as startling as it should have been. You will think me crazy, I presume, but I am old Crompton. It was my hand that felled the unfortunate young man in his laboratory out there in West Lakedon twelve years ago tonight. It was his marvelous invention that transformed the old hermit into the apparently young man you see before you, but I swear that I am none other than Larry Crompton, and that I killed young Forsyth. I am ready to pay the penalty. I can bear the flagellation of my own conscience no longer. The visitor's voice had risen to the point of hysteria, but his listener remained calm and unmoved. Now just let me get this straight, he said quietly. Do I understand that you claim to be old Crompton, rejuvenated in some mysterious manner, and that you killed Tom Forsyth on that night twelve years ago? Do I understand that you wish now to go to trial for that crime and to pay the penalty? Yes, yes, and the sooner the better. I can stand it no longer. I am the most miserable man in the world. Hmm, hmm, muttered the judge. This is strange. He spoke soothingly to his visitor. Do not upset yourself, I beg of you. I will take care of this thing for you, never fear. Just take a seat, Mr. Er... You may call me Voigt for the present, said the stranger in a more composed tone of voice. George Voigt, that is the name I have been using since the mer since that fatal night. Very well, Mr. Voigt, replied the counselor with an air of the greatest solicitude. Please have a seat now while I make a telephone call. And George Voigt slipped into a stiff-backed chair with a sigh of relief, for he knew the judge from the old days and he was now certain that his case would be disposed of very quickly. With the telephone receiver pressed to his ear, Culkin repeated a number. The stranger listened intently during the ensuing silence. Then there came a muffled, Hello? Sounding an impatient response to the call. Hello, Elton, spoke the attorney. This is Asa speaking. A stranger has just stepped into my office and he claims to be old Crompton. Remember the hermit across the road from your son's old laboratory? Well, this man, who bears no resemblance whatever to the old man he claims to be, and who seems to be less than half the age of Tom's old neighbor, says that he killed Tom on that night we remember so well. There were some surprised remarks from the other end of the wire, but Voigt was unable to catch them. He was in a cold perspiration at the thought of meeting his victim's father. "'Why, yes, Alton,' continued Culkin. "'I think there is something in this story, although I cannot believe it all. But I wish you would accompany us and visit the laboratory. Will you?' "'Lord, man, not that,' interrupted the judge's visitor. "'I can hardly bear to visit the scene of my crime. And in the company of Alton Forsyth? Please, not that!' "'Now you just let me take care of this, young man,' replied the judge, testily. Then, once more speaking into the mouthpiece of the telephone, "'All right, Alton, we'll pick you up at your office in five minutes.' He replaced the receiver on its hook and turned again to his visitor. "'Please be so kind as to do exactly as I request,' he said. "'I want to help you, but there is more to this thing than you know, and I want you to follow unquestioningly where I lead and ask no questions at all for the present. Things may turn out differently than you expect.' All right, Judge. The visitor resigned himself to whatever might transpire under the guidance of the man he had called upon to turn him over to the officers of the law. Seated in the judge's ancient motor car, they stopped at the office of Alton Forsyth a few minutes later and were joined by that red-faced and pompous old man. Few words were spoken during the short run to the well-remembered location of Tom's laboratory and the man who was known as George Voigt caught at his own throat with nervous fingers when they passed the tumble-down remains of the hut in which old Crompton had spent so many years. With a screeching of well-worn brakes the car stopped before the laboratory which was now almost hidden behind a mass of shrubs and flowers. "'Easy now, young man,' cautioned the judge, noting the look of fear which had clouded his new client's features. The three men advanced to the door through which old Crompton had fled on that night of horror twelve years before. The elder Forsyth spoke not a word as he turned the knob and stepped within. Voigt shrank from entering, but soon mastered his feelings and followed the other two. The sight that met his eyes caused him to cry aloud in awe. 
At the dissecting table, which seemed to be exactly as he had seen it last, but with replicas of the tubes he had destroyed once more in place, stood Tom Forsythe. Considerably older and with hair prematurely gray, he was still the young man old Crompton thought he had killed. Tom Forsythe was not dead after all, and all of his years of misery had gone for nothing. He advanced slowly to the side of the wondering young man, Alton Forsythe and Asa Culkin watching silently from just inside the door. Tom, Tom, spoke the stranger. You are alive? You were not dead when I left you on that terrible night when I smashed your precious tubes? Oh, it is too good to be true. I can scarcely believe my eyes. He stretched forth trembling fingers to touch the body of the young man, to assure himself that it was not all a dream. Why, said Tom Forsythe in astonishment, I do not know you, sir. Never saw you in my life. What do you mean by your talk of smashing my tubes, of leaving me for dead? Mean? The stranger's voice rose now. He was growing excited. Why, Tom, I am old Crompton. Remember the struggle here in this very room? You refused to rejuvenate an unhappy old man with your marvelous apparatus, a temporarily insane old man, Crompton. I was that old man, and I fought with you. You fell, striking your head. There was blood. You were unconscious. Yes, for many hours I was sure you were dead and that I had murdered you. But I had watched your manipulations of the apparatus, and I subjected myself to the action of the rays. My youth was miraculously restored. I became as you see me now. Detection was impossible, for I looked no more like old Crompton than you do. I smashed your machinery to avoid suspicion. Then I escaped. And, for twelve years, I have thought myself a murderer. I have suffered the tortures of the damned. Tom Forsythe advanced on this remarkable visitor with clenched fists. Staring him in the eyes with cold appraisal, his wrath was all too apparent. The dog Spot, young as ever, entered the room and, upon observing the stranger, set up an ominous growling and snarling. At least the dog recognized him. What are you trying to do, catechize me? Are you another of these alienists my father has been bringing around? The young inventor was furious. If you are, he continued, you can get out of here, now. I'll have no more of this meddling with my affairs. I'm as sane as any of you, and I refuse to submit to this continual persecution. The elder Forsythe grunted, and Culkin laid a restraining hand on his arm. Just a minute now, Tom, he said soothingly. This stranger is no alienist. He has a story to tell. Please permit him to finish. Somewhat mollified, Tom Forsythe shrugged his assent. Tom, continued the stranger, more calmly now, what I have said is the truth. I shall prove it to you. I'll tell you things no mortals on earth could know but we two. Remember the day I captured the big rooster for you, the monster you had created? Remember the night you awakened me and brought me here in the moonlight? Remember the rabbit whose leg you amputated and regrew? The poor guinea pig you had suffocated and whose life you restored? Spot here? Don't you remember rejuvenating him? I was here, and you refused to use your process on me, old man that I was. That is when I went mad and attacked you. Do you believe me, Tom? Then a strange thing happened. While Tom Forsythe gazed in growing belief, the stranger's shoulders sagged and he trembled as with the ague. The two older men who had kept in the background gasped their astonishment as his hair faded to a sickly gray, then became as white as the driven snow. Old Crompton was reverting to his previous state. Within five minutes, instead of the handsome young stranger, there stood before them a bent, withered old man, Old Crompton beyond a doubt. The effects of Tom's process were spent. Well, I'm damned, ejaculated Alton Forsythe. You've been right all along, Asa, and I am mighty glad I did not commit Tom as I intended. He has told us the truth all these years, and we were not wise enough to see it. We, exclaimed the judge, you, Alton Forsythe, I have always upheld him. You have done your son a grave injustice, and you owe him your apologies if ever a father owed his son anything. You are right, Asa. And, his aristocratic pride forgotten, Alton Forsythe rushed to the side of his son and embraced him. The judge turned to old Crompton pityingly. Rather a bad ending for you, Crompton, he said. Still, it is better by far than being branded as a murderer. Better? Better? croaked old Crompton. It is wonderful, judge. I've never been so happy in my life. The face of the old man beamed, though scalding tears coursed down the withered and seamed cheeks. The two Forsythes looked up from their demonstrations of peacemaking to listen to the amazing words of the old hermit. Yes, happy for the first time in my life, he continued. I am one hundred years of age, gentlemen, and I now look it and feel it. That is as it should be, and my experience has taught me a final lasting lesson. 
None of you know it, but, when I was but a very young man, I was bitterly disappointed in love. Ha ha, never think it to look at me now, would you? But I was, and it ruined my entire life. I had a little money, inherited, and I traveled about in the world for a few years, then settled in that old hut across the road where I buried myself for sixty years, becoming crabbed and sour and despicable. Young Tom here was the first bright spot, and, though I admired him, I hated him for his opportunities, hated him for that which he had that I had not. With the promise of his invention I thought I saw happiness, a new life for myself. I got what I wanted, though not in the way I had expected, and I want to tell you, gentlemen, that there is nothing in it. With developments of modern science you may be able to restore a man's youthful vigor of body, but you can't cure his mind with electricity. Though I had a youthful body, my brain was the brain of an old man. Memories were there which could not be suppressed. Even had I not had the fancied death of young Tom on my conscience, I should still have been miserable. I worked, God how I worked, to forget. But I could not forget. I was successful in business and made a lot of money. I am more independent, probably wealthier than you, Alton Forsyth. But that did not bring happiness. I longed to be myself once more, to have the aches and pains which had been taken from me. It is natural to age and to die. Immortality would make of us a people of restless misery. We would quarrel and bicker and long for death, which would not come to relieve us. Now it is over for me, and I am glad. 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 He paused for breath, looking beseechingly at Tom Forsyth. Tom, he said, I suppose you have nothing for me in your heart but hatred, and I don't blame you. But I wish... I wish you would try and forgive me. Can you? The years had brought increased understanding and tolerance to young Tom. He stared at old Crompton and the long-nursed anger over the destruction of his equipment melted into a strange mixture of pity and admiration for the courageous old fellow. "'Why, I guess I can, Crompton,' he replied. "'There was many a day when I struggled hopelessly to reconstruct my apparatus, cursing you with every bit of energy in my makeup. I could cheerfully have throttled you had you been within reach.' For twelve years I have labored incessantly to reproduce the results we obtained on the night of which you speak. People called me insane. Even my father wished to have me committed to an asylum. And until now I have been unsuccessful. Only today has it seemed for the first time that the experiments will again succeed. But my ideas have changed with regard to the uses of the process. I was a cocksure young pup in the old days, with foolish dreams of fame and influence. But I have seen the error of my ways. Your experience, too, convinces me that immortality may not be as desirable as I thought. But there are great possibilities in the way of relieving the sufferings of mankind, and in making this a better world in which to live. With your advice and help, I believe I can do great things. I now forgive you freely, and I ask you to remain here with me to assist in the work that is to come. What do you say to the idea? At the reverent thankfulness in the pale eyes of the broken old man who had so recently been a perfect specimen of vigorous health, Alton Forsyth blew his nose noisily. The little judge smiled benevolently and shook his head as if to say, I told you so. Tom and Old Crompton gripped hands mightily. End of Old Crompton's Secret Recording by Nick Number Old Rambling House by Frank Herbert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Old Rambling House by Frank Herbert. All the Grahams desired was a home they could call their own. But what did the home want? On his last night on earth, Ted Graham stepped out of a glass-walled telephone booth, ducked to avoid a swooping moth that battered itself in a frenzy against a bare globe above the booth. Ted Graham was a long-necked man with a head of pronounced egg shape, topped by prematurely balding sandy hair. Something about his lanky, intense appearance suggested his occupation, certified public accountant. He stopped behind his wife, who was studying a newspaper classified page, and frowned. They said to wait here. They'll come get us. Said the place is hard to find at night. Martha Graham looked up from the newspaper. She was a doll-faced woman, heavily pregnant, a kind of pink prettiness about her.
The yellow glow from the light above the booth subdued the red auburn cast of her ponytail hair. I just have to be in a house when the baby is born, she said. What they sound like? I don't know. There was a funny kind of interruption, like an argument in some foreign language. Did they sound foreign? In a way, he motioned along the night shrouded line of trailers toward one with two windows glowing amber. Let's wait inside. These bugs out here are fierce. Did you tell them which trailer is ours? Yes. They didn't sound at all anxious to look at it. That's odd, them wanting to trade their house for a trailer. There's nothing odd about it. They've probably just got itchy feet like we did. He appeared not to hear her. Funniest sounding language you ever heard, what that argument started, like a squirt of noise. Inside the trailer, Ted Graham sat down on the green couch that opened into a double bed for company. They could use a good tax accountant around here, he said. When I first saw the place, I got that definite feeling. The valley looks prosperous. It's a wonder nobody's opened an office here before. His wife took a straight chair by the counter, separating kitchen and living area, folded her hands across her heavy stomach. I'm just continental tired of wheels going around under me, she said. I want to sit and stare at the same view for the rest of my life. I don't know how a trailer ever seemed glamorous when it was the inheritance gave us itchy feet, he said. Tires gritted on gravel outside. Martha Graham straightened. Could that be them? Awful quick, if it is. He went to the door, opened it, stared down at the man who was just raising a hand to knock. Are you Mr. Graham? asked the man. Yes, he found himself staring at the caller. I'm Clint Rush. You called about the house. The man moved farther into the light. At first he'd appeared an old man, fine wrinkled lines in his face, a tired leather look to his skin. But as he moved his head in the light, the wrinkles seemed to dissolve, and with them the years lifted from him. Yes, we called, said Ted Graham. He stood aside. Do you want to look at the trailer now? Martha Graham crossed to stand beside her husband. We've kept it in awfully good shape, she said. We've never let anything get seriously wrong with it. She sounds too anxious, thought Ted Graham. I wish she'd let me do the talking for the two of us. We can come back and look at your trailer tomorrow in daylight, said Rush. My car's right out here, if you'd like to see our house. Ted Graham hesitated. He felt a nagging, worry tug at his mind, tried to fix his attention on what bothered him. Hadn't we better take our car? he asked. We could follow you. No need, said Rush. We're coming back into town tonight anyway. We can drop you off then. Ted Graham nodded. Be right with you as soon as I lock up. Inside the car, Rush mumbled introductions. His wife was a dark shadow in the front seat, her hair drawn back in a severe bun. Her features suggested gypsy blood. He called her Ramy. Odd name, thought Ted Graham, and he noticed that she, too, gave the strange first impression of age that melted in a shift of light. Mrs. Rush turned her gypsy features toward Martha Graham. You are going to have a baby. It came out as an odd, veiled statement. Abruptly, the car rolled forward. Martha Graham said, It's supposed to be born in about two months. We hope it's a boy. Mrs. Rush looked at her husband. I have changed my mind, she said. Rush spoke without taking his attention from the road. It is too... He broke off, spoke in a tumble of strange sounds. Ted Graham recognized it as the language he'd heard on the telephone. Mrs. Rush answered in the same tongue, anger showing in the intensity of her voice. Her husband replied, his voice calmer. Presently, Mrs. Rush fell moodily silent. Rush tipped his head toward the rear of the car. My wife has moments when she does not want to get rid of the old house. It has been with her for many years. Ted Graham said, Oh, then, are you Spanish? Rush hesitated. No, we are Basque. 
He turned the car down a well-lighted avenue that merged into a highway. They turned onto a side road. There followed more turns, left, right, right. Ted Graham lost track. They hit a jolting bump that made Martha gasp. I hope that wasn't too rough on you, said Rush. We're almost there. The car swung into a lane, its lights picking out the skeleton outlines of trees, peculiar trees, tall, gaunt, leafless. They added to Ted Graham's feeling of uneasiness. The lane dipped, ending at a low wall of a house, red brick with clerstory windows beneath overhanging eaves. The effect of the wall and a wide-beamed door they could see to the left was ultra-modern. Ted Graham helped his wife out of the car, followed the rushes to the door. "'I thought you told me it was an old house,' he said. "'It was designed by one of the first modernists,' said Rush. He fumbled with an odd curved key. The wide door swung open onto a hallway equally wide, carpeted by a deep pile rug. They could glimpse floor-to-ceiling view windows at the end of the hall, city lights beyond. Martha Graham gasped, entered the hall as though in a trance. Ted Graham followed, heard the door close behind them. "'It's so, so, so big!' exclaimed Martha Graham. "'You want to trade this for our trailer?' asked Ted Graham. "'It's too inconvenient for us,' said Rush. "'My work is over the mountains on the coast,' he shrugged. "'We cannot sell it.' Ted Graham looked at him sharply. "'Isn't there any money round here?' He had a sudden vision of a tax accountant with no customers. Plenty of money, but no real estate customers. They entered the living room. Sectional divans lined the walls. Subdued lighting glowed from the corners. Two paintings hung on the opposite walls, oblongs of odd lines and twists that made Ted Graham dizzy. Warning bells clamored in his mind. Martha Graham crossed to the windows, looked at the lights far away below. I had no idea we'd climbed that far, she said. It's like a fairy city. Mrs. Rush emitted a short, nervous laugh. Ted Graham glanced around the room, thought, if the rest of the house is like this, it's worth fifty or sixty thousand. He thought of the trailer, a good one, but not worth more than seven thousand. Uneasiness was like a neon sign flashing in his mind. This seems so... He shook his head. Would you like to see the rest of the house? asked Rush. Martha Graham turned from the window. Oh, yes! Ted Graham shrugged. No harm in looking, he thought. When they returned to the living room, Ted Graham had doubled his previous estimate on the house's value. His brain reeled with the summing of it a solarium with an entire ceiling covered by sun lamps, an automatic laundry where you drop soiled clothing down a chute, took it washed and ironed from the other end. Perhaps you and your wife would like to discuss it in private, said Rush. We will leave you for a moment. And they were gone before Ted Graham could protest. Martha Graham said, Ted, I honestly never in my life dreamed. Something's very wrong, honey. But, Ted, this house is worth at least a hundred thousand dollars, maybe more, and they want to trade this, he looked around him, for a seven thousand dollar trailer? Ted, they're foreigners, and if they're so foolish they don't know the value of this place, then why should... I don't like it, he said. Again, he looked around the room, recalled the fantastic equipment of the house, but maybe you're right. He stared out at the city lights. They had a lace-like quality, tall buildings linked by lines of flickering incandescence, something like a Roman candle shot skyward in the distance. Okay, he said. If they want to trade, let's go push the deal. Abruptly, the house shuddered. The city lights blinked out. A humming sound filled the air. Martha Graham clutched her husband's arm. Ted, wha what was that? I don't know, he turned. Mr. Rush! No answer, only the humming. The door at the end of the room opened. A strange man came through it. He wore a short toga-like garment of gray metallic cloth, 
belted at the waist by something that glittered and shimmered through every color of the spectrum. An aura of coldness and power emanated from him, a sense of untouchable hauteur. He glanced around the room, spoke in the same tongue the rushes had used. Ted Graham said, I don't understand you, mister. The man put a hand to his flickering belt. Both Ted and Martha Graham felt themselves rooted to the floor, a tingling sensation vibrating along every nerve. Again the strange language rolled from the man's tongue, but now the words were understood. Who are you? My name's Graham. This is my wife. What's going— How did you get here? The rushes. They wanted to trade us this house for our trailer. They brought us. Now, look, we— What is your talent? Your occupation? Tax accountant. Say, why all these— That was to be expected, said the man. Clever. Oh, excessively clever. His hand moved again to the belt. Now, be very quiet. This may confuse you momentarily. Colored lights filled both the Graham's minds. They staggered. You are qualified, said the man. You will serve. Where are we? demanded Martha Graham. The coordinates would not be intelligible to you, he said. I am of the Rojak. It is sufficient for you to know that you are under Rojak sovereignty. Ted Graham said, But you have, in a way, been kidnapped, and the Remis have fled to your planet, an unregistered planet. I'm afraid, Martha Graham said shakily. You have nothing to fear, said the man. You are no longer on the planet of your birth, nor even in the same galaxy. He glanced at Ted Graham's wrists. That device on your wrist, it tells your local time? Yes. That will help in the search. And your son? Can you describe its atomic cycle? Ted Graham groped in his mind for his science memories from school, from the Sunday supplements. I can recall that our galaxy is a spiral like most galaxies are spiral. Is this some kind of practical joke? asked Ted Graham. The man smiled a cold, superior smile. It is no joke. Now I will make you a proposition. Ted nodded warily. All right, let's have the stinger. The people who brought you here were tax collectors we, Rojak, recruited from a subject planet. They were conditioned to make it impossible for them to leave their job untended. Unfortunately, they were clever enough to realize that if they brought someone else in who could do their job, they were released from their mental bonds. Very clever. But you may have their job, said the man. Normally you would be put to work in the lower echelons, but we believe in meeting out justice wherever possible. The Ramis undoubtedly stumbled on your planet by accident and lured you into this position without— How do you know I can do your job? That moment of brilliance was an aptitude test. You passed. Well, do you accept? What about our baby? Martha Graham worriedly wanted to know. You will be allowed to keep it until it reaches the age of decision, about the time it will take the child to reach adult stature. Then what? insisted Martha Graham. The child will take its position in society, according to its ability. Will we ever see our child after that? Possibly, Ted Graham said. What's the joker in this? Again the cold, superior smile. You will receive conditioning similar to that which we gave the Remis, and we will want to examine your memories to aid us in search for your planet. It would be good to find a new inhabitable place. Why did they trap us like this? asked Martha Graham. It's lonely work, the man explained. Your house is actually a type of space conveyance that travels along your collection route, and there is much travel to the job. And then you will not have friends, nor time for much other than work. Our methods are necessarily severe at times. Travel? Martha Graham repeated in dismay. Almost constantly. Ted Graham felt his mind whirling, and behind him, 
he heard his wife sobbing. The Ramies sat in what had been the Graham's trailer. For a few moments I feared he would not succumb to the bait, she said. I knew you could never overcome the mental compulsion enough to leave them there without their first agreeing. Remy chuckled. Yes, and now I'm going to indulge in everything the Rojak never permitted. I'm going to write ballads and poems. And I'm going to paint, she said. Oh, the delicious freedom. Greed won this for us, he said. The long study of the Grahams paid off. They couldn't refuse to trade. I knew they'd agree. The looks in their eyes when they saw the house. They both had... She broke off, a look of horror coming into her eyes. One of them did not agree. They both did. You heard them. The baby. He stared at his wife. But, but it is not at the age of decision. In perhaps eighteen of this planet's years, it will be at the age of decision. What then? His shoulders sagged. He shuddered. I will not be able to fight it off. I will have to build a transmitter. Call the Rojak and confess. And they will collect another inhabitable place, she said, her voice flat and toneless. I've spoiled it, he said. I've spoiled it. End of Old Rambling House by Frank Herbert Prize for Edie by Jesse Franklin Bone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. A Prize for Edie by Jesse Franklin Bone. The committee had unquestionably made a mistake. There was no doubt that Edie had achieved the long sought cancer cure, but Awarding the Nobel Prize was, nonetheless, a mistake. The letter from America arrived too late. The committee had regarded acceptance as a foregone conclusion, for no one since Boris Pasternak had turned down a Nobel Prize. So when Professor Dr. Nels Christensen opened the letter, there was not the slightest fear on his part, or on that of his fellow committeemen, Dr. Eric Karlstrom and Dr. Sven Eklund, that the letter would be anything other than the usual routine acceptance. At last we learn the identity of this great research worker, Christensen murmured as he scanned the closely typed sheets. Karlstrom and Eklund waited impatiently, wondering at the peculiar expression that fixed itself on Christensen's face. Fine beads of sweat appeared on the professor's high, narrow forehead as he laid the letter down. Well, he said heavily, now we know. Know what? Eklund demanded. What does it say? Does she accept? She accepts, Christensen said in a peculiar, half-strangled tone as he passed the letter to Eklund. See for yourself. Eklund's reaction was different. His face was a mottled reddish-white as he finished the letter and handed it across the table to Karlstrom. Why, he demanded of no one in particular, did this have to happen to us? It was bound to happen sometime, Karlstrom said. It's just our misfortune that it happened to us. He chuckled as he passed the letter back to Christensen. At least this year the presentation should be an event worth remembering. It seems that we have a little problem, Christensen said, making what would probably be the understatement of the century. Possibly there would be greater understatements in the remaining ninety-nine years of the twenty-first century, but Karlstrom doubted it. We certainly have our necks out, he agreed. We can't do it, Eklund exploded. We simply can't award the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology to that, that, C. Edie. He sputtered into silence. We can hardly do anything else, Christensen said. There's no question as to the identity of the winner. Dr. Hansen's letter makes that unmistakably clear, and there's no question that the award is deserved. We still could award it to someone else, Eklund said. 
Not a chance. We've already said too much to the press. It's known all over the world that the medical award is going to the discoverer of the basic cause of cancer, to the founder of modern neoplastic therapy. Christensen grimaced. If we changed our decision now, there'd be all sorts of embarrassing questions from the press. I can see it now, Carlstrom said. The banquet, the table, the flowers, and Professor Dr. Nels Christensen in formal dress, with the order of St. Olaf gleaming across his white shirt-front, standing before that distinguished audience and announcing, The Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology is awarded to and then that deadly hush when the audience sees the winner. "'You needn't rub it in,' Christensen said unhappily. "'I can see it, too.' "'These Americans,' Eklund said bitterly. He wiped his damp forehead. The picture Karlstrom had drawn was accurate but hardly appealing. "'One simply can't trust them. Publishing a report as important as that as a laboratory release. They should have given proper credit.' They did, Carlstrom said. They did, precisely. But the world, including us, was too stupid to see it. We have only ourselves to blame. If it weren't for the fact that the work was inspired and effective, Christensen muttered, we might have a chance of salvaging the situation, but through its application ninety-five percent of cancers are now curable. It is obviously the outstanding contribution to medicine in the past five decades. But we must consider the source, Eklund protested. This award will make the prize for medicine a laughing stock. No doctor will ever accept another. If we go through with this, we might as well forget about the medical award from now on. This will be its swan song. It hits too close to home. Too many people have been saying similar things about our profession and its trend toward specialization and to have the Nobel Prize confirm them would alienate every doctor in the world. We simply can't do it. Yet who else has made a comparable discovery, or one that is even half as important? Christensen asked. That's a good question, Carlstrom said, and a good answer to it isn't going to be easy to find. For my part, I can only wish that Alfax Laboratories had displayed an interest in literature rather than medicine. Then our colleagues at the Academy could have had the painful decision. Their task would be easier than ours, Christensen said wearily. After all, the criteria of art are more flexible. Medicine, unfortunately, is based upon facts. That's the hell of it, Carlstrom said. There must be some way to solve this problem. Eklund said. After all, it was a perfectly natural mistake. We never suspected that Alfax was a physical rather than a biological sciences laboratory. Perhaps that might offer grounds. I don't think so, Carlstrom interrupted. The means in this case aren't as important as the results, and we can't deny that the cancer problem is virtually solved. Even though men have been saying for the past two generations that the answer was probably in the literature, and all that was needed was someone with the intelligence and the time to put the facts together, the fact remains that it was C. Edie who did the job. And it required quite a bit more than merely collecting facts. Intelligence and original thinking of a high order was involved, Christensen sighed. Someone, Eklund said bitterly. Some thing, you mean. C-E-D. C-E-D. Computer. Extrapolating. Discriminatory. Manufactured by Alfax Laboratories. Trenton, New Jersey, USA. C-E-D. Americans. Always naming things. A machine wins the Nobel Prize. It's fantastic. Christensen shook his head. It's not fantastic, unfortunately, and I see no way out. We can't even award the prize to the team of engineers who designed and built Edie. Dr. Hansen is right when he says the discovery was Edie's and not the engineers. It would be like giving the prize to Albert Einstein's parents because they created him. Is there any way we can keep the presentation secret? Eklund asked. I'm afraid not. The presentations are public. 
We've done too good a job publicizing the Nobel Prize. As a telecast item, it's almost the equal of the Motion Picture Academy Award. I can imagine the reaction when our candidate is revealed in all her metallic glory, a two-meter cube of steel filled with micro-miniaturized circuits, complete with flashing lights and cogwheels. Carlstrom chuckled. And where are you going to hang the metal? Christensen shivered. I wish you wouldn't give that metal nightmare a personality, he said. It unnerves me. Personally, I wish that Dr. Hansen, Alfax, Laboratories, and Edie were all at the bottom of the ocean, in some nice deep spot like the Marianas Trench. He shrugged. Of course, we won't have that sort of kick, so we'll have to make the best of it. It just goes to show that you can't trust Americans, Eklund said. I've always thought we should keep our awards on this side of the Atlantic, where people are sane and civilized, making a personality out of a computer. Ugh! I suppose it's their idea of a joke. I doubt it, Christensen said. They just like to name things, preferably with female names. It's a form of insecurity. the mother fixation. But that's not important. I'm afraid, gentlemen, that we shall have to make the award as we have planned. I can see no way out. After all, there's no reason why the machine cannot receive the prize. The conditions merely state that it is to be presented to the one, regardless of nationality, who makes the greatest contribution to medicine or physiology. I wonder how His Majesty will take it. Carlstrom said. The king, I'd forgotten that, Eklund gasped. I expect he'll have to take it, Christensen said. He might even appreciate the humor in the situation. Gustav Adolf is a good king, but there are limits, Eklund observed. There are other considerations, Christensen replied. After all, Edie is the reason the crown prince is still alive, and Gustav is fond of his son. After all these years? Christensen smiled. Swedish royalty was long lived. It was something of a standing joke that King Gustav would probably outlast the pyramids, providing the pyramids lived in Sweden. I'm sure His Majesty will cooperate. He has a strong sense of duty, and since the real problem is his, not ours, I doubt if he will shirk it. How do you figure that? Eklund asked. We merely select the candidates according to the rules, and according to the nature of their contribution. Edie is obviously the outstanding candidate in medicine for this year. It deserves the prize. We would be compromising with principle if we did not award it fairly. I suppose you're right, Eklund said gloomily. I can't think of any reasonable excuse to deny the award. Nor I. Carlstrom said, but what did you mean by that remark about this being the king's problem? You forget, Christensen said mildly, of all of us, the king has the most difficult part. As you know, the Nobel Prize is formally presented at a state banquet. Well, His Majesty is the host, Christensen said, and just how does one eat dinner with an electronic computer? End of A Prize for Edie by Jesse Franklin Bone. By Charles L. Fontenay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is made by Rochelle Hart. Service with a Smile by Charles L. Fontenay. Herbert was truly a gentleman robot. The lady's slightest wish was his command. Herbert bowed with a muted clink, indicating he probably needed oiling somewhere, and presented Alice with a perfect martini on a silver tray. He stood holding the tray with a white, permanent porcelain smile on his smooth metal face, as Alice sipped the drink and grimaced. It's a good martini, Herbert, said Alice. Thank you, but damn it, I wish you didn't have that everlasting smile. I am very sorry, Miss Alice, but I am unable to alter myself in any way, 
replied Herbert in a polite, hollow voice. He retired to a corner and stood impassively, still holding the tray. Herbert had found a silver deposit and made the tray. Herbert had found a sand and made the cocktail glass. Herbert had combined God knew what atmospheric and earth chemicals to make what tasted like gin and vermouth, and Herbert had frozen the ice to chill it. Sometimes, said Thera wistfully, it occurs to me it would be better to live in a mud hut with a real man than in a mansion with Herbert. The four women lolled comfortably in a living room of their spacious house, as luxurious as anything any of them would have known on a distant earth. The rugs were thick, the furniture was overstuffed, the paintings on the walls were aesthetic and inspiring, the shelves were filled with book tapes and music tapes. Herbert had done it all, except the book tapes and music tapes, which had been salvaged from the wrecked spaceship. "'Do you suppose we'll ever escape from this best of all possible manless worlds?' asked Betsy, fluffing her thick black hair with her fingers and inspecting herself in a Herbert-made mirror. "'I don't see how,' answered blonde Alice glumly. "'That atmospheric trap would wreck any other spaceship just as it wrecked ours, and the same magnetic layer prevents any radio message from getting out. No, I'm afraid we're a colony.' "'A colony perpetuates itself,' reminded sharp-faced Margaret acidly. "'We aren't a colony without men.' They were not the prettiest women in the universe, nor the youngest. The prettiest women and the youngest did not go to space. But they were young enough and healthy enough, or they could not have gone to space. It had been a year and a half now, an Earth year and a half, on a nice little planet revolving around a nice little yellow sun. Herbert, the robot, was obedient and versatile and had provided them with a house, food, clothing, anything they wished created out of the raw materials of earth and air and water. But the bones of all the men who had been a space with these four ladies lay moldering in the wreckage of their spaceship. And Herbert could not create a man. Herbert did not have to have direct orders, and he had tried once to create a man when he had overheard them wishing for one. They buried the corpse, perfect in every detail, except that it had never been alive. "'It's been a hot day,' said Alice, fanning her brow. "'I wish it would rain.' Silently, Herbert moved from his corner and went out the door. Margaret gestured after him with a bitter little laugh. "'It'll rain this afternoon,' she said. "'I don't know how Herbert does it. Maybe with silver iodide. But it'll rain.' Wouldn't it have been simpler to get him to air-condition the house, Alice? That's a good idea, said Alice thoughtfully. We should have had him do it before. Herbert had not quite completed the task of air-conditioning the house when the other spaceship crashed. They all rushed out to the smoking site, the four women and Herbert. It was a tiny scout ship, and its single occupant was alive. He was unconscious, but he was alive and he was a man. They carted him back to the house, tenderly, and put him to bed. They hovered over him like four hens over a single chick, waiting and watching for him to come out of his coma, while Herbert scurried about, creating and administering the necessary medicines. "'He'll live,' said Thera happily. Thera had been a space nurse. He'll be on his feet and walking around in a few days. "'A man,' murmured Betsy, with something like awe in her voice. I could almost believe Herbert brought him here in answer to our prayers. Now, girls, said Alice, we have to realize that a man brings problems as well as possibilities. There was a matter-of-fact hardness in her tone which almost masked the quiver behind it. There was a defiant note of competition there which had not been heard on this little planet before. What do you mean? asked Thera. I know what she means, said Margaret, and the new hardness came natural to her. She means, which one of us gets him? Betsy, the youngest, gasped, her mouth rounded to a startled O. Oh. Thera blinked, as though she were coming out of a daze. That's right, said Alice. Do we draw straws, or do we let him choose? Couldn't we wait, suggested Betsy timidly. Couldn't we wait until he gets well? Herbert came in with a new thermometer and poked it into the unconscious man's mouth. 
He stood by the bed, waiting patiently. "'No, I don't think we can,' said Alice. "'I think we ought to have it all worked out and agreed on, so there won't be any dispute about it.' "'I say draw straws,' said Margaret. Margaret's face was thin, and she had a skinny figure. Betsy, the youngest, opened her mouth, but Thera forestalled her. "'We are not on earth,' she said firmly in her soft, mellow voice. "'We don't have to follow terrestrial customs, and we shouldn't. There's only one solution that will keep everybody happy, all of us and the man.' "'And that is?' asked Margaret dryly. "'Polygamy, of course. He must belong to us all.' Betsy shuddered, but surprisingly she nodded. "'That's well and good,' agreed Margaret. "'but we have to agree that no one of us will be favored above the others. "'He has to understand that from the start.' "'That's fair,' said Alice, pursing her lips. "'Yes, that's fair. "'But I agree with Margaret. "'He must be divided equally among the four of us.' "'Chattering over the details, "'the hard competitiveness vanished from their tones. "'The four left the sick room to prepare for supper. "'After supper, they went back in. Herbert stood by the bed, the eternal smile of service on his metal face. As always, Herbert had not required a direct command to accede to their wishes. The man was divided into four quarters, one for each of them. It was a very neat surgical job. Service with a Smile by Charles L. Fontenay Recording by Rochelle Hart H.A.R.T. Books dot blogspot dot com The Stowaway by Alvin Heiner This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times The Stowaway by Alvin Heiner he stole a ride to the moon in search of glory, but found a far different destiny. His eyes were a little feverish, as they had been of late, and his voice held a continuous intensity, as though he were imparting a secret. I've got to get on that ship. I've got to, I tell you, and I'm going to make it. Different members of the group regarded him variously, some with amusement, some with contempt others with frank curiosity. You're plain nuts, Joe. What do you want to go to the moon for? Sure, why do you want to go? What they got on the moon, we ain't got right here. There was general laughter from the dozen or so who sat eating their lunch in the shade of Building B. They all thought that was a pretty good one. Good enough to repeat. Sure, what they got on the moon, we ain't got here. But Joe Spain wasn't in the mood for jokes. He burned with even greater conviction, and stood up as though to harangue the workers. "'You want to know why I got to go to the moon? Why I've got to get on that ship? Then I'll tell you. It's cause I'm a little guy. That's why. Joe Spain, working stiff, one of the great inarticulate masses.' More laughter. "'Where did you get those big words, Joey? Out of a book? Come on, talk English.' Joe Spain pointed to the huge, tube-like Building A, off across the desert. The building, you had to have two different passes and a written permit to enter. The mystery building, where even newspaper reporters were barred. It's only the big shots they let in there, ain't it? Only them that's got a drag, or went to college or something. Us little guys they tell go to blow. Ain't that right? Who the hell cares? Maybe it's a damn good place to stay away from. Maybe it'll explode or something. Who wants to die and collect his insurance? I got to get on that ship when it blasts off, because they can't push the masses around. We got a right to be represented, even if we got to sneak in. Me, I'll stay on the ground. And besides, there's the glory. You guys are too stupid to see that. But it's there. The glory of being on the first rocket ship to the moon. The name of Joe Spain, written down in the history books, and said over by people and school kids for thousands of years. Immortality, that's the word. Well, just forget about it, Joe, because you ain't going. Joe Spain's eyes burned brighter. 
Joe Spain coming down the ramp with the big shots when it's all over. News cameras snapping. People asking for interviews. But you ain't going, cuz. Joe shouted the man down. And another thing, us little people are entitled to a representative aboard that ship. We got a right to know what's going on. How come there's nothing about it in the papers? Only the big shots knowing about it and whispering among themselves. It's because they're trying to snag it all and freeze us out. You're crazy. It's for security reasons. It's all hush-hush, so it won't leak out like the atom bomb did. The big boys are being smart this time. And you ain't getting on, the interrupted man repeated doggedly, because there ain't a way in God's world to get on, with triple security all around the building. Just tell me a way to get in. Just tell me one. I'm going to get on that ship, Joe Spain said. Then he clammed up suddenly. Joe Spain wasn't stupid. He was a talker, but he knew when to stop sounding off. The men went back to work, shifting the big aluminum barrels from trucks into Building B, carrying the wooden crates and the paper-wrapped parcels up the ramps and to the side of the building, facing the big secret structure labeled A. They worked until five o'clock. Then they filed out and got into the waiting trucks and were hauled back to town, the boom town that had mushroomed up in the desert overnight and would die with the same swiftness when the project was completed. Joe went straight to his rooming house, washed up, put on his good clothes, and found a stool in a nearby restaurant. He ate a leisurely supper, glancing now and again at the clock. When the clock read eight, he went out into the neon-stained darkness and walked three blocks to the Black Cat, one of the three nightclubs the desert town boasted. He went to the bar and ordered a drink. He downed it slowly, carefully, after the manner of a man who wanted to stay sober. A half hour passed before a thin, nervous individual elbowed to the bar and stood beside him. Joe said, Hello, Nick. You been thinking it over? I need a drink. Then we'll go someplace and talk. But Nick got rid of five drinks while Joe protected his own glass from the barkeep. After a while, Joe said, I'm willing to up the price, Nick. Two thousand cash, all I got. Let's get out of here, Nick mumbled. They walked out of the town and into the desert, Nick stumbling now and again to be supported by the tense, sober Joe. Two thousand, Nick. You need the dough. Sure, need the dough, but it wouldn't work. Couldn't get you into one of them barrels. You wouldn't have to. All I ask is that you come along in the morning and seal me up in one. All you'll have to do is lock on the lid. How you know the barrels are going on the ship? Never mind about that. I just know. I paid to find out. Okay, suppose you do get on the ship in a barrel. Maybe it'll be stored in a hole somewhere. Maybe they wouldn't open it very soon. You'll die. I got a way to get out. One of them special torches, the little ones. Aluminum isn't very strong. I can cut it like butter. It'll be hot. You'd burn yourself. Let me worry about that, Joe said fiercely. You want the two grand or not? Nick wanted the two thousand, and he was against the wall for excuses. Then he had a happy thought. Barrels is airtight. You smother. Things Im impractical. Well, forget it. I won't smother. I'm taking my own oxygen, enough to last me clear to the moon if it has to. Come on, break down. Okay, for two grand. Got to have the dough now, though. His heart singing, Joe Spain counted out two thousand in cash. When he'd finished, he had exactly nine dollars left. He was a pauper, but the happiest pauper who ever bought with his whole fortune the thing he craved most. You won't double cross me now, will you? If you got any ideas like that. I'll do like we said. Nick Sparks never went back on his word. Never. But how you gonna stay hid when it's time to leave work? Leave that to me. It'll be easy. They don't check Building B too close. No double check because it's over a mile from Building A. Outside the safety perimeter. 
I'll stay in tomorrow night, and I'll put a little chalk mark on the barrel I'm in, right near the top rim. First thing you do when you come to work the next morning is seal it and line it up with the filled ones. Okay, but I gotta go home now. I gotta head. I gotta get some sleep. What's in the duffel bag? Clean overalls, towel. Joe pulled the zipper down halfway. The guard fingered the blue denim, but didn't dig deeper to find the towel. He checked Joe's badge number, made a note on his pad, and motioned to the next worker. Joe let tight breath slowly out of his lungs as he walked toward Building B. Getting past the guard was a load off his mind. He expected to get by, but it was one of the calculated risks that could have stopped him cold. Once inside the building, he put the bag into his locker and went to work. He labored briskly and carried more than his share of the load. But now and again, he stopped to look over at the outline of Building A, limbed hard against hot, blazing sky. And each time it was with a sense of heady exhilaration that he thought of his destiny, his hard-earned, dearly-bought destiny. To be among that select group, who would first set foot on the surface of the moon. He had no worries about not being allowed to do so. Once he showed himself, with the ship far out in space, they'd have to accept him. Not graciously, of course, but they'd have to admire his courage and tenacity. They could not, in all humanity, deny him a share of the victory. The day wore on, and as quitting time approached, he became more tense, more alert. Five minutes before the whistle, he faded back into the building and hurried to the lavatory. He went into the booth furthest from the entrance and locked the door. Now there was nothing to do but wait. Another of the calculated risks. The whistle blew. Almost immediately the sound of footsteps broke the silence, and the lavatory was filled with hurrying men. Their stay in the room was short, however, as Joe had known it would be. Men leaving for home do not dawdle on the premises. The lavatory was empty again, a period of silence while Joe raised his feet from the floor and braced them on the toilet seat. The entrance door opened, a guard making the departure checkup. Joe held his breath. If the guard came down the line and tried the door, he was finished. But Joe had banked upon human nature. The guard stopped. For a long moment there was no sound, and Joe knew the man was bending over to run his eyes down the line of toilets close to the floor. In this manner he could see the floor of every booth. The guard straightened, turned, walked out. The door closed. Silence. Joe's heart swelled with gratitude. He grinned, looking forward with joy to the long night ahead. He found a spot over behind the barrels where the night watchman would have to climb over a lot of equipment in order to find him. He made himself comfortable, practically certain the guard would not do this. He stretched out on the hard floor and recorded the passing of the hours by the number of times the watchman went through. And he was surprised at how fast the time passed. Finally, checking his count carefully, he left his hiding place and tiptoed to the line of lockers. He took the oxygen equipment from the duffel bag, after which he hid the bag and the clothing therein behind a wall flange in a far corner. Then he climbed into the barrel at the front end of the packing line. He checked the barrel with a small X and jockeyed the lid into place. Time passed. Nothing happened. He wondered if he'd missed on the time element. The men should certainly have come to work now. More than once he was tempted to push the barrel lid aside and check the situation. When footsteps sounded close by and the lid snapped firmly into place, he was glad he hadn't done so. Good old Nick. When he got back from the moon, he'd see to it that Nick got credit for his courageous act. Soon the barrel began to move. Joe felt it rise into the air and settle with a thump. Then the motor of a truck roared, and Joe knew where he was going, straight toward Building A and the moon rocket. There was more movement until finally the barrel was set down for what appeared to be the last time. Joe put the nose piece of the oxygen tube in place and visualized himself safe and snug in a storage room of the rocket. 
he closed his eyes and went peacefully to sleep he slept a long time to be awakened by a crushing a wrenching that all but drove his head down into his spine the pain brought him sharply alert he knew instantly what had happened blast off he braced himself against the sides of the barrel and gritted his teeth soon it was better then no pressure at all only the fierce happiness on his heart he set a course and won through he was on the way to the moon joe let plenty of time elapse he knew it was well over an hour later when he unlimbered the torch to cut an escape hole in the barrel this he knew would be tricky he could easily burn himself the heat would be intense but it wasn't too bad the aluminum cut quickly and in a matter of minutes he was standing beside the barrel as he'd suspected it was a storage hold the pitch darkness did not bother him he'd come prepared with a small pencil flash that threw an adequate beam he found the door opened it and went out into a long passageway now he'd covered the length and breadth of the ship he'd found a lot of rooms all in pitch darkness no observation ports and no living thing he stood frozen in one of the rooms while the beam of his flash picked out a code stenciled on a steel plate over some piece of machinery x59 306 my experimental explosion rocket moon the flash dropped from joe spain's fingers he stood in the pitch darkness while the jets vibrated through the rocket but there was no fear in him only the great pain of futility only his tears and his whispered words they'll never know nobody won't ever know end of stowaway by alvin heiner strange alliance by bryce walton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot o r g recording by stephen anderson Strange Alliance by Bryce Walton Dr. Spechag stopped running, breathing deeply and easily where he paused in the middle of the narrow winding road. He glanced at his watch. 9 a.m. He was vaguely perplexed because he did not react more emotionally to the blood staining his slender hands. It was fresh blood though just beginning to coagulate. It was dabbled over his brown serge suit, splotching the neatly starched white cuffs of his shirt. His wife always did them up so nicely with a peasant's love for trivial detail. He had always hated the silent ignorance of the peasants who surrounded the little college where he taught psychology. He supposed that he had begun to hate his wife too when he realized, after taking her from a local barnyard and marrying her, that she could never be anything but a slow-eyed, shuffling peasant. He walked on with brisk health down the narrow dirt road that led toward Glen Oaks. Elm trees lined the road. The morning air was damp and cool. Dew kept the yellow dust settled where spots of sunlight came through leaves and speckled it. Birds darted freshly through thickly hung branches. He had given perennial lectures on hysterical episodes. Now he realized that he was the victim of such an episode. He had lost a number of minutes from his own memory. He remembered the yellow staring eyes of the breakfast eggs gazing up at him from a sea of grease. He remembered his wife screaming. After that, only blankness. He stopped on a small bridge crossing Calvert's Creek, wiped the blood carefully from his hands with a green silk handkerchief. He dropped the stained silk into the clear water. Silver flashes darted up, nibbled the cloth as it floated down. He watched it for a moment, then went on along the shaded road. This was his chance to escape from Glen Oaks. That was what he had wanted to do ever since he had come here five years ago to teach. 
He had a good excuse now to get away from the shambling peasants whom he hated and who returned the attitude wholeheartedly, the typical provincial's hatred of culture and learning. Then he entered the damp, chilled shadows of the thick wood that separated his house from the college grounds. It was thick, dense, dark. One small corner of it seemed almost ordinary. The rest was superstition haunted, mysterious, and brooding. This forest had provided Dr. Spechag many hours of escape. He had attempted to introspect, but had never found satisfactory causes for his having found himself running through these woods at night in his bare feet, nor why he sometimes hated the sunlight. He tensed in the dank shadows. Someone else was in this forest with him. It did not disturb him. Whatever was here was not alien to him or the forest. His eyes probed the mist that slithered through the ancient mossy trees and hanging vines. He listened, looked, but found nothing. Birds chittered, but that was all. He sat down, his back against a spongy tree trunk, fondled dark green moss. As he sat there, he knew he was waiting for someone. He shrugged. Mysticism was not even interesting to him ordinarily. Still, though a behaviorist, he upheld certain instinctual motivation theories. And, though reluctantly, he granted Freud contributory significance. He could be an avatist, a victim of unconscious regression, or a prey of some insidious influence. Some phenomena a rather childish science had not yet become aware of, but it was of no importance. He was happier now than he had ever been. He felt free, young and new. Life seemed worth living. Abruptly, with a lithe, liquid ease, he was on his feet, body tense, alert. Her form was vaguely familiar as she ran toward him. She dodged from his sight, then reappeared as the winding path cut behind screens of foliage. She ran with long, smooth grace, and he had never seen a woman run like that. A plain skirt was drawn high to allow long, bronzed legs free movement. Her hair streamed out, a cloud of red gold. She kept looking backwards, and it was obvious someone was chasing her. He began sprinting easily toward her, and as the distance shortened, he recognized her. Edith Bailey, a second-year psychology major who had been attending his classes two semesters. Very intelligent, reclusive, not a local grown product. Her work had a grimness about it, as though psychology were a dire obsession, especially abnormal psychology. One of her theme papers had been an exhaustive, mature, but somehow overly determined treatise on self-induced hallucination and autosuggestion. He had not been too impressed because of an unjustified emphasis on supernatural myth and legend, including werewolves, vampires, and the like. She sprang to a stop like a cornered deer as she saw him suddenly blocking the path. She turned, then stopped and turned back slowly. Her eyes were wide, cheeks flushed, taut breasts rose and fell deeply, and her hands were poised for flight. But she wasn't looking at his face. Her gaze was on the blood spattering his clothes. He was breathing deeply too. His heart was swelling with exhilaration. His blood flowed hotly. Something of the whirling ecstasy he had known back in his student days as a track champion returned to him. The mad bursting of the wind against him, the wild passion of the dash. A burly figure came lurching after her down the path. A tramp, evidently, from his filthy, smoke-sodden clothes and thick stubble of beard. He recalled the trestle west of the forest where the bindle stiffs from the Pacific fruit line jungled up at nights or during long layovers. Sometimes they came into the forest. He was big, fat, and awkward. He was puffing and blowing, and he began to groan as Dr. Spechag's fist thudded into his flesh. The degenerate fell to his knees, his broken face blowing out bloody air. Finally, he rolled onto his side with a long, sighing moan, lay limply, very still. Dr. Spechag's lips were thin 
white as he kicked savagely. He heard a popping. The bum flopped sideways into a pile of dripping leaves. He stepped back, looked at Edith Bailey. Her full red lips were moist and gleaming. Her oddly opaque eyes glowed strangely at him. Her voice was low, yet somehow very intense. Wonderful laboratory demonstration, doctor. But I don't think many of your student embryos would appreciate it. Dr. Spechag nodded, smiled gently. <laughs> no. An unorthodox case. He lit a cigarette, and she took one. Their smoke mingled with the dissipating morning mist, and he kept on staring at her. A pronounced sweater girl with an intellect. This, this he could have loved. He wondered if it were too late. Dr. Spechag had never been in love. He wondered if he were now with this fundamental archetypal beauty. By the way, he was saying, what are you doing in this evil wood? Then she took his arm, very naturally, easily. They began walking slowly along the cool, dim path. Two principal reasons. One, I like it here. I come here often. Two, I knew you always walk along this path. Always late for your eight o'clock class. I've often watched you walking here. You walk beautifully. He did not comment. It seemed unnecessary now. The morning's almost gone, she observed. The sun will be out very warm in a little while. I hate the sun. On an impulse, he said, I'm going away. I've wanted to get out of this obscene nest of provincial stupidity from the day I first came here, and now I've decided to leave. What are you escaping from? He answered softly. I don't know. Something Freudian, no doubt. Something buried, something buried deep. Something too distasteful to recognize. She laughed. I knew you were human, and not the cynical pseudo-intellectual you pretended to be. <laughs> Disgusting, isn't it? What? Being human, I mean. I suppose so. I'm afraid we're getting an extraordinarily prejudiced view. I can't help being a snob here. I despise and loathe peasants. And I, she admitted. Which is merely to say, probably, that we loathe all humanity. Tell me about yourself, he said finally. Gladly, I like doing that, to one who will understand. I'm 19. My parents died in Hungary during the war. I, I came here to America to live with my uncle, but by the time I got here, he was dead too. And he left me no money, so there was no sense in being grateful for his death. I got a part-time job and finished high school in Chicago. I got a scholarship to this place. Her voice trailed off. She was staring at him. Hungary, he said and repeated it. Why, I came from Hungary. Her grip on his arm tightened. I, I knew, somehow, I remember Hungary. It's ancient horror. My father inherited an ancient castle. I remember long, cold corridors and sticky dungeons and cobwebbed rooms thick with dust. My real name is Berman. I changed it because I thought Bailey more American. Both from Hungary, mused Dr. Spechag. I remember very little of Hungary. I came here when I was three. All I remember are the ignorant peasants, their dumb, blind superstition, their hatred for... You're afraid of them, aren't you? She said. He started. The peasants, I... He shook his head. Perhaps. You're afraid, she said. 
Would you mind telling me, Doctor, how these fears of yours manifest themselves? He hesitated. They walked. Finally, he answered, I've never told anyone but you. There are hidden fears. And they reveal themselves consciously in the absurd fear of seeing my own reflection, of not seeing my shadow, of... She breathed sharply. She stopped walking, turned, stared at him. Not seeing your reflection. He nodded. Not seeing your shadow? Yes. A and the full moon? A fear of the full moon, too? But how did you know? And, and you're allergic to certain metals, too. For instance, silver? He could only nod. And, and you go out in the night sometimes and, and do things, but, but you don't remember what? He nodded again. Her eyes glowed brightly. I know. I know. I've known those same obsessions ever since I can remember. Dr. Spehag felt strangely uneasy then, a kind of dreadful loneliness. Superstition, he said. Our, our old world background where superstition is the rule. Old, very old superstition. Frightened by them when we were young. No. Now those old childhood fixations reveal themselves in crazy symptoms. He took off his coat, threw it into the brush. He rolled up his shirt sleeves. No blood visible now. He should be able to catch the little local passenger train out of Glen Oaks without any trouble. But why should there be any trouble? The blood. He thought too that he might have killed the tramp that popping sound. She seemed to sense his thoughts. She said quickly, I'm going with you, doctor. He said nothing. It seemed part of the inevitable pattern. They entered the town. Even for mid-morning, the place was strangely silent, damply hot and still. The town consisted of five blocks of Main Street from which cow paths wound off aimlessly into fields, woods, meadows, and hills. There were always a few shuffling, dull-eyed people lolling about in the dusty heat. Now there were no people at all. As they crossed over toward the shady side, two freshly clothed kids ran out of Davis's filling station stared at them like vacant-eyed lambs, then turned and spurted inside Ken Wagner's shoe hospital. Dr. Spechag turned his dark head. His companion apparently hadn't noticed anything ominous or peculiar, but to him, the whole scene was morose, fetid and brooding. They walked down the cracked concrete walk, past the big plate glass window of Murphy's General Store, which were kind of fetish in Glen Oaks, but Dr. Spehag wasn't concerned with the cultural significance of the windows. He was concerned with not looking into it. And oddly, he never did look at himself in the glass. Neither did he look across the street, though the glass did pull his gaze into it with an implacable, somewhat terrible insistence. And he stared. He stared at that portion of the glass which was supposed to reflect Edith Bailey's material self but didn't reflect anything, not even a shadow. They stopped. They turned slowly toward each other. He swallowed hard, trembled slightly, and then he knew deep and dismal horror. He studied that section of the glass where her image was supposed to be. It still wasn't. He turned and she was still standing there. Well? And then she said in a hoarse whisper, Your reflection, where is it? And all he could say was, And yours?
Little bits of chuckling laughter echoed in the incohate madness of his suddenly whirling brain, echoing years of lecture on cause and effect, logic. Little bits of chuckling laughter. He grabbed her arm. We can see our own reflections, but we can't see each other's. She shivered. Her face was terribly white. What? What's the answer? No. He didn't have it figured out. Let the witches figure it out. Let some old forbidden books do it. Bring the problem to some warlock, but not to him. He was only a doctor of philosophy and psychology. But maybe... Hallucinations. He muttered faintly. Negative hallucinations. Doctor. Did you ever hear the little joke about the two psychiatrists who met one morning and said, You're feeling excellent today. How am I feeling? He shrugged. We have insight into each other's abnormality, but are unaware of the same in ourselves. That's the whole basis for psychiatry, isn't it? In a way. But this is physical. Functional. When... Psychiatry presents situations where his voice trailed off. I have it figured this way. How eager she was. Somehow it didn't matter much now to him. We're conditioned to react to reality in certain accepted ways. For instance, that we're supposed to see our shadows. So we see them, but in our case, they were never really there to see. Our, our sanity or normalcy is maintained that way. But, but the constant auto-illusion must always lead to neuroticism and pathology, the hidden fears. But these fears must express themselves, so they do so in more socially acceptable ways. Her voice suddenly dropped as her odd eyes flickered across the street. But we see each other as we really are. She whispered tensely, though we could never have recognized the truth in ourselves. He turned slowly. His mouth twitched with a growing, terrible hatred. They were coming for him now. Four men with rifles were coming toward him. Stealthily creeping, they were as though it were some pristine scene with caves in the background. They were bent slightly, stalking. Hunters and hunted, and the law of the wild, and two of them stopping in the middle of the street. The other two branched, circled, came at him from either side, clumping down the walk. George recognized them all. The town marshal, Bill Conway, and Mike Lash, Harry Hutchinson, and Dwight Farrigan. Edith Bailey was backed up against the window. Her eyes were strangely dilated, but the faces of the four men exuded cold, animal hate and bloodlust. Edith Bailey's lips said faintly, What? What are we going to do? He felt so calm. He felt his lips writhe back in a snarl. The wind tingled on his teeth. I know now, he said. I know about the minutes I lost. I know why they're after me. You'd better get away. But, but why the... The guns. I murdered my wife. She served me greasy eggs. God, she was an animal. Just a dumb beast. Conway called. His rifle crooked in easy, promising grace. All right, Doc. Come along without any trouble. Though I'd just assume you made a break. I'd like to shoot you dead, Doctor. And what have I done exactly? Said Dr. Spechag. He's hog wild, yelled Mike Lash. Cutting her up all that way? Let's string him up. Conway yelled something about a fair trial, though not with much enthusiasm. Edith screamed as they charged toward them, a wild, inhuman cry. Dr. Spechog's eyes flashed up the narrow street. Let's go, he said to Edith Bailey. They'll see running they've never seen before. They can't touch us. They ran. They heard the sharp crack of rifles. They saw the dust spurting up. Dr. Spechag heard himself howling as he became aware of peculiar stings in his body. 
queer, painless, deeply penetrating sensations that made themselves felt all over his body, as though he were awakening from a long paralysis. Then the mad yelling faded rapidly behind them. They were running, streaking out of the town with inhuman speed. They struck out in long, easy strides across the meadow toward the dense woods that brooded beyond the college. Her voice gasped exultingly. They couldn't hurt us! They couldn't! They tried! He nodded, straining eagerly toward he knew not what, nosing into the fresh wind. How swiftly and gracefully they could run. Soon they lost themselves in the thick, dark forest. Shadows hid them. Days later, the moon was full. It edged over the low hill flanking Glen Oaks on the east. June bugs buzzed ponderously like armor-plated dragons toward the lights glowing faintly from the town. Frogs croaked from the swampy meadows in the creek. They came up slowly to stand silhouetted against the glowing moon, nosing hungrily into the steady aromatic breeze blowing from the Conway farm below. They glided effortlessly down, then across the sharp-bladed marsh grass, leaping high with each bound. As they came disdainfully close to this silent farmhouse, a column of pale light from a coal oil lamp came through the living room window and haloed a neglected flower bed. Sorrow and fear clung to the house. The shivering shadow of a gaunt woman was etched against the half-drawn shade. The two standing outside the window called. The woman's shadow trembled. Then a long, rigid finger of steel projected itself beneath the partially raised window. The rifle cracked almost against the faces of the two. He screamed hideously as his companion dropped without a sound, twitching, twitching. He screamed again and began dragging himself away toward the sheltering forest. Intently and desperately, the rifle cracked again. He gave up then. He sprawled out flatly on the cool, damp, moon-bathed path. His hot tongue lapped feverishly at the wet grass. He felt the persistent impact of the rifle's breath against him, and now there was a wave of pain. The full moon was fading into black mental clouds as he feebly attempted to lift his bleeding head. He thought with agonized irony. Provincial fools. Stupid, superstitious idiots. <laughs> and that damned Mrs. Conway, the most stupid of all. Only she would have thought to load her dead husband's rifle with silver bullets. Damned peasants. Total darkness blotted out futile reverie. End of Strange Alliance by Bryce Walton Recording by Stephen Anderson Jacksonville, Florida Sweet Mental by Randall Garrett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie Carter Sweet Mentel by Randall Garrett Overture Adagio Misterioso The neurosurgeon peeled the thin surgical gloves from his hands as the nurse blotted the perspiration from his forehead for the last time after the long, grueling hours. They're waiting outside for you, doctor she said quietly. The neurosurgeon nodded wordlessly. Behind him, three assistants were still finishing up the operation, attending to the little finishing touches that did not require the brilliant hand of the specialist, such things as suturing up a scalp and applying bandages. The nurse took the sterile mask, no longer sterile now, while the doctor washed and dried his hands. "'Where are they?' he asked finally. "'Out in the hall, I suppose.' She nodded. You'll probably have to push them out of the way to get out of surgery. Her prediction was almost perfect. 
the group of men in conservative business suits, wearing conservative ties, and holding conservative soft felt hats in their hands, were standing just outside the door. Dr. Mallon glanced at the five of them, letting his eyes stop on the face of the tallest. "'He may live,' the doctor said briefly. "'You don't sound very optimistic, Dr. Mallon,' said the FBI man. Mallon shook his head. "'Frankly, I'm not. He was shot laterally just above the right temple with what looks to me like a three fifty seven Magnum pistol slug. It's in there.' He gestured back toward the room he had just left. "'You can have it if you want.' It passed completely through the brain, lodging on the other side of the head, just inside the skull. What kept him alive I'll never know, but I can guarantee that he might as well be dead. It was a rather nasty way to lobotomize a man, but it was effective, I can assure you. The Federal agent frowned puzzledly. Lobotomized? Like those operations they do on psychotics? Similar, said Mallon. But no psychotic was ever butchered up like this and what I had to do to him to save his life didn't help anything. The men looked at each other, then the big one said, I'm sure you did the best you could, Dr. Mallon. The neurosurgeon rubbed the back of his hand across his forehead and looked steadily into the eyes of the big man. You wanted him alive, he said slowly, and I have a duty to save life. But frankly, I think we'll all eventually wish we had the common human decency to let Paul Wendell die. Excuse me, gentlemen, I don't feel well. He turned abruptly and strode off down the hall. One of the men in the conservative suits said, Louis Pasteur lived through most of his life with only half a brain, and he never even knew it, Frank. Maybe... Yeah, maybe, said the big man. But I don't know whether to hope he does or hope he doesn't. He used his right thumbnail to pick a bit of microscopic dust from beneath his left index finger, studying the operation without actually seeing it. Meanwhile, we've got to decide what to do about the rest of those screwballs. Wendell was the only sane one, and therefore the most dangerous. But the rest of them aren't what you'd call safe, either. The others nodded in a chorus of silent agreement. Nocturne. Temple de Valse. Now what's the matter with me? Thought Paul Wendell. He could feel nothing. Absolutely nothing. No taste, no sight, no hearing, no anything. Am I breathing? He couldn't feel any breathing, nor, f for that matter, could he feel heat, nor cold, nor pain. Am I dead? No, at least I don't feel dead. Who am I? What am I? No answer. Cogito ergo sum. What did that mean? There was something quite definitely wrong, but he couldn't quite tell what it was. Ideas seemed to come from nowhere. Fragments of concepts that seem to have no reference. What did that mean? What is a referent? A concept. He felt he knew intuitively what they meant, but what use they were he didn't know. There was something wrong, and he had to find out what it was. And he had to find out through the only method of investigation left open to him. So he thought about it. Sonata, Allegro con brio. The President of the United States finished reading the sheaf of papers before him, laid them neatly to one side, and looked up at the big man seated across the desk from him. "'Is this everything, Frank?' he asked. "'That's everything, Mr. President, everything we know. We've got eight men locked up in St. Elizabeth, all of them absolutely psychotic, and one human vegetable named Paul Wendell. We can't get anything out of them.' The President leaned back in his chair. "'I really can't quite understand it. Extrasensory perception, why should it drive men insane? Wendell's papers don't say enough. He claims it can be mathematically worked out that he did work it out, but we don't have any proof of that. The man named Frank scowled. Wasn't that demonstration of his proof enough? A small, graying, intelligent-faced man, who had been sitting silently listening to the conversation, spoke at last. Mr. President, I'm afraid I still don't completely understand the problem. If we could go over it and get it straightened out... He left the sentence hanging expectantly. Certainly. This Paul Wendell is a... Well, he called himself a psionic mathematician. Actually, he had quite a respectable reputation in the mathematical field. He did very important work in cybernetic theory, but he dropped it several years ago, said that the human mind couldn't be worked at from a mechanistic angle. 
He studied various branches of psychology and eventually dropped them all. He built several of those queer psionic machines, gold detectors, and something he called a hexer. He's done a lot of different things, evidently. Sounds like he was unable to make up his mind, said the small man. The president shook his head firmly. Not at all. He did new creative work in every one of the fields he touched. He was considered something of a mystic, but not a crackpot or a screwball. But anyhow, the point is that he evidently found what he'd been looking for for years. He asked for an appointment with me. I okayed the request because of his reputation. He would only tell me that he'd stumbled across something that was vital to national defense and the future of mankind, but I felt that in view of the work he had done, he was entitled to a hearing. And he proved to you beyond any doubt that he had this power? The small man asked. Frank shifted his big body uneasily in his chair. He certainly did, Mr. Secretary. The President nodded. I know it might not sound too impressive when heard second-hand, but Paul Wendell could tell me more of what was going on in the world than our Central Intelligence Agents have been able to dig up in twenty years, and he claimed he could teach the trick to anyone. I told him I'd think it over. Naturally, my first step was to make sure that he was followed twenty-four hours a day. A man with information like that simply could not be allowed to fall into enemy hands. The President scowled as though angry with himself. I'm sorry to say that I didn't realize the full potentialities of what he had said for several days, not until I got Frank's first report. You could hardly be expected to, Mr. President, Frank said. After all, something like that is pretty heady stuff. I think I follow you, said the Secretary. You found he was already teaching this trick to others. The President glanced at the FBI man. Frank said, That's right. He was holding meetings, classes, I suppose you'd call them, twice a week. There were eight men who came regularly. That's when I gave the order to have them all picked up. Can you imagine what would happen if everybody could be taught to use this ability? Or even a small minority? They'd rule the world, said the secretary softly. The president shrugged that off. That's a small item, really. The point is that nothing would be hidden from anyone. The way we play the game of life today is similar to playing poker. We keep a straight face and play the cards tight to our chest. But what would happen if everyone could see everyone else's cards? It would cease to be a game of strategy and become a game of pure chance. We'd have to start playing life another way. It would be like chess, where you could see the opponent's every move. But in all human history there has never been a social analog for chess. That's why Paul Wendell and his group had to be stopped, for a while at least. But what could you have done with them? asked the secretary. Imprison them summarily? Have them shot? What would you have done? The President's face became graver than ever. I had not yet made that decision. Thank heaven it has been taken out of my hands. One of his own men shot him? That's right, said the big FBI man. We went into his apartment an instant too late. We found eight madmen and a near corpse. We're not sure what happened, and we're not sure we want to know. Anything that can drive eight reasonably stable men off the deep end in less than an hour is nothing to meddle around with. I wonder what went wrong, asked the secretary of no one in particular. Scherzo, presto. Paul Wendell, too, was wondering what went wrong. Slowly, over a period of immeasurable time, memory seeped back into him. Bits of memory, here and there, crept in from nowhere, sometimes to be lost again, sometimes to remain. Once he found himself mentally humming an odd, rather funeral tune. Now, though you'd have said that the head was dead, for its owner dead was he. It stood on its neck with a smile well-bred, and bowed three times to me. It was none of your impudent off-hand nods. Wendell stopped and wondered what the devil seemed so important about the song. Slowly, slowly, memory returned when he finally realized with crashing finality where he was and what had happened to him, Paul Wendell went violently insane, or he would have if he could have become violent. March Funebre, Lento Open your mouth, Paul, said the pretty nurse. The hulking mass of not-quite-human gazed at her with vacuous eyes and opened its mouth. Dexterously she spooned a mouthful of baby food into it, now swallow it, Paul. That's it. Now another. In pretty bad shape, isn't he? 
Nurse Peters turned to look at the man who had walked up behind her. It was Dr. Benwick, the new intern. "'He's worthless to himself and anyone else,' she said. "'It's a shame, too. He'd be rather nice-looking if there were any personality behind that face.' She shoveled another spoonful of mashed asparagus into the gaping mouth. "'Now swallow it, Paul.' "'How long has he been here?' Benwick asked, eyeing the scars that showed through the dark hair on the patient's head. "'Nearly six years,' Miss Peters said. "'Hm! But they outlawed lobotomies back in the sixties. "'Open your mouth, Paul.' Then to Benwick, "'This was an accident. Bullet in the head. You can see the scar on the other side of his head.' The doctor moved around to look at the left temple. "'Doesn't leave much of a human being, does it?' "'It doesn't even leave much of an animal,' Miss Peters said. "'He's alive, but that's the best you can say for him. "'Now swallow, Paul. That's it. "'Even an amoeba can find food for itself.' "'Yeah, even a single cell is better off than he is. "'Chop out a man's forebrain, and he's nothing. "'It's a case of the whole being less than the sum of its parts.' "'I'm glad they outlawed the operation on mental patients,' "'Miss Peters said with a note of disgust in her voice. "'Dr. Benwick said, "'It's worse than it looks.' Do you know why the anti-lobotomists managed to get the bill passed? Let's drink some milk now, Paul. No, doctor, I was only a little girl at that time. It was a matter of electroencephalographic records. They showed that there was electrical activity in the prefrontal lobes even after the nerves had been severed, which could mean a lot of things, but the AL supporter said that it indicated that the forebrain was still capable of thinking. Miss Peters looked a little ill. Why— "'That's horrible! I wish you'd never told me!' She looked at the lump of vegetableized human sitting placidly at the table. "'Do you suppose he's actually thinking somewhere, deep inside?' "'Oh, I doubt it,' Benwick said hastily. "'There's probably no real self-awareness, none at all. There couldn't be.' "'I suppose not,' Miss Peters said. "'But it's not pleasant to think of.' "'That's why they outlawed it,' said Benwick. "'Rondo.' Andante ma non poco. Insanity is a retreat from reality, an escape within the mind from the reality outside the mind. But what if there is no detectable reality outside the mind? What is there to escape from? Suicide, death in any form, is an escape from life. But if death does not come, and cannot be self-inflicted, what then? And when the pressure of nothingness becomes too great to bear, it becomes necessary to escape. A man under great enough pressure will take the easy way out. But what if there is no easy way? Why, then, a man must take the hard way. For Paul Wendell there was no escape from his dark, senseless Gehenna by way of death. And even insanity offered no retreat. Insanity in itself is senseless, and senselessness was what he was trying to flee. The only insanity possible was the psychosis of regression, a fleeing into the past, into the crystallized, unchanging world of memory. So Paul Wendell explored his past, every year, every hour, every second of it, searching to recall and savor every bit of sensation he had ever experienced. He tasted and smelled and touched and heard and analyzed each of them minutely. He searched through his own subjective thought processes, analyzing, checking, and correlating them. Know thyself. Time and time again Wendell retreated from his own memories in confusion or shame or fear. But there was no retreat from himself, and eventually he had to go back and look again. He had plenty of time, all the time in the world. How can subjective time be measured when there is no objective reality? Eventually there came the time when there was nothing left to look at, nothing left to see, nothing left to check and remember, nothing that he had not gone over in every detail. Again boredom began to creep in. It was not the boredom of nothingness, but the boredom of the familiar. Imagination? What could he imagine except combinations and permutations of his own memories? He didn't know. Maybe there might be more to it than that. So he exercised his imagination. With a wealth of material to draw upon, he would build himself worlds where he could move around, walk, talk, and make love, eat, drink, and feel the caress of sunshine and wind. It was while he was engaged in this project that he touched another mind. He touched it, fused for a blinding second, and bounced away. He ran gibbering up and down the corridors of his own memory, mentally reeling from the shock of identification. Who was he? Paul Wendell? 
Yes, he knew with incontrovertible certainty that he was Paul Wendell, but he also knew with almost equal certainty that he was Captain Sir Richard Francis Burton. He was living, had lived, in the latter half of the nineteenth century, but he knew nothing of the captain other than the certainty of identity. Nothing else of that blinding mind touch remained. Again he scoured his memory, Paul Wendell's memory, checking and rechecking the area just before that semi-fatal bullet had crashed through his brain. And finally, at long last, he knew with certainty where his calculations had gone astray. He knew positively why eight men had gone insane. Then he went again in search of other minds, and this time he knew he would not bounce. Casi una fantasia poco andante pianissimo. An old man sat quietly in his lawn chair, puffing contentedly on an expensive briar pipe and making corrections with a fountain pen on a thick sheaf of typewritten manuscript. Around him stretched an expanse of green lawn, dotted here and there with squat cycads that looked like overgrown pineapples. In the distance, screening the big house from the road, stood a row of stately palms, their fronds stirring lightly in the faint, warm California breeze. The old man raised his head as a car pulled into the curving driveway. The warm hum of the turbo-electric engine stopped, and a man climbed out of the vehicle. He walked with easy strides across the grass to where the elderly gentleman sat. He was lithe, of indeterminate age, but with a look of great determination. There was something in his face that made the old man vaguely uneasy, not with fear, but with a sense of deep respect. "'What can I do for you, sir?' "'I have some news for you, Mr. President,' the younger one said. The old man smiled wryly. "'I haven't been President for fourteen years. Most people call me Senator, or just plain Mister.' The younger man smiled back. "'Very well, Senator. My name is Camberton. James Camberton?' I brought some information that may possibly relieve your mind. Or again, it may not. You sound ominous, Mr. Camberton. I hope you'll remember that I've been retired from the political field for nearly five years. What is this shattering news? Paul Wendell's body was buried yesterday. The senator looked blank for a second, then recognition came into his face. Wendell, eh? After all this time. Poor chap, he'd have been better off if he'd died twenty years ago. Then he paused and looked up. "'But just who are you, Mr. Camberton? And what makes you think I would be particularly interested in Paul Wendell?' "'Mr. Wendell wants to tell you that he is very grateful to you for having saved his life, Senator. If it hadn't been for your orders, he would have been left to die.' The Senator felt strangely calm, although he knew he should feel shock. "'That's ridiculous, sir. Mr. Wendell's brain was hopelessly damaged. He never recovered his sanity or control of his body.' I know I used to drop over to see him occasionally, until I finally realized that I was only making myself feel worse and doing him no good. Yes, sir, and Mr. Wendell wants you to know how much he appreciated those visits. The senator grew red. What the devil are you talking about? I just said that Wendell couldn't talk. How could he have said anything to you? What do you know about this? I never said he spoke to me, senator. He didn't. And as to what I know of this affair, evidently you don't remember my name, James Camberton. The senator frowned. The name is familiar, but— Then his eyes went wide. Camberton! You were one of the eight men who— Why, you're the man who shot Wendell! Camberton pulled up an empty lawn chair and sat down. That's right, senator, but there's nothing to be afraid of. Would you like to hear about it? I suppose I must— the old man's voice was so low that it was scarcely audible. "'Tell me, were the other seven released, too? Ha have you all regained your sanity? Do you remember—' He stopped. "'Do we remember the extrasensory perception formula? Yes, we do. All eight of us remember it well. It was based on faulty premises and incomplete, of course, but in its own way it was workable enough. We have something much better now.' The old man shook his head slowly. I failed, then. Such an idea is as fatal to society as we know it as a virus plague. I tried to keep you men quarantined, but I failed. After all those years of insanity, now the chess game begins. The poker game is over. It's worse than that, Camberton said, chuckling softly. Or, actually, it's much better. I don't understand. Explain it to me. I'm an old man, and I may not live to see my world collapse. I hope I don't. Camberton said, 
I'll try to explain in words, Senator. They're inadequate, but a fuller explanation will come later. And he launched into the story of the two-decade search of Paul Wendell. Coda, Andantino Telepathy? Time travel? After three hours of listening, the ex-president was still not sure he understood. Think of it this way, Camberton said. Think of the mind at any given instant as being surrounded by a shield, a shield of privacy, a shield which you, yourself, have erected, though unconsciously. It's a perfect insulator against telepathic prying by others. You feel you have to have it in order to retain your privacy, your sense of identity, even. But here's the kicker. Even though no one else can get in, you can't get out. You can call this shield self-consciousness. Perhaps shame is a better word. Everyone has it to some degree. No telepathic thought can break through it. Occasionally some people will relax it for a fraction of a second, but the instant they receive something the barrier goes up again. Then how is telepathy possible? How can you go through it? The senator looked puzzled as he thoughtfully tamped tobacco into his briar. You don't go through it. You go around it. Now wait a minute. That sounds like some of those fourth dimension stories I've read. I recall that when I was younger I read a murder mystery, something about a morgue, I think. At, at any rate, the murder was committed inside a locked room. No one could possibly have gotten in or out. One of the characters suggested that the murderer traveled through the fourth dimension in order to get at the victim. He didn't go through the walls, he went around them. The senator puffed a match flame into the bowl of his pipe, his eyes on the younger man. Is that what you're driving at? Exactly, agreed Pemberton. The fourth dimension, time. You must go back in time to an instant when that wall did not exist. An infant has no shame, no modesty, no shield against the world. You must travel back down your own four-dimensional tube of memory in order to get outside it. And to do that, you have to know your own mind completely, and you must be sure you know it. For only if you know your own mind can you communicate with another mind, because at the instant of contact you become that person. You must enter his own memory at the beginning and go up the hypertube. You will have all his memories, his hopes, his fears, his sense of identity. Unless you know, beyond any trace of doubt, who you are, the result is insanity. The senator puffed his pipe for a moment, then shook his head. It sounds like oriental mysticism to me. If you can travel in time, you'd be able to change the past. Not at all, Camberton said. That's like saying that if you read a book, the author's words will change. Time isn't like that. Look, suppose you had a long trough filled with supercooled water. At one end you drop in a piece of ice. Immediately the water begins to freeze. The crystallization front moves toward the other end of the trough. Behind that front there is ice, frozen, immovable, unchangeable. Ahead of it there is water, fluid, mobile, changeable. The instant we call the present is like that crystallization front. The past is unchangeable, the future is flexible, but they both exist. I see. Uh, at least I think I do. And you can do all this? Not yet, said Camberton. Not completely. My mind isn't as strong as Wendell's, nor as capable. I'm not the, shall we say, the superman he is. Perhaps I never will be. But I'm learning. I'm learning. After all, it took Paul twenty years to do the trick, under the most favorable circumstances imaginable. I see. The senator smoked his pipe in silence for a long time. Camberton lit a cigarette and said nothing. After a time the senator took the briar from his mouth and began to tap the bowl gently on the heel of his palm. Mr. Camberton, why do you tell me all this? I still have influence with the Senate. The present president is a protege of mine. It wouldn't be too difficult to get you men, um, put away again. I have no desire to see our society ruined, our world destroyed. Why do you tell me? Camberton smiled apologetically. I'm afraid you might find it a little difficult to put us away again, sir. But that's not the point. You see, we need you. We have no desire to destroy our present culture until we've designed a better one to replace it. You are one of the greatest living statesmen, Senator. You have a wealth of knowledge and ability that can never be replaced. Knowledge and ability that will help us to design a culture and a civilization that will be as far above this one as this one is above the wolf pack. We want you to come in with us, help us. We want you to be one of us. I? 
I'm an old man, Mr. Camberton. I will be dead before this civilization falls. How can I help build a new one? And how could I, at my age, be expected to learn this technique? Paul Wendell says you can. He says you have one of the strongest minds now existing. The senator put his pipe in his jacket pocket. You know, Camberton, you keep referring to Wendell in the present tense. I thought you said he was dead. Again Camberton gave him the odd smile. I didn't say that, Senator. I said they buried his body. That's quite a different thing. You see, before the poor useless hulk that held his blasted brain died, Paul gave the eight of us his memories. He gave us himself. The mind is not the brain, Senator. We don't know what it is yet, but we do know what it isn't. Paul's poor damaged brain is dead, but his memories, his thought processes, the very essence of all that was Paul Wendell, is still very much with us. Do you begin to see now why we want you to come in with us? There are nine of us now, but we need the tenth. You. Will you come? I, I, I'll have to think it over, the old statesman said in a voice that had a faint quaver. I'll have to think it over. But they both knew what his answer would be. End of Sweet Mental by Randall Garrett Recording by Julie Carter By James Causey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Teething Ring by James Causey. Anyone can make an error, but the higher the society, the more disastrous the mistake. Half an hour before, while she had been engrossed in the current soap opera and Harry Jr. was screaming in his crib, Melinda would naturally have slammed the front door in the little man's face. However, when the bell rang, she was wearing her new Chinese red housecoat, had just lustered her nails to a blinding scarlet, and Harry Jr. was sleeping like an angel. Yawning, Melinda answered the door, and the little man said, beaming, Excellent day! I have geegaws for information! Melinda did not quite recoil. He was perhaps five feet tall, with a gleaming hairless scalp and a young, old face. He wore a plain gray tunic, and a peddler's tray hung from his thin shoulders. Don't want any, Linda stated flatly. Please, he had great beseeching amber eyes. They all say that I haven't much time. I must be back at the university by noon. You're working your way through college? He brightened. Yes, I suppose you could call it that. Alien anthropology major. Melinda softened. The initiations those frats pulled nowadays. Shaving the poor guy's head, e eating goldfish. It was criminal. Well, she asked grudgingly, what's in the tray? Flanglers, said the little man eagerly. Oscilloscopes, portable force field generators, a neural distorter. Melinda's face was blank. The little man frowned. You use them, of course. This is a Class Four culture. Melinda essayed a weak shrug, and the little man sighed with relief. His eyes fled past her to the blank screen of the TV set. Ah, a monitor, he smiled. For a moment I was uh, afraid. May I come in? Melinda shrugged, opened the door. This might be interesting like a vacuum cleaner salesman who had cleaned her drapes last week for free. And Kitty Kyle Battle's life wouldn't be on for almost an hour. My name is Porteous, said the little man with an eager smile. I'm doing a thematic on Class Four cultures. He whipped out a stylus, began jotting down notes. The TV set fascinated him. It's turned off right now, Melinda said. Porteous's eyes widened impossibly. You mean, he whispered in horror, that you're exercising Class Five privileges? 
This is terribly confusing. I get doors slammed in my face when Class Fours are supposed to have a splendid Gregarian quotient. You do have atomic power, don't you?" Oh, sure, said Melinda uncomfortably. This wasn't going to be much fun. Space travel? The little face was intent and sharp. Well, Melinda yawned, looking at the blank screen. They've got Space Patrol, Space Cadet, Tales of Tomorrow. Excellent. Rocket ships or force fields? Melinda blinked. Does your husband own one? Melinda shook her blonde head helplessly. What are your economic circumstances? Melinda took a deep, rasping breath, said, Listen, mister, is this a demonstration or a quiz program? Oh, my excuse. Demonstration, certainly. You will not mind the questions? Questions? There was an ominous glint in Melinda's blue eyes. Your delightful primitive customs, art forms, personal habits. Look, Melinda said, crimsoning, this is a respectable neighborhood, and I'm not answering any Kinsey report. Understand? The little man nodded, scribbling. Personal habits are taboo? I so regret. The demonstration. He waved grandly at the tray. Anti-grav sandals? A, a portable solar converter. Apologizing for this miserable selection, but on Capella they told me. He followed Melinda's entranced gaze, selected a tiny green vial. This is merely a regenerative solution. You appear to have no cuts or bruises. Oh, Melinda said nastily. Cures warts, cancer, grows hair, I suppose. Porteous brightened. Of course, I, I see you can scan. Amazing! He scribbled further with his stylus, glanced up, blinked at the obvious scorn on Melinda's face. Here, try it. You try it. Now watch him squirm. Porteous hesitated. Would you like me to grow an extra finger, hair? Grow some hair. Melinda tried not to smile. The little man unstopped the vial, poured a shimmering green drop on his wrist, frowning. Must concentrate, he said. Thorium base suspended solution really jolts the endocrines. Complete control. See? Melinda's jaw dropped. She stared at the tiny tuft of hair which had sprouted on that bare wrist. She was thinking abruptly, unhappily, about that chinon she had bought yesterday. They had let her buy that for eight dollars, when with this stuff she could have a natural one. How much? she inquired cautiously. Only half an hour of your time, said Porteous. Melinda grasped the vial firmly, settling down on the sofa with one leg tucked carefully under her. Okay, shoot, but nothing personal. Porteous was delighted. He asked a multitude of questions, most of them pointless, some naive, and Melinda dug into her infinitesimal fund of knowledge and gave. The little man scribbled furiously, clucking like a gravid hen. You mean, he asked in amazement, that you live in these primitive huts of your own volition? It's a G.I. housing project, Melinda said, ashamed. Astonishing, he wrote feudal anachronisms and atomic power side by side. Class fours periodically rough it in back-to-nature movements. Harry, Jr. chose that moment to begin screaming for his lunch. Porteous sat, trembling. Is that a security alarm? My son, said Melinda despondently, and went into the nursery. Porteous followed and watched the undulating child with some trepidation. Newborn? Eighteen months, said Melinda stiffly, changing diapers. He's cutting teeth. Porteous shuddered. What a pity. Obviously atavistic. Wouldn't the creche accept him? You, you shouldn't have to keep him here. I keep after Harry to get a maid, but he says we can't afford one. Manifestly insecure, muttered the little man, studying Harry, Jr. Definite paranoid tendencies. He was two weeks premature, volunteered Melinda. He's real sensitive. I know just the thing, Porteous said happily. Here. He dipped into the glittering litter on the tray and handed Harry Jr. a translucent prism. 
A neural distorter. We use it to train regressives on Rigel, too. It might be of assistance. Melinda eyed the thing doubtfully. Harry Jr. was peering into the shifting crystal depths with a somewhat strained expression. Speeds up the neural flow, explained the little man proudly. Helps tap the unused eighty per cent. The pre-symptomatic memory is unaffected due to automatic cerebral lapse in case of overload. I'm afraid it won't do much more than cube his present IQ, and an intelligent idiot is still an idiot, but... How dare you! Melinda's eyes flashed. My son is not an idiot! You get out of here this minute and take your things with you! As she reached for the prism, Harry Jr. squalled. Melinda relented. Here, she said angrily, fumbling with her purse. How much are they? Medium of exchange? Porteous rubbed his bald skull. Oh, I really shouldn't, but it'll make such a wonderful addendum to the chapter on malignant primitives. What is your smallest denomination? Is a dollar okay? Melinda was hopeful. Porteous was pleased with the picture of George Washington. He turned the bill over and over in his fingers, at last bowed low and formally apologized for any taboo violations, and left via the front door. Crazy fraternities, muttered Melinda, turning on the TV set. Kitty Kyle was dull that morning. At length Melinda used some of the liquid in the green vial on her eyelashes, was quite pleased at the results, and hid the rest in the medicine cabinet. Harry, Jr. was a model of docility the rest of that day. While Melinda watched TV and munched chocolates, did and redid her hair, Harry, Jr. played quietly with the crystal prism. Toward late afternoon he crawled over to the bookcase, wrestled down the encyclopedia, and pawed through it, gurgling with delight. He definitely, Melinda decided, would make a fine lawyer some day. Not a useless putterer like Big Harry, who worked all hours overtime in that damned lab. She scowled as Harry Jr. bored with the encyclopedia began reaching for one of Big Harry's tomes on nuclear physics. One putterer in the family was enough, but when she tried to take the book away from him, Harry Jr. howled so violently that she let well enough alone. At six-thirty, Big Harry called from the lab with the usual despondent message that he would not be home for supper. Melinda said a few resigned things about cheerless dinners eaten alone, hinted darkly what lonesome wives sometimes did for company, and Harry said he was very sorry, but this might be it, and Melinda hung up on him in a temper. Precisely fifteen minutes later the doorbell rang. Melinda opened the front door and gaped. This little man could have been Porteous's double except for the black metallic tunic and glacial gray eyes. Mrs. Melinda Adams? Even the voice was frigid. Y yes. Why? Major Nord, Galactic Security. The little man bowed. You were visited early this morning by one Porteous. He spoke the name with a certain disgust. He left a neural distorter here, correct? Melinda's nod was tremulous. Major Nord came quietly into the living room, shut the door behind him. My apologies, madam, for the intrusion. Porteous mistook your world for a Class Four culture instead of a Class Seven. Here. He handed her the crumpled dollar bill. You may check the serial number. The distorter, please. Melinda shrunk limply onto the sofa. I, I don't understand, she said painfully. Was he a thief? He was careless about his spatial coordinates. Major Nord's teeth showed in the faintest of smiles. He has been corrected. Where is it? Now look, said Melinda with some asperity. That thing's kept Harry Jr. quiet all day. I bought it in good faith, and it's not my fault. Say, have you got a warrant? Madam, said the Major with dignity. I dislike violating local taboos, but must I explain the impact of a neural distorter on a backwater culture? What if your Neanderthal had been given atomic blasters? Where would you have been today? Swinging through trees, no doubt. What if your Hitler had force fields? He exhaled. Where is your son? In the nursery, Harry Jr. was contentedly playing with his blocks. The prism lay glinting in the corner. Major Nord picked it up carefully, scrutinized Harry, Jr. His voice was very soft. 
You said he was playing with it? Some vestigial maternal instinct prompted Melinda to shake her head vigorously. The little man stared hard at Harry Jr., who began whimpering, trembling. Melinda scooped up Harry Jr. Is that all you have to do? Run around frightening women and children? Take your old distorter and get out. Leave decent people alone. Major Nord frowned. If only he could be sure. He peered stonily at Harry Jr., murmured, Definite egomania. It doesn't seem to have affected him. Strange. Do you want me to scream? Melinda demanded. Major Nord sighed. He bowed to Melinda, went out, closed the door, touched a tiny stud on his tunic, and vanished. The manners of some people, Melinda said to Harry Jr. She was relieved that the Major had not asked for the green vial. Harry Jr. also looked relieved, although for quite a different reason. Big Harry arrived home a little after eleven. There were small worry creases about his mouth and forehead and the leaden cast of defeat in his eyes. He went into the bedroom and Melinda sleepily told him about the little man working his way through college by peddling silly goods and about that rude cop named Nord. And Harry said that was simply astonishing. And Melinda said, Harry, you had a drink. I had two drinks, Harry told her owlishly. You married a failure, dear. Part of the experimental model vaporized. Whoosh! Just like that. On paper it looks so good. Melinda had heard it all before. She asked him to see if Harry Jr. was covered, and Big Harry went unsteadily into the nursery, sat down by his son's crib. Poor little guy, he mused. Your old man's a bum, a useless tinker. He thought he could send man to the stars on a string of helium nuclei. Oh, he was smart, thought of everything. Auxiliary jets to kick off the negative charge, bigger mercury vapor banks, a, a fine straight thrust of positive alpha particles. He hiccuped, put his face in his hands. Didn't you ever stop to think that a few air molecules could defocus the stream? Try a vacuum, stupid! Big Harry stood up. Did you say something, son? Gerful, said Harry, Jr. Big Harry reeled into the living room like a somnambulist. He got pencil and paper, began jotting frantic formula. Presently he called a cab and raced back to the laboratory. Melinda was dreaming about little bald men with diamond-studded trays. They were chasing her. They kept pelting her with rubies and emeralds. All they wanted was to ask questions, but she kept running. Harry Jr. clasped tightly in her arms. Now they were ringing alarm bells. The bells kept ringing, and she groaned. She sat up in bed and seized the telephone. Darling, Big Harry's voice shook. I've got it. More auxiliary shielding plus a vacuum. We'll be rich. That's just fine, said Melinda crossly. You woke the baby. Harry Jr. was sobbing bitterly into his pillow. He was sick with disappointment. Even the most favorable extrapolation showed it would take him nineteen years to become master of the world. An eternity! Nineteen years! End of Teething Ring by James Causey Where There's Hope by Jerome Bixby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Where There's Hope by Jerome Bixby. The women had made up their minds, and nothing, repeat, nothing, could change them, but something had to give. If you called me here to tell me to have a child, Mary Pornson said, you can just forget about it. We girls have made up our minds. Hugh Farrell, chief medical officer of the Exodus Seven, sighed and leaned back in his chair. He looked at Mary's husband. And you, Ralph, he said, how do you feel? Ralph Pornson looked at Mary uncomfortably, started to speak, and then hesitated. Hugh Farrell sighed again and closed his eyes. It was that way with all the boys. The wives had the whip hand. 
If the husbands put up an argument, they'd simply get turned down flat, no sex at all, children or otherwise. The threat, Farrell thought wryly, made the boys softer than watered putty. His own wife, Alice, was one of the ringleaders of the No Babies movement, and since he had openly declared warfare on the idea, she wouldn't even let him kiss her good night, for fear of losing her determination, Farrell liked to think. He opened his eyes again to look past the Pornsons, out of the curving port of his office lab in the Exodus Seven's flank, at the scene outside the ship. At the edge of the clearing he could see Danny Stern and his crew, tiny beneath the cavernous sunbeam shot overhang of giant leaves. Danny was standing up at the controls of the dozer, waving his arms. His crew was struggling to get a log set so he could shove it into place with the dozer. They were repairing a break in the barricade, the place where one of New Earth's giant saurians had come stamping and whistling through last night to kill three colonists before it could be blasted out of existence. It was difficult, damn difficult, a brand new world here, all ready to receive the refugees from dying Earth, or rather, all ready to be made ready, which was the task ahead of the Exodus Seven's personnel. An Earth world, green, warm, fertile, and crawling, leaping, hooting, and snarling with ferocious beasts of every variety. Farrell could certainly see the women's point in banding together and refusing to produce children. Something inside a woman keeps her from wanting to bring life into peril, at least when the peril seems temporary, and security is both remembered and anticipated. Pornson said, I guess I feel just about like Mary does. I, I don't see any reason for having a kid until we get this place ironed out and safe to live in. That's going to take some time, Ralph. Farrell clasped his hands in front of him and delivered the speech he had delivered so often in the past few weeks. Ten or twelve years before we really get set up here, we've got to build from the ground up, you know. We'll have to find and mine our own metals, build our machines to build shops to build more machines. There'll be resources that we won't find, and we'll have to learn what this planet has to offer in their stead. Colonizing New Earth isn't simply a matter of landing and throwing together a shining city. I only wish it were. Six weeks ago, we landed. We haven't yet dared to venture more than a mile from this spot. We've cut down trees and built the barricade and our houses. After protecting ourselves, we have to eat. We've planted gardens. We've produced test-tube calves and piglets. The calves are doing fine, but the piglets are dying one by one. We've got to find out why. It's going to be a long, long time before we have even a minimum of security, much less luxury, longer than you think. So much longer that waiting until the security arrives before having children is out of the question. There are critters out there, he nodded toward the port and the busy clearing beyond, that we haven't been able to kill. We've thrown everything we have at them, and they come back for more. We'll have to find out what will kill them, how they differ from those we are able to kill. We are six hundred people and a spaceship, Ralph. We have techniques, that's all. Everything else we've got to dig up out of this planet. We'll need people. Mary. We'll need the children. We're counting on them. They're vital to the plans we've made. Mary Pornson said, Damn the plans. I won't have one. Not now. You've just done a nice job of describing all my reasons, and all the other girls feel the same way. She looked out the window at the dozer and crew. Danny Stern was still waving his arms. The log was almost in place. George and May Wright were killed last night, so was Varelli. If George and May had had a child, the monster would have trampled it, too. It went right through their cabin like cardboard. It isn't fair to bring a baby into... Farrell said. Fair, Mary? Maybe it isn't fair not to have one, not to bring it into being and give it a chance. Life's always a gamble. It doesn't exist. Mary said. She smiled. Don't try circumlocution on me, Doc. 
I'm not religious. I don't believe that spermatozoa and an ovum, if not allowed to cuddle up together, add to murder. That isn't what I meant. You were getting around to it, which means you've run out of good arguments. No, I've a few left. Farrell looked at the two stubborn faces. Mary's, pleasant and pretty, but set as steel. Ralph's, uncomfortable, thoughtful, but mirroring his definite willingness to follow his wife's lead. Farrell cleared his throat. You know how important it is that this colony be established? You know that, don't you? In twenty years or so, the ships will start arriving, hundreds of them, because we sent a message back to Earth saying we'd found a habitable planet. Thousands of people from Earth coming here to the new world were supposed to get busy and carve out for them. We were selected for that task, first of judging the right planet, then of working it over. Engineers, chemists, agronomists, all of us, we're the task force. We've got to do the job. We've got to test, plant, breed, rebalance, create. There'll be a lot of trial and error. We've got to work out a way of life so the thousands who will follow can be introduced safely and painlessly into the, well, into the organism and we'll need new blood for the jobs ahead. We'll need young people. Mary said, A few years, one way or the other, won't matter much, Doc. Five or six years from now, this place will be a lot safer. Then we women will start producing. But not now. It won't work that way, Farrell said. We're none of us kids any longer. I'm fifty-five, Ralph. You're forty-three. I realize that I must be getting old to think of you as young. Mary, you're thirty-seven. We took a long time getting here. Fourteen years. We left an earth that's dying of radioactive poisoning, and we all got a mild dose of that. The radiation we absorbed in space, little as it was, didn't help any. And that sun up there, again he nodded at the port, isn't any help either. Periodically, it throws off some pretty damn funny stuff. Frankly, we're worried. We don't know whether or not we can have children, or normal children. We've got to find out. If our genes have been bollocked up, we've got to find out why and how and get to work on it immediately. It may be unpleasant. It may be heartbreaking. But those who will come here in twenty years will have absorbed much more of Earth's radioactivity than we did, and an equal amount of the space stuff, and this sun will be waiting for them. We'll have to know what we can do for them. I'm not a walking laboratory, Doc, Mary said. I'm afraid you are, Mary. All of you are. Mary set her lips and stared out the port. It's got to be done, Mary. She didn't answer. It's going to be done. Choose someone else, she said. That's what they all say, she said. I guess this is one thing you doctors and psychologists didn't figure on, Doc. Not at first, Farrell said, but we've given it some thought. McGuire had installed the button convenient to Farrell's right hand, just below the level of the desktop. Farrell pressed it. Ralph and Mary and slumped in their chairs. The door opened, and Dr. John J. McGuire and Ted Harris, the Exodus Seven's chief psychologist, came in. When it was over, and the afterplay had been allowed to run its course, Farrell told the Pornsons to go into the next room and shower. They came back soon, looking refreshed. Farrell ordered them to get back into their clothes. Under the power of the hypnotic drug which their chairs had injected into them at the touch of the button, they did so. Then he told them to sit down in the chairs again. McGuire and Harris had gathered up their equipment, piling it on top of the operating table. McGuire smiled. I'll bet that's the best monitored, most hygienic sex act ever committed. I think I've about got the space radiation's effect licked. Farrell nodded. If anything goes wrong, it certainly won't be our fault. But let's face it, the chances are a thousand to one that something will go wrong. We'll just have to wait and work. He looked at the Pornsons. They're very much in love, aren't they? 
and she was receptive to the suggestion. Beneath it all, she was burning to have a child, just like the others. McGuire wheeled out the operating table, with its load of serums, pressure hypos, and jury-rigged thingamabobs, which he was testing on alternate couples. Ted Harris stopped at the door a moment. He said, I think the suggestions I planted will turn the trick when they find out she's pregnant. They'll come through okay. Won't even be too angry. Farrell sighed. They'd been over it in detail several times, of course, but apparently Harris needed the reassurance as much as he did. He said, Sure, now scram so I can go back into my act. Harris closed the door. Farrell sat down at his desk and studied the pair before him. They looked back contentedly, holding hands, their eyes dull. Farrell said, How do you feel? Ralph Pornson said, I feel fine. Mary Pornson said, Oh, I feel wonderful. Deliberately, Farrell pressed another button below his desktop. The dull eyes cleared instantly. Oh, you've given it some thought, Doc? Mary said sweetly, and what have you decided? You'll see, Farrell said, eventually. He rose. That's all for now, kids. I'd like to see you again in one month for a routine checkup. Mary nodded and got up. You'll still have to wait, Doc. Why not admit you're licked? Ralph got up, too, and looked puzzled. Wow, he said. I'm tired. Perhaps just coming here, Farrell said, discharge some of the tension you've been carrying around. The Pornsons left. Farrell brought out some papers from his desk and studied them. Then from the file drawer, he selected the record of Hugh and Alice Farrell. Alice would be at the perfect time of her menstrual cycle tomorrow. Farrell flipped his communicator. McGuire, he said. Tomorrow, it's me. McGuire chuckled. Farrell could have kicked him. He put his chin on his hands and stared out the port. Danny Stern had the log in place in the barricade. The bulldozer was moving on to a new task. His momentary doubt stifled. Farrell went back to work. Twenty-one years later, when the ships from Earth began arriving, the log had been replaced by a stone monument erected to the memory of Exodus Seven, which had been cut apart for its valuable steel. Around the monument was a park, and on three sides of the park was a shining town, not really large enough to be called a city, of plastic and stone, for New Earth had no iron ore, only zinc and a little copper. This was often cause for regret. Still, it was a pretty good world. The monster problem had been licked by high-voltage cannon. Now, in their third generation since the landing, the monsters kept their distance, and things grew, things good to eat. And even without steel, the graceful, smoothly functioning town looked impressive, quite a thing to have been built by a handful of beings with two arms and two legs each. It hadn't been entirely, but nobody thought much about that any more. Even the newcomers got used to it. Things change. End of Where There's Hope by Jerome Bixby